But it's 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 amazing that it's stay for like fifty seven years. Yes. And in, in modern science, it's even being the largest for like a half a century. It's it's it's, 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 a, it's quite uh, uh, quite quite an intriguing pattern. Right? So you 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 are, are the director. Or? Uh, so I'm the at the moment I'm the chief scientist. Right, so so we have this uh, structure. So the the uh, the director is uh, the director of the uh, observatory of of NLC, mm -hmm. and we also have a chief engineer that run daily daily operations. So I'm sort of all, I'm sort of organizing the tech and and stuff. Right? Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thanks uh, uh, for the introduction. Um, so, so this is more like a uh, uh, update on the status of FAST, which is the giant dish you can see here. Uh, usually, I, I, I like to use that analogy. If, if you fill this whole dish with uh, wine, uh, each person in the world will get at least a bottle, or, or maybe more. Uh, you can see that's a spiral of light, and that's actually a truck being driven underneath the uh, dish. So what you are seeing here is like semi-transparent because more than 50% of area are made up of holes. So those holes are small enough, much smaller than the wavelengths we are operating in, so it can still be uh, an efficient uh, reflective radio telescope. And it's largely motivated by the great Arecibo telescope. So ever since its uh, uh, construction finished in 1963, uh, it perched on the apex uh, of a radio uh, telescope for more than half a century uh, with many landmark discoveries and won the Nobel Prize in 1993 for the discovery of double neutron star system. Uh, even before its uh, uh, unfortunate collapse, uh, it made uh, the discovery of the first repeating fast radio burst, which allow for the subsequent localization that confirm uh, the cosmological origin of fast radio burst. So it was dubbed uh, the most uh, important discovery since LIGO, uh, uh, in astronomy since LIGO's detection of gravitational wave by WAS. And Arecibo was partially a uh, uh, accidental uh, uh, accomplishment in that it was first proposed by uh, Bill Gordon as a radar, um, but he uh, made an error in his calculation for the uh, reflection backscattering from plasma. Uh, so he originally proposed 300 meter, but soon revised it down to 30 meter. But to everybody's uh, surprise, the newly founded National Agency of the United States, the so-called ARPA, still decided, knowing full well the calculation, the controversy to fund a super dish. And this is easier to be understood in the context of 1958. That's uh, sort of at the uh, initial stage of the great uh, space race and the Cold War. Uh, so the uh, Sputnik launch uh, really uh, push U.S. to try to catch up in both uh, space and uh, 
fundamental research. And by the middle of 1958, uh, U.S. Congress passed this regulation, established NASA. And the funding of NASA draw the space program away from other agencies, including ARPA. So the first major project that ARPA funded, which is supposed to be ambitious, forward-looking, high risk, high reward, uh, is Arecibo Telescope. ARPA later transferred to the management of defense and becomes ARPA. So yes, Arecibo is a direct result of the Cold War and is one of the few sort of positive uh, legacy of that uh, history. And it's actually part of the uh, national U.S. national strategy for fighting the Cold War. I quote here the famous long telegram from George Keenan, even back in 1946. He said, in order to fight the uh, Soviet Union uh, uh, ideology, he said, we must formulate and put forward for other nations a much more positive and constructive picture of sort we would like to see than we have put forward in the past. So that uh, di uh, different ways to win a struggle, um, at least back then, U.S. is trying to do positive things. And the concept, um, regardless of uh, whether it's fully justified scientifically at the time, um, it's, it's, it's a very novel uh, concept. It's a, say, in order to build a 300-meter dish, it's just too big and too heavy to have it move to counter rotate the Earth, so you put it in the hole. Uh, and you made it spherical so you can have a distant field of view, uh, but you cannot focus the light. So in order to focus the light, you put this line feed, the length of which is pro proportional to the wavelength. So when the wave travel uh, upward uh, along this line feed, it will come into focus again at the focal cabin. So if your eye can see the radio wave, it will light up the feed at the tip first and be become brighter and brighter. And once it gets uh, collected by the receiver, it, it, it becomes a bright uh, spot. This is very simple, um, but this is what facilitates a, a slew of uh, big discovery, including the double neutron star. So by the middle of 1990s, uh, my uh, 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 a mentor, uh, Dr. Lin Dong Nan and Yu Hai Chu from the National Astronomical uh, Observatory of China visited Arecibo for the first time. And it's, uh, it's also uh, around the time that they proposed to build 20 Arecibo-like big dish because they are aiming to compete for the SKA concept. And by now we, we know that the SKA go to the small antenna large number concept so only one of those 20 uh, original proposed antennas uh, uh, survived, uh, which become uh, the fast uh, 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 today. So I joined the uh, uh, project uh, immediately after uh, it got uh, funding. So I become, first become a project uh, scientist, and in 2015, I become the uh, deputy chief engineer, and like Everyone who has ever worked on the site, we have to overcome a slew of challenges, big and small, and not the least of which is got stung by the bees or wasps. And by the end of 2016, we finished construction. This is on September 25th. Uh, people like Joe Taylor and, and, and other colleagues come to our uh, opening ceremony. And by uh, early 2020, uh, we uh, pass the final project review and become a national facility. And now I'm the uh, chief scientist of this uh, facility. So this is what we have realized. Now, in order to have that, uh, instead of to have a line feed, now we have an active surface that made up of uh, more than uh, 4,000 panels. So we can move these panels. Uh, so to change 300 meter of the total 500 meter from part of a sparkle cap in real time into a parabola. And the, the original sparkle cap is of the same curvature radii. It's also 300 meter uh, radii. So the change is always limited to less than 70 centimeter. So it's almost imperceptible if you are just right there standing uh, uh, beside the dish. But, but more 
visible is the moving of the dome. Because now you have a, a parabola, a primary, so it's a parallel wave coming in, it's focused to a point, but you have to move that point. So we really fly this 30 ton receiver dome on a curved surface, and uh, now this can be done uh, uh, quite uh, uh, accurately now. And just, just realize a, a, a simple uh, primary focused uh, uh, optical path. So its main advantage is have this unparalleled gain at 20 Kelvin per Jansky is slightly more sensitive than, in terms of instantaneous uh, point source sensitivity than uh, SK1 even. Uh, but it has its limit uh, because you have to move thousands of points in order to actually focus onto a certain direction. Uh, it takes as long as 10 minutes to change, change sources, so which means we really do not want to change sources too frequently. Uh, and there are five uh, primary uh, science goals, but the, the sort of bread and butter for this band of radio tests is always 21 centimeter. Uh, each one and the pulsars and nowadays are including a fast radio burst. So back in 2015, when we started to plan large survey project for fast, it's shocking to me and my colleagues to realize that every major telescope before us, including our Siebel, GBT, Parks, um, uh, Affelsberg, have already done, say, pulsar surveys multiple times, H1 surveys, but never have they done simultaneous surveys. And in radio, we actually sample the EM field completely because we sample it in time. So we don't really lose information. So there's no sort of a, a principal difficulty that, that we should not be able to do that. And it turns out there's a technical challenge, meaning lying in the difference in the requirement of calibration. So, for, so this is a real image of uh, hydrogen uh, from our SIBO. You can see those stripes. Those reflected the short time gain variation. Uh, in order to calibrate that out, what we do is to inject an electronic noise with known thermal temperature. Uh, usually we do that uh, every second. But the problem of doing that is that when you Fourier transform that time series into a power spectrum in time domain, in order to search for periodic signals, that noise that's supposed to be weak now completely dominates this power spectrum. Because if you inject a signal every second, you get a spike at one hertz, but you also get the multiples, like this is so-called harmonics at two hertz, four hertz, eight hertz, so on and so forth. Uh, in fact, this is a fast discovered new pulsars uh, indicated by the, by the yellow uh, error that it's completely got swamped by the uh, artificial noise injection. So our proposal is quite uh, simple and uh, naive. We just, instead of inject noise every second, we inject noise 10,000 times every second. So we inject it quickly enough it push all the power to a very high time domain frequency, so you save a clean enough power uh, spectrum for uh, pulsar surveys. So this uh, development effort largely led by Mark Kirchhoff, also a, a PhD a few years uh, junior than me from Cornell, now a permanent staff in NAOC, and uh, uh, partially for recognize his uh, contribution, uh, he and he, along with a group of uh, foreign uh, uh, luminaries working in China, like the CEO of BMW in China, uh, met uh, by the uh, uh, Prime Minister of China uh, earlier this year. So based on this technology, we ma managed to realize uh, the so-called conventional radio astronomy fast survey. It's the first of its kind that we can image H1, search for H1 galaxies, uh, search for pulsars and search for transient simultaneously. And the main challenge uh, right now is the large data stream and the volume. So we get about 10 petabytes of data per year and we try to process it uh, and uh, compress it, but we're still left over with about one petabyte uh, uh, every year. And this is a, it's a, it's a 
PR video <laughs> just to, uh, to uh, demonstrate that concept. Uh, there's, uh, there's many, many technical details that like we have from the cabin uh, to the, where the signal got digitized, there's like one and a half kilometers. So you really have to sync up the, the signal for each feed. Um, but when it's working, it's, it's beautiful. The sample and, and the full backhand process. So we have a fiber link from the site, which is in the uh, uh, remote area to the state capital of Guizhou province. Um, but that, that uh, fiber is not sufficient, so we, we uh, uh, still have to uh, regularly just uh, drive a car and ship uh, hard drives, <laughs> which has a very high uh, data density. <laughs> It's, it's, uh, it's more cost effective than, than the fibers. <laughs> so we, so all these uh, 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 expectations are on pace to be realized. So, so, so we, we, we believe it's quite uh, uh, realistic. So we just re released uh, our first uh, uh, large-scale H1 image. So the upper panel is the channel map. The lower panel is the channel map, but uh, it's like a moment. So it's the, the width of the uh, emission. Uh, you can see all those <coughs> bubbles and filaments. Those are gas being blown up by uh, star formation. Uh, we also tried uh, to measure the z effect uh, through this so-called H1 narrow self-absorption. Uh, and this is the first uh, such uh, successful attempt and published on the cover of Nature earlier last year. So it corresponds to about four microgauss in Monaco cloud. It's much lower uh, than the canonic picture uh, uh, predicted. So it challenged the ambipolar diffusion uh, mechanism. And it was uh, uh, called uh, uh, potentially revolutionary result for the star formation community. And now we also try to uh, see whether we can apply this on a larger scale on the craft survey. So when we are done in about 10 years, we may have a 20 square degree of H1 data and we can Gaussian de uh, decompose them and try to add them up. Uh, maybe a small percentage of them would have enough sensitivity to get the Zima effect, but we're looking at somewhere between a few thousand to 10,000 points that has a magnetic field strength measurement. So that's, that's a one to two orders of magnitude more information about the uh, galactic magnetic field. And we really don't know the origin of the galactic magnetic field. <laughs> Uh, and we are also discovering new pulsars. Uh, uh, there are two surveys. One is the Galactic Plains survey that uh, now uh, turned out to be more productive. But for the Old Sky Drift Scan uh, survey, uh, this craft uh, has uh, uh, publicized uh, uh, more than 165 new pulsars, including 40 millisecond pulsars and one uh, new uh, double neutron star system. And all this can be found on our uh, project uh, website. And one of the more active field nowadays is fast radio burst, uh, which was awarded uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, this year's uh, Shores Prize uh, to Matthew Bills, uh, Maura uh, McLaughlin, and Duncan uh, Lorimer. So in the discovery paper back in 2007, uh, Duncan and, and Matthew published this, this one burst that cannot be repeated. Uh, so really, uh, nobody, uh, I mean, the, the, the 
the major fraction of the community don't really trust it. And it doesn't help that a few years later, uh, Australians publish another paper showing that, uh, yes, microwave can also produce a, a artificial di dispersion-like signal. Uh, so it's, it's not until 2013 when four other uh, independent births uh, has also been uh, discovered, and that's when this category of uh, phenomenon was uh, dubbed a fast radio uh, burst. So I was always amazed, um, considering the historical context, since I'm sort of in the field, and, and Duncan is a few years senior than me in, uh, in, uh, in Cornell, and, and Maura is one year more, more senior than me. Um, so, so at the end of the first paper, there's this sentence, it's a hundred of similar events could occur every day. So uh, keep in mind at that time, there's only one uh, first and, and, and nobody really take it seriously. And at, at the end of the second paper's uh, abstract, it says uh, the study of such phenomenon could offer an uh, opportunity to determine the baryonic content of the universe, which has also been demonstrated uh, in this landmark a paper by J.P. McCord in 2020. We now refer to this this correlation between the dispersion measure and the and the redshift, uh, uh, so-called McCord relation. Uh, so it so sometimes you really have to sort of have faith in your own uh, uh, a result and uh, judgment. So by now there's more than uh, 800 uh, fast radio bursts that has been published. And from last rumor I heard that Chime now has like 5,000 <laughs> in, in their catalog that, that's probably going to come out uh, later this year. And if we take the age of the universe as zero at Big Bang, and now it's like 50 in the middle age, uh, we can roughly separate them uh, into age groups. And the vertical axis is energy, and it have the uh, isotropic equivalent uh, 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 solar energy from a, in a few milliseconds, equivalent to a day to like a decade of solar energy. So it's, it, it is quite, a, uh, quite uh, amazing. So the craft survey has published four single births. They tend to be weak, uh, but from sort of the, uh, the, the, the teenage years of the universe. And from this four, because we are relatively unbiased survey, I can backtrack out a real estimate of the full sky event rate of fast radio bursts, which is at more than 120,000 every day. <laughs> Keep in mind, this is only limited by our sensitivity. Uh, if we have the future SKA, uh, and there's no physical reason to disbelieve that there will be more events. But basically, you are looking into the same volume of the universe and to higher and higher redshift, as long as there are galaxies and compact objects, uh, we think this we, we should find more. So the 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 realistic uh, expectation for the full sky event rate, I think, is somewhere between one million to ten million every day. So regardless of whether we can, in the next two to three decades, fully understand its origin or physical mechanism. I believe it will be a great new tool to probe many, many things uh, in, in, in the cosmos. Uh, just imagine you have this great light source that blow up every instance from all directions. And uh, so I think it's still at the very uh, early stage of, of this field. So in 2019, on May 20th, the craft survey uh, detected this, this already repeating source. Uh, this is uh, my, my postdoc at the time, Dr. Chen Hui Liu, now a faculty uh, in uh, uh, Huazhong Normal University. So uh, we it take two, uh, another two years, we, we localize it, and uh, we get multiband uh, limit on it, and uh, uh, finally uh, published uh, in the middle of last year. So it turns out to be the only persistent active fast radio bursts. So there's, in all published uh, FRBs, only five are seen to repeat, and only a few are very active. So when this small number of sources are active, they can produce hundreds of bursts 
every hour, but then they just turn off. They can turn off for like six to eight months. Uh, this source, uh, 1905-20, whenever we turn our telescope uh, uh, toward it, it always produces uh, bursts. Uh, so we have um, uh, reason to believe it may be very young, so it still has a very early um, active stage. So this is a, a recent uh, science paper that uh, published our follow-up monitoring of this source. So we see the Faraday rotation measure change uh, direction on two to three months uh, time scale. So it's go from the negative 10,000 to like positive 10,000, then drop back. And uh, <clears throat> this makes us think that one plausible explanation is that it's in a binary or multiple system. So you have this light source that produces this, this burst at a steady pace, but it goes around uh, another uh, a strongly magnetized plasma. It could be a massive stellar wind, but I, I personally think it's more likely a, a, a black hole jet system. Uh, and so if you viewing, if you go around it and viewing it from different angle, it, it gives you this reversal uh, of the uh, Faraday rotation measure direction. Um, but the numerical value uh, stay relatively stable. So it, it goes through this, this relatively uh, uh, smooth tr transition. Uh, so if this is true, uh, uh, on some time scale, we may have seen it uh, uh, spiral in. Uh, and this now has grown to be a, a, a large uh, international collab collaboration, and uh, there is a slew of uh, a sort of um, uh, special characteristics of this source, but I think the primary on of which is if you put on this so-called uh, McCord relation plot, now the vertical axis is independently measured redshift, and the x-axis is the dispersion measure, uh, and this zoom, this, this yellow uh, zoom is where the standard cosmology would allow, um, so-called a cosmic variance. You can see 1905-20 is way out there. <laughs> because 80% of this dispersion measure can be attributed local to the source. It's not coming from intergalactic medium. In fact, if you look in the data of the literature for those active repeaters, it's already have this access. So I think uh, this has shown that in order to really use the dispersion measure from FRBs to actually trace uh, the uh, cosmic baryons, uh, there, there need to some systematic correction uh, but we certainly need new data uh, to, uh, to uh, backtrack that out. Uh, so later in 2019, we were also uh, fortunate to catch a very active uh, episode of 12.11.02. The Arecibo discovered the first uh, known repeater, and in about 50 days, uh, we managed to detect 1,652 bursts that range uh, in three orders of magnitude in energy. So that's more than all previously, all previous literature combined. Um, so it's not a single power law anymore. Uh, and we can fit this bimodal energy distribution of the birth rate at a lower energy end by a log normal, uh, which usually represented some underlying stochastic uh, event. At higher energy, it goes from reasonably flat and asymptotically uh, approach a minus two, uh, which is a, a Lorentz uh, uh, Cauchy function. A Lorentz function can be reproduced by two, uh, the ratio between two independent Gaussians. Uh, so it may be some correlated uh, two stochastic event. Uh, we still don't know what uh, it is, but it seemed to be uh, quite com complex. So by now, we are, by now we now uh, have uh, for a slew of active repeater from FAST, since we can see deeper, thousands of bursts of 12, 11, 02, 19, 05, 20, 20, 20, 11, 24, A, and 20, 22, uh, 0, 9, 12, A, all those phone numbers. Um, <clears throat> So it's, I, it's like uh, the, uh, the, the GRB expert here, we, we hold those numbers quite dear <laughs> to, <laughs> to our hearts. Um, then we noticed something really strange in that 
given the quality of fast data and the depth, we, for a certain source, we just cannot see polarization. So at first, it really uh, uh, troubles me because uh, polarization is always the, the, the harder part of the, the experiment. There could be problem uh, in your uh, uh, different polarization channel uh, coupling, problem of the pointing angle. Um, but if we put the archive data and we also have some, some new GBT observation with the fast data, uh, a unifying picture emerge in that uh, at higher frequency for the same source, it tend to have higher degree of prioritization, goes to 100%. Uh, percent. And you go to lower frequency at a certain characteristic frequency to drop uh, precipitously and eventually goes to zero. And we can fit this by a very simple model uh, of multi-path propagation. So if you imagine the, the FRB behave like most pulsars, which have uh, very orderly, say, 100% linear polarized pulse, right? Because it's in a very ordered, uh, strong magnetic field. So, so each photon or each wave come out like this, but it goes through this varying plasma. It goes through different paths. So when you finally record it, uh, the uh, characteristic of the polarization got uh, smeared out. And this smearing, the severity of this uh, 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 smearing uh, is proportional to the wavelength and has this very steep uh, dependence. It's, it depends on the lambda to the fourth power in the exponential. Um, and, but there's only one single sort of physical free parameter in order to fit this curve, which is so-called sigma RM. Sigma RM is the local standard deviation of RM, and RM is the product of electron density and magnetic field strength. So, so as long as uh, either you have a clumpy uh, a plasma, uh, clumpy uh, uh, electron density, or you have a changing uh, magnetic field, or both, you can produce this. Um, and it's it, it also uh, interesting to note that the two source that has the largest sigma RM, so presumably the most complex local plasma environment, are 1905, 20, and 121102. 11, 02. So these are also the only two out of 800 sources that has so-called persistent radio source. The persistent radio source is that when the, R, uh, the FRB source is off, so there's no bright pulse, you can still see a radio source that look like a supernova remnant or just uh, a, a very, very bright, say, H2 region, but you have to really brighten the many, many orders of magnitude. So we, we still, still don't know what it is, but I think it's very suggestive that we may have an evolution. Uh, and the, the picture that I propose, but, but this is not in any single publication because this is still very hypothetical, is that for the fast radio burst, or at least a large fraction of them, at the beginning, there is some, uh, uh, some uh, 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 catalytic event. There is some uh, explosion. And the reason to have the explosion is to really, you, you have to ionize the surrounding environments in order to produce this very complex shrouding uh, plasma. And the result of that explosion will give you the so-called persistent radio source that's quite bright. And, and it also left with one or a group of compact objects because the compact object is the only sort of reasonable mechanism we know in the universe that produce reliable, very strong magnetic field, which is in turn required to produce this coherent bright radio emission. Uh, it could be a single one or a binary. Uh, and but as the time goes on, this PRS will quickly fade. That explains why only a very small percentage of fast radio bursts has a PRS counterpart. And this emission mechanism is either intrinsically or it got scrambled by its environment. So it's, it seems to be stochastic and has a different uh, bimodality. And its polarization is also got affected by the environment. But eventually, it all clear up. So you have a more stable polarization, the, the birth rate will drop, and the 
always uh, will uh, stabilize. I only have one slide <laughs> left. So, uh, so this uh, we have been in operation for uh, uh, three years, a, a little more than three years. Now it's, uh, there are more than 400 PI program led by uh, PIs from 20 nations, uh, facilitates more than 300 journal papers, including seven on nature and two on science and so on and so forth. So in summary, I think we are at the dawn uh, for, for this uh, facility that we start to produce the best ever uh, uh, large-scale uh, H1 images, and we start to paint an evolutionary picture of uh, fast radio birds. So we are uh, aim to be a su successor of the great Arecibo telescope, and hopefully I have leave you with the Im impression that uh, just as a uh, initial stage of that uh, journey. Thank you. So thank you, Professor, for this uh, really nice uh, status of uh, fast uh, questions. Uh, what is the possible relation with the soft gamma ray resistance as sources of this fast? Uh, right, so, so there's this famous uh, uh, SGR uh, 1935, and it's produced the first uh, uh, galactic fast radio burst. Um, so that's very important because that's the, the first source that actually have a confirmed counterpart that we know it's a magnetar. Uh, unfortunately, even that fast radio burst is like four orders of magnitude weaker than all the other extragalactic ones. Um, but that doesn't rule out it can be the common origin of, of, of FRBs because once it's moved outside of Milky Way, we only see those brighter ones uh, that, that, uh, that must happen less uh, frequently. Um, but if the, the magnetar uh, bursts are uh, the trigger of most fast radio bursts. That can be very unfortunate in that in other bands, we don't have matching sensitivity. So we won't be able to see, say, SGR 1935 even placed in the, in the nearby galaxies. Uh, that would make it uh, really hard because the, the GRB field really changed in the middle of 1990s when the the, the optical uh, afterglow is, uh, is finally identified. And unfortunately for, for radio band is that you cannot really use radio signal to trigger the other band's follow-up uh, because the, the radio come later. So, uh, so I think there are start to be some planning and effort to drive uh, simultaneous uh, survey. So you, 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 really, you really want some wide field uh, instrument that in different bands that, that just look at the same part of the sky that, that could have a hope of really catch uh, a, uh, a multi wavelength uh, event. Any other questions? In, in your evolutionary picture, um, what causes the transition from a, for a FRB? So to switch from repeating mode to a single uh, burst mode? So, uh, do, you, do you think that, it's, that the single burst uh, mode are, are, are ju just one with very, very long repeating time? Or, or yeah, I, I think most of the, uh, I cannot say for all, but I think most of the single bursts are just at a very low rate. Uh, because in practice, uh, if a burst uh, if a source is bursting, say, once in a week, uh, it will be a single event in most of the radio surveys uh, because you're not stare at the source 24 hours every day. Uh, you, you, you most ca uh, cadence, say, you do it, you do this large area of sky, say, every three days or every month. And if, if only produce one burst, say, in the week and you don't exactly know which day of the week it, it produced, it, it will be missed. It will only give you one detectable uh, burst. And from what we know now, the less than 10 sources are really active uh, in that they can produce many bursts in, in a, a small number of hours. 
and then it go into those chime repeaters that seem to have a few bursts there, a few bursts uh, a few months later that you, you happen to catch them, and then the other sources in most of you are, are just single, single bursts. Didn't, this didn't rule out, uh, there could be some, some really just single uh, merging or uh, 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 explosion events, um, but those may be in the minority. That's, that's, that's my bet. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Quick question. So I just uh, want to comment that uh, uh, in the Mariani cloud, mm. uh, long ago, before the idea of magnetars mm. came along, uh, there was uh, a very, very strong uh, soft uh, gamma ray ah. burst and that uh, had some repeating and then disappeared. Uh, it was not detected, mm. but was extremely strong. Uh, so uh, I, th I think we cannot rule out that they are uh, ah, right, right, yeah. That's interesting. Thank right. you. So let's thank again, thank Professor you. Lee. Thank you very much. <laughs> So, yes, second speaker, uh, Professor Felipe Mirabel.
Can you listen to me? So we continue. Uh, so first, uh, let me uh, welcome uh, here our ambassador from Argentina uh, in Armenia. So it's a um, pleasure to, to have you here, uh, present at the presentation of Professor Felix uh, uh, Mirabel from the University of Buenos Aires. And OK, so uh, Professor, please. Yes, thank you. Well, uh, Professor Lee mentioned at the beginning of his talk and show also uh, the images of Arecibo Telescope. And uh, I work at Arecibo for more than five years. And, uh, and I, I would like to share with you my feelings when uh, Arecibo collapsed and uh, was like uh, losing a very close friend. And uh, because at Arecibo, I had uh, done uh, 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 Recording a, a, a lot of my initial work in, in astronomy, like collisions of, uh, of high velocity clouds of atomic hydrogen with our uh, galactic disk in our galaxy, and also uh, we initiated there the discovery of ultraluminous infrared galaxies that then when I moved to Caltech uh, were discovered with the IRAS, the infrared astronomical satellite. So I had uh, uh, many uh, emotional times in our Arecibo. So I hope uh, that uh, the users of the new fast uh, telescope in China uh, will have the, the pleasure that I had uh, working in RSC. Well, uh, I uh, did all my degrees up to doctorate in Argentina, and, uh, and uh, during my studies, I, I went into astronomy. I was studying philosophy, and I was, uh, uh, my interest was to do science uh, in order to understand this world uh, because, uh, and then do uh, philosophy. And uh, I finished philosophy and, uh, and uh, I went into uh, uh, studying uh, 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 astronomy in La Plata. La Plata is the uh, capital of the province of Buenos Aires. Uh, where there was an observatory, and uh, and I didn't have uh, we didn't have a professor at that time of uh, extragalactic astronomy, neither of cosmology, but I went to uh, study uh, astronomy because I wanted to do uh, cosmology. Well, but. Uh, you know, working on astronomy, uh, studying astronomy, I became uh, interested also in other subjects like uh, star formation, the uh, structure of our galaxy, and so forth. So, and now that I'm formally retired at Emeritus in, uh, in uh, Argentina and in, uh, and in France, uh, I. I'm free to go into cosmology. And uh, so, um, and uh, I became uh, interested uh, in particular uh, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, surprising discovery in the last decades of, uh, of about, uh, 300 supermassive black holes with masses in the range of 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 10 solar masses in quasars uh, at redshifts between 5 and 8. Uh, and uh, you can see here a, uh, a, an, uh, an image of uh, that shows schematically our present understanding of the global evolution of the universe that many of you have seen already 
from the Big Bang until the present epoch. And, uh, and uh, our understanding is that uh, when the universe was about 400,000 uh, years old, uh, matter and radiation decoupled, and the first uh, uh, atoms and perhaps molecules were formed, and the inter uh, and almost all space uh, became full by uh, neutral uh, atoms and molecules. And uh, until the uh, universe uh, 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 reached an age of 200 million years, uh, the, we believe the first stars and galaxies were formed and because of the radiation from massive stars in the ultraviolet, all this neutral mat, uh, gas started to be ionized. And uh, this was the initiation of the, what is called the epoch of reionization that lasted up to about uh, uh, one billion years. Uh, when the intergalactic space became uh, almost fully ionized. And uh, this is why from the present epoch of the universe, ah, from the present epoch of the universe, we can see back the history of the universe because the intergalactic medium became Ionized. Now, in this talk, I will briefly mention the cosmological models and then present observations that motivate uh, this question. Uh, it is believed that uh, the 300 uh, supermassive black holes, uh, so massive, uh, are the tip of an iceberg. Namely, these are very massive, very luminous, so it's what we get. But there must be a very large quantity of black holes of lower masses being formed there. And perhaps these supermassive black holes are related with the recently discovered discovery of ultra compact galaxies with stellar masses of uh, 100 million uh, stars uh, at redshift between 10 and 13 reported first, the first galaxy of this type was reported by the Hubble Space Telescope and, and now uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is revealing this, uh, this uh, this galaxy. Well, and uh, in particular, I will refer in this talk to the uh, puzzle on how black holes were formed and grown so fast to become so massive. And this is uh, an open question uh, at this time. And uh, there is a uh, very good uh, review by Ina Yoshi and collaborators in Annual Review of Astronomy and Astrophysics, published in 2020, and with my uh, friend and collaborator, Luis Rodriguez from Mexico, we published uh, another review in New Astronomy Reviews uh, in 2022, where we mentioned uh, this, uh, this problem. Now, uh, the current idea of astrophysicists uh, working in this, uh, in this field is represented here. That doesn't mean it's the, it's the truth. It's just I'm talking about by the consensus of observation of observ people working in, in this field on and detecting this uh, supermassive black hole. And uh, 
assuming that uh, it, it is interesting that uh, astrophysicists publish the work on this black hole in, uh, in uh, astrophysics journals. And physicists publish their ideas in physics journals. And physicists usually assume the majority of the publications assume that these supermassive black holes come from cosmological seeds. Yeah. Whereas astrophysicists uh, think in other way. And uh, that is represented in this uh, figure by, uh, by uh, Wang and collaborator where it is represented the massive the massive of the uh, black hole as a function of redshift and as a function of time. Oh, so perhaps I shouldn't use this. Yeah. Okay. As a function of time. Uh, so the idea and these are the seven uh, supermassive black holes discovered at redshifts greater than seven up to the end of 2021. And uh, as you can see, the, uh, for different uh, ideas about the formation of the seeds of these black holes that are seen uh, when the universe was seven million years old, uh, the idea is that uh, they had to be, in order to reach these masses, they had to be more massive than 10 to the 3 solar masses up to uh, several uh, times uh, 10 to the 4. And uh, depending on the mechanism to form, to, to, uh, form the initial seed of this uh, massive black hole. Now, there are, it is interesting that now the James Webb telescope has found uh, two supermassive black holes at redshifts of nine and plus than 10 with masses of nine approximately and some units of 10 to the 6. And they, this is uh, something that people, astrophysicists uh, who are waiting from the James Webb, they are in the way uh, to grow up to 10 to the 9. So, and this is uh, something that from the James Webb we expected, namely to trace because of the detection capability to, to detect uh, black holes that along these lines are growing to 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 solar masses. Now, one thing that I believe I have found reviewing all the works, not all, but uh, all, all the works that I could review on this subject, people have not realized that uh, if there is this uh, rapid black hole growth up to 10 to the 9 at the redshifts of 7 from uh, seeds uh, smaller than 10 to the 5 solar masses at redshifts of 30, this only can be possible because the growth of the global cosmic gas density evolves with redshift as the third power of one plus C. And uh, if you go, if you say that the seeds are born at redshifts of 30, the mean global gas density will be uh, between 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 5 times 
the mean local gas density at this redshift. So uh, the conditions under which the seeds of these supermassive black holes are formed are completely different from the local universe. And uh, so the next question that uh, I asked, or we, we have asked, is what are the models, the current models, and the most recent models on the formation of these seeds? Well, yesterday we, we listened to the work by Carlos Arguelles, which, who is an Argentinian, a young Argentinian, uh, that uh, in collaboration with uh, members of ICRANET, uh, uh, of ICRA, uh, uh, has proposed, uh, made a proposition of the nature of these uh, seeds that I will not go into it because we had a long talk about this. Uh, but there, there is another uh, model uh, in the context of cold dark matter cosmologies where uh, it is proposed that turbulent cold flows give birth to this uh, uh, supermassive black hole seeds. And this is a paper published in Nature uh, six months ago or seven months ago, uh, where it is proposed that uh, in halos, dark matter halos of 10 to the 5 solar masses at redshifts of 30, 35, in the uh, rare uh, convergence of strong cold accretion flows created by direct collapse, a massive black hole seeds of few times 10 to the 4. And this is uh, a numerical uh, simulation uh, with big computers. And, uh, and in this process, because of the turbulence of the coal flows, uh, uh, star formation is prevented by the high turbulence of of these coal, coal flows, namely if the flows to form these uh, seeds are too large, you cannot form stars because to form stars, my, you need uh, certain uh, gravity. Right? And uh, so you could not. And so the question that arises is, uh, Full in the context of this uh, model, uh, the massive black hole uh, seeds, uh, if uh, they could have been formed before the first massive stars in the universe were formed. And if that is the case, uh, which is also one of the consequences of the uh, Arguelles uh, model. So in these two new channels for the formation of supermassive black hole seeds in the high uh, redshift universe are not associated with and could precede the first generation of pop three stars. So black holes will be al orig al origin of the first stars formed in the universe. Now, these models will change the paradigm of pop three star formation and supermassive black hole formation. And in, that is based on the observations of how black holes are formed in our galaxy and, our, and other galaxies. You, put, you build uh, uh, very big stars of up to 100 or several hundred solar masses with low metallicity that collapse and form uh, uh, black holes. Uh, this will be the reverse. <laughs> and uh, so uh, this will imply a change of paradigm 
on the formation of the first stars in the universe. So the question that uh, I, I, I ask myself, uh, could the first stars and um, black holes sit be formed in dark matter hallowed by a cosmic wave uh, called flows? I mean, flows of gas that uh, go through the, uh, the, the filaments of the cosmic web. You see here the cosmic web uh, uh, that uh, is being constructed uh, progressively. Uh, all the galaxies and the black holes follow uh, filaments that in some places they merge and it's where, it's there where, according to uh, the last model, the first seeds of, uh, of, of black holes, uh, supermassive black holes were formed. Of, of course, uh, here, this is uh, evolved. Uh, it's a recent uh, epoch of the universe that is shown here. Now, now the question is, uh, have high, redshift cosmic wave filaments of galaxies and active uh, galaxies, uh, supermassive black holes being observed. This is uh, an observation of the recent universe. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, uh, it was with that end constructed in, uh, uh, for the European Southern Observatories in Chile, where I work for as director in Chile of the observatory for five years, you can work constructed an instrument called MU. And, uh, and the idea was precisely try to trace how was the, the the structure, the filamentary structure of the universe at epochs, at very early epochs, and uh, at epochs uh, when the redshift uh, of redshift of about three, namely when the universe was about 1.6, 1.7 giga years old. And, uh, and here you see an image uh, by the French, uh, led, led by the French team, uh, taken uh, of a filament that uh, has uh, an, a, a length of 4.6 for moving megaparsec and a width of about uh, 200 uh, for moving kiloparsec. And, uh, and here, they studied in detail these condensations that are, are along this uh, line, and they reported the detection of only one active black hole, namely one AGM. Now, to have uh, the emission in Lyman alpha, that is a line uh, here observe is a, a fluorescence line, you need a background of UV uh, photons uh, to excite the atoms that then uh, uh, go down and uh, going down produce the Lyman alpha transition. But the, and here on the right is shown with the same instrument but in a region where it is believed that there is a proto cluster of galaxies uh, where uh, the situation changes dramatically because uh, this uh, proto, in this region where there should be a proto cluster of galaxies that are being formed, there are for instance, here two filaments, and the red points represent the positions of uh, very massive galaxies and uh, active galactic nuclei. 
And uh, as you can see um, here, the rate of, uh, of uh, active uh, supermassive black holes and massive galaxy is about 1,000 times larger than here in this region. So, uh, but uh, Lyman alpha, this line, Lyman alpha fluorescence, corresponds to a temperature of the gas of uh, 10,000 uh, 10, uh, degrees Kelvin. So this is not a cold fall flow. So the question is, have really cold uh, gas streams along the filaments of uh, cosmic uh, web been observed feeding massive black holes and, uh, and massive uh, galaxies. And uh, in the next slide is shown one case uh, that of an intergalactic cold gas stream feeding a protocluster of massive galaxies and supermassive black holes uh, at, a cosmi at cosmic down when the universe was only 1.7 giga years. Uh, and uh, this is a computer simulation, this is interesting, <laughs> done in 2013. And here are the observations. And uh, this is a paper published in, uh, in Science uh, two months ago. So it's, we are in the, actually in this area in a, in a moment that is extraordinary, with extraordinary uh, discoveries. You can see here uh, a stream that is of, uh, of coal gas namely uh, uh, detected in the, uh, in the, uh, in the transition of uh, hyperfine tra transition of, of, of neutral carbon that is coming from the north on a region where it's been formed a, uh, a uh, protocluster of galaxies and here you have another, in blue, another uh, stream of gas uh, that is coming from the south, from the opposite direction. And uh, here you have, uh, this is uh, warm Lyman alpha emission, heated probably by, by uh, the radio galaxy. There is a massive radio galaxy with that name. And, uh, and here you see the, what will be uh, the size of the Milky Way projected here. It's very small, the full, the full size of the, of the Milky Way. The detailed observations of uh, this uh, uh, discovery is, uh, is, uh, is here. Uh, this is the basic uh, observations where you can see that uh, these are observations with the Atacama large millimeter array of the transition of carbon, the hyperfine transition of, of carbon, uh, neutral carbon. Uh, that is a transition at this uh, wavelength and this frequency. And uh, we know that uh, the, the, the stream that is shown here I will, is coming from cold, very cold gas because uh, the upper energy level of this transition is only 24 degrees K, which is very, very cold. Uh, and, uh, and the critical density to produce the transition is uh, 500 particles per cubic centimeter, which is what you need to produce molecular hydrogen. So this 
is a very important discovery because we are, they, are, they have reported the discovery of uh, a coal gas stream at uh, an age of the universe of only 1.7 giga years. And uh, here you have the properties of the stream, but the other thing that the model, apart this, is high turbulence. It was needed high turbulence to impede uh, the formation of stars. Yeah? And, uh, and this is shown here. This is what radio astronomers we call velocity position uh, maps. And you can see here, this is the position of the radio galaxy. And uh, this is the northern stream that is coming to uh, the, the massive uh, radio galaxy. And here you see the stream coming from the opposite. And the difference of velocity of these streams, the velocity is here, is at least 1,500 kilometers per second. So these two streams are encounter each other at a velocity difference of 1,500 kilometers per second. And that produces turbulence <laughs> in the merging streams. And uh, so uh, this is uh, observational result that is consistent with the model that was proposed uh, uh, last year. Now, this uh, turbulent coal flows at redshift greater than 20 could give birth to supermassive black hole seeds by direct collapse. They will collapse di directly preventing star formation. In this context, the seeds of supermassive black holes could be formed before the bulk of pop three stars, as proposed in the Nature paper, and also proposed by uh, uh, the Arguedes uh, collaboration. Now, uh, well, this is history, uh, but uh, I want to go now, what new thing I have done on all this. And the point is that uh, this very early black hole, if they are accreting at those very high rates, they should produce relativistic jets, uh, very powerful relativistic jets. And there is uh, an association between accretion and jet, relativistic jet production. And uh, so the point is that those, uh, I mean, th this is a sort of review of what we know from many years already, but the point is that uh, this black hole jet will produce positive feedback. Black hole jets and massive outflows may inject mechanical energy and turbulence further turbulence in the gas. And at high volume densities of uh, gas, uh, the gas is compacted. Namely, we know that uh, jets may uh, impede and destroy uh, regions of star formation and molecular clouds. But uh, also they can induce the formation of molecular clouds. All that depends the power of the jets and on the environment density, volume density. These black holes are not isolated in the universe. They have an environment. Yeah? And uh, at high volume gas densities, as shown to, uh, to produce this carbon uh, transition, where you need that in these streams are uh, molecular gas, is compacted, the, the gas will be compacted by the black holes and associated outflows leading to a top-heavy IMF. And 
And the question is, is this observed in sources of the local and distant universe, this uh, positive mechanism? Well, this is something uh, I did several years ago. Here you see uh, a stellar black hole jets inducing massive star formation. Uh, this is uh, um, uh, how uh, nature reported the apparent uh, superluminal motions in our galaxy, where you can see here uh, the jet produced by a black hole, uh, a creeping black hole. This is the uh, approaching jet, and this is the receding jet. And because we saw the two jets, and we need knowing roughly the distance of the black hole, we could resolve the system of equations uh, and determine, knowing the distance and the relation between the jet direction and the line of sight, we could uh, resolve the uh, system of equations and determine the actual speed of the jets, which is 95, uh, between 95 and 98 percent the speed of light. Uh, this is the first time that was done. Uh, in extragalactic astronomy, there were a lot of superluminal jets, but these are apparent superluminal because the jets are pointing to the observer and the jets are boosted. Yeah? And uh, so uh, and it was also cool determined by uh, Red uh, et al. Uh, that uh, the black hole of 12 solar masses at the origin of these jets uh, had been formed without an energetic supernova. Okay, uh, well, uh, this is uh, a proof that uh, there is a relation between uh, uh, you see, uh, along the direction of the jets are two regions, very compact regions of massive star formation. Now, <coughs> Well, uh, this is uh, detail. Now, at high redshift, uh, something, uh, well, based on the same principle, is observed in the galaxy where I showed previously, uh, where you can see this is, uh, these are uh, Hubble Space Telescope images. You can see here the impinging call uh, uh, streams, and these are the, this is the direction of jets that are inducing star formation. Uh, and uh, at different uh, wavelengths, uh, with, uh, and this is Lyman alpha emission with Hubble. And you can see the Lyman alpha emission is tracing, uh, produced by massive stars, no other thing can produce this, to our knowledge, are in the direction of the relativistic jets produced by this uh, radio galaxy. That is a model, and uh, here uh, dust formation is uh, traced uh, at two uh, millimeter observations and so forth. So, the black hole uh, jet uh, star formation mechanism uh, must be more important at cosmic down than in the present universe. In the present universe, we observe star formation, but it's not uh, uh, a prominent phenomenon. But in a galaxy that is at a redshift of 3.8, this these are very important uh, emission produced. Uh, so, if one goes to the cosmic down, uh, to redshifts of 30, when the environmental density was enormous compared with the density there, 
I imagine that uh, this mechanism must have been very important. So, the conclusion, uh, the chairman has been very, very nice with me. <laughs> Uh, the conclusion is that the relativistic jets from rapidly growing compact seeds of supermassive black holes observed in quasars at redshift greater than six must have enhanced the formation of massive po populations three stars at cosmic down. Uh, how the jet induced star formation mechanism compared with other mechanisms of uh, forma star formation in the early universe remains a, an open question that deserves further exploration. I think it's, uh, it's nice for young people start to work on, on this idea. I have no doubt, but I cannot uh, quantify and compare it, this mechanism with other mechanisms uh, that are of star formation that we, we know. But we know must take place from observations in the local and distant universe. Now, uh, uh, this is something on which I didn't uh, talk, and this, this is uh, calculated in our, our review, in New Astronomy Reviews, uh, is that uh, it is a Expected that the uh, escape kilometer array, uh, the new uh, radio telescope, in particular the one in uh, uh, the one uh, in uh, sorry, uh, yes, in, in Australia, will be able to detect in the radio continuum the black holes of very early supermassive black holes the black hole seeds, as the individual responsible sources of H1 line uh, absorption at redshift of 20. Uh, there in this review are the calculations we did, and this is the conclusion. And then H1 absorption may be detectable in the case of protogroup of galaxies with certainly growing black holes uh, and even individually in case of being cosmic dawn blazers, namely when the jets point to the observer yeah, and the jets are uh, boosted or amplified by intervening uh, gravitational lens uh, sources. So this is the conclusion that is mostly qualitative, but uh, what now is needed is to, to make models. Thank you. <laughs> so, Felix didn't help me with time, but uh, there is time maybe for one question. Um. Are there any ideas about physics, about the physical mechanism behind this star formation induced by jets? Uh, yes, well, there are, there are models and you have uh, already published, but uh, those models address the question on the in induced uh, star formation by jets in the local universe, not in the distant universe with the very different environmental conditions, especially in, in density of the gas. Well, because uh, that depends, I mean, this is something I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, go in because that take a, will take time. Uh, yes, black hole jet and massive outlook can have positive or negative uh, feedbacks related to uh, uh, star formation. And all depends on on the dense, well, on the environment and the power of the source. 
and it is observed, for instance, in clusters of galaxies uh, in the local universe, that the jets are producing holes in the, in the environment. And uh, this is because the environment doesn't have uh, enough uh, density to uh, produce, uh, to stop the jets and uh, collect uh, gas uh, by the impinging of the jet and outflow uh, uh, gas uh, to molecular uh, uh, levels that will lead to the formation of, of stars. This, uh, this is something no, uh, that we know. We, we see negative uh, feedback in the local universe and, uh, and positive feedback. But the positive feedback usually produce not much stars because the densities are not enough. Well, <laughs> I'm very happy that the ambassador of Argentina is present to this uh, very important contribution that came from Argentina yesterday and today. And uh, I am very happy also that uh, from the audience there is a change of paradigm. And yesterday, when the Italian ambassador was here, I said, there is a change of paradigm. We thought black holes are formed later, and we think now that black holes are formed in the beginning, and they are the origin of the largest black hole in the gamma ray burst. He was frightened. He said, hmm. well, I want to tranquilize the ambassador of uh, Argentina and transmit that yes, we have a change paradigm, which you should not be afraid. Thanks. Great, thank you. Let's thank again Professor Mirabel. Well, since we have now um, a remote uh, talk by Professor uh, Rasmik Mirzoyan, Selected Studies of Cosmic and Gamma Rays uh, with the Magic Telescopes. Rasmik, can you hear us? You can uh, share your screen. Okay. Okay. You can share your screen, and then we. Okay. Thank you. We'll be able to see. The organizing committee for the invitation. And I want to mention that I regret that uh, just a few days ago I had to cancel my trip to Yerevan. I am coming from Yerevan, yeah, just because of family reasons. So I I was going to have good times with a lot of friends, but this is life. So um, in my presentation today, I'm going uh, to give you some um, impressions or glimpses about the technique that allows one to measure the processes and sources for studying the non-thermal universe at the highest energies. So. There are too many results. I think um, our project um, uh, of magic telescopes in uh, October is going to celebrate 20 years anniversary. And then during this time, we published um, around 200 uh, papers in peer reviewed journals. So I'm just selecting a few results to give you an impression what's going on. And then uh, this is, of course, a subjective choice. But nevertheless, I hope you will enjoy um, some aspects of it. So first of all, um, I want to introduce you what, uh, what kind of instruments exist. So there are uh, also smaller KSK telescopes uh, like ASTRI project, Italian ASTRI, but I think I will concent uh, concentrate uh, 
And Veritas, Hayes, and Magic. And then uh, these are the important telescopes, which are operational. And since recently, there is a 23 meter diameter um, um, large size telescope of the CTA collaboration. And these are the frontier of very high energy gamma ray astrophysics. Yeah? Here you see the picture of um, Veritas uh, array, uh, which is located in Arizona, 50 miles from Tucson. Uh, close to the Mexican border. And then you can see four telescopes of 12 meter diameter with imaging camera in their fucking. And in the background on this place that I show with arrow, you can see this so-called Schwarzschild Kude and double mirror telescope, uh, which is going to operate a very fine pixelized uh, CPM based camera. Um, on this uh, view graph, you can see on the HES telescopes, which are um, located in Namibia, HES includes uh, four telescopes of 12 diameter, 12 meter diameter, like Veritas. Uh, just their camera has a little bit uh, wider field of view, five degrees compared to 3.5 degrees of Veritas. And in the center, they have this uh, built these gigantic telescopes uh, of um, uh, 26 meter times 28 meter. And then uh, with the camera in the focus, so I think the telescope is supposed to measure lower lower energies. And uh, these are these are the magic telescopes. So you can see um, in the center the first 23 meter diameter telescope. We call it a large size telescope LST. Then this is the magic one, which we built in 2003, and it is operational. And then magic two on 85 meter distance, which is operational since. Uh, 2009. So for the time being, there is three telescopes can operate together, and we are processing experimental data in this experimental room. Um, you see a tower with the lidar there, and then what is uh, striking in this picture: the location height is 2,200 meters above sea level, and you see that typically we are above the clouds. These are the clouds over the ocean, and the blue color that you see it is it is the ocean. So um, another, um, I think another two instruments I would like to mention, which measure not only Cherenkov light, but uh, they measure Cherenkov light uh, induced by particles. So this is so-called HOG instrument, which is located 4,100 meters in Mexico. HOG uh, consists of um, 300 close packed optically isolated water Cherenkov detectors. You see these barrels, barrels are typically of uh, almost five meter height and uh, seven, seven meter in diameter. They are filled in with water, something like uh, 280 tons of water in each. Detector is operational since 2015. Mm -hmm. It's a US-Mexican project. And then um, they uh, produce a lot of data during night. So this is giving you a glimpse uh, how a detector, single detector uh, is looking like, the barrel. Uh, this 180 tons of water, and then uh, four photomultipliers are measuring Cherenkov light um, induced by um, particles, typically electron positrons that enter the water. So it is essential that this uh, telescope is uh, located at a large height. And then this is a single photomultiplier unit, one of the four, oh, it's, it's hemispherical PMT. Another project uh, which is um, becoming uh, very famous recently. It is the, this uh, LASSO. It's a Chinese detector, also located at a high altitude on the mountain at 4,400 meters. And then um, this is a complex detector because it has four components. So it has uh, 12 uh, wide field of view Erzcherenkov telescopes. I should mention that new Erzcherenkov telescopes are um, um, produ um, produced or built um, for LASSO, and then over 5,000 uh, scintillator detectors. And one of the powerful det detector is this um, 80,000 square meter surface water Cherenkov detector. Uh, this is similar to what was for Hawk in, in these barrels, but it's uh, one lake, uh, artificial, okay, or, or a pool. And it is roughly um, almost four times larger compared to Hawk. And then there are oh, about 1,000 um, water Cherenkov tanks, which are buried uh, slightly underground. 
<clears throat> this is a bird's view on the hook detector on the lasso detector. And then I think uh, we will listen about lasso detector. There will be an interesting uh, presentation tomorrow. Because we measured this GRV 22109A, which means on October 9th, they measured the GRV, very intense one. Uh, 64,000 uh, gamma rays were measured from this GRV. And then I think uh, um, uh, one year ago, they measured first bevatrons. Um, our Pevatron candidate, I think, uh, I think uh, it is, this is a very powerful instrument. And then I should mention that um, this is one of the most expensive uh, instruments uh, of uh, this type. I think uh, the estimated cost was 180 million US dollar. Okay, so. I come now to magic telescopes, which measure Cherenkov light, and then I just introduce you some, some parameters. Typically, such a Cherenkov telescope provides an angular resolution between 0.05 to 0.1 degree, and it is a resolution 15 to 20%. And then the uh, sensitivity of these telescopes are in the range of uh, from 20 GV uh, to 100 TV or even higher. Typical, typically, these telescopes provide large collection area of air showers. Um, this magic is a collaboration of uh, about 200 astrophysicists from 300 countries, and then uh, these uh, 13 countries, and then 30 countries include um, Armenia, Ikranit and Alihanian Brothers uh, National Laboratory. Bulgaria, Brazil, uh, Croatia, Finland, um, and the main contributors are Germany, Japan, Italy, uh, Spain, and Switzerland, although some other countries also participate in the project. So I want to talk now about um, giving a pulsar. With the magic telescope, we managed to measure very, very weak signal from the giving a pulsar at the significance level above six sigma at energies about 15 GV. And then I should mention that this is the third pulsar revealed in the very high energy domain. And very high energy domain is defined something like above 20, 30 GV. It is uh, where satellite detectors become not so efficient because they are very small um, area of the detector. So um, age of this uh, giving a pulsar is 340 uh, kilo years, and the estimated distance is in the range 175 to 150 uh, parsec. We measured for 80 hours this object, and then in the end, I think we managed to measure pulsed emission from this giving a, and then uh, this got published in the in a um, couple of years ago. And then we started studying this object. Um, it's interesting that uh, this uh, spectrum of this uh, uh, pulsar can be um, described by a power, very steep power law with uh, about minus five. And the magic at Fermi data, these are Fermi data and continued by the magic data, they show an excellent overlap uh, for energies until 40 GV, and there is no cutoff. And then our data shows that we can. Um, uh, rule out the exponential cutoff and sub-exponential cutoff, this uh, um, cyan curve and the red curve. And then um, it shows uh, something like power law behave, uh, behavior, which is in principle compatible uh, with the inverse Compton model. And then we asked our um, knowledgeable colleagues to model this source, and they tried to model the source with outer gap model and then um, um, try to model with inverse Compton emission um, inward going electrons. That observations uh, challenged the model. So the model description uh, was rather poor, I should mention. Uh, I should mention that there was a con uh, contribution also from the Hility Polar Cap from uh, Caravia from the paper 2004. And um, Relatively recently, there was a publication uh, from Alice Harding and colleagues, and then they showed that there is a, this, this can be explained as novel class uh, of sources uh, which are supported by uh, ext um, extensive numerical simulation. So uh, 
acceleration happens just beyond the light cylinder. Light cylinder is the distance from the center of pulsar, where um, which is rotating um, in the frozen magnetosphere, and then just due to centrifugal force, the electrons uh, can reach uh, energies as high as the uh, um, uh, speed of light, and uh, uh, beyond uh, we cannot accelerate any more. So this is called light cylinder. So I think in, in, the, in her paper, Alice Harding is arguing here that um, it, it can be explained just by synchrotron emission. There is no need to invoke inverse compton component. Here, yeah, it's very steep, I think, uh, this fault uh, of, of the curve in a uh, log log scale. Um, so it could be um, maybe 50 GB, maybe 100 GB. But I think uh, this seems to explain our data. Of course, I think we will measure more this source in future. Uh, just as a matter of fact, uh, to mention that uh, some time ago we measured pulsed uh, gamma rays from the crop pulsar, and then pulsations went uh, to energy as high as uh, two tera electron volts. And then I think uh, the, we, we saw no cutoff, just we ran out of statistics. So higher statistics should show even uh, higher energies. And then this is another very striking feature of the pulsars. I want to um, mention also some, some techniques that we are using uh, since several years. Typically, a telescope is measuring extended air showers. A particle from the space is entering into deep layers of atmosphere and initiating extended air shower. And typically, the first interaction point will be somewhere at 25, 30 kilometers, depending uh, if it's an electromagnetic cascade or hydraulic cascade. And then, then this extended air shower will have extension of typically, let's say, 10 kilometers. Um, this is uh, the picture when we measure from small zenith angles. And then because of Cherenkov emission angle is limited to essentially one degree, um, at deep layers of atmosphere, we have such a cone, and then this cone illuminates the Cherenkov telescope. Wherever you put it uh, within this area, it will get a trigger. But if you go to a large zenith angle, let's say 75 degrees or 80 degrees, the situation is changing because the atmosphere, the, the particle will count the same grams per centimeter square in atmosphere and will start showering much earlier or much far away from you. And then uh, in the end, I think it will illuminate um, um, under the same emission angles, Cherenkov angle, much larger area. In this way, you can collect uh, much more many such showers and then order of magnitude increase uh, is there just at the expense of higher threshold, of course. Yeah? So, and then um, I think uh, we check this, um, um, this issue just looking the, uh, sunset uh, from La Palma at, uh, on, on, from the observation height of 2,200 meters at the uh, Roque de la Muchachos Observatory. And you can see um, this is the horizon, the ocean yeah? horizon. Horizon is roughly 170 kilometers if you measure from, from this height. And then you can clearly see the sun. And then I measured the spectrum of the sun just before the sunset. This is the lowest curve. And you can see some light is arriving to your eyes, and then also chunk of light is arriving. So I think um, about 500 nanometer, and we use this feature, and we did interesting measurements, and um, practically without investing um, any additional money or instrumentation, we could uh, measure um, with a collection area in excess of two kilometer square. Not that the uh, CT um, telescope array, I think, is constructing uh, 70 or more telescopes in the southern hemisphere in Chile, um, which will have uh, just comparable collection area. This is shown in the green curve. Yeah. And this technique helped us to measure relatively fast the signal from the Crab Nebula. We, we, we could measure signal from 100 per electron volt or slightly higher. Uh, which is very interesting uh, candidate uh, for, uh, for a pevatron. So um, I think uh, here I show you our measurement of the galactic center with the magic telescopes, and then magic telescopes are located in the northern hemisphere. So we are observing galactic center um, at 58 degrees or more, 
But then just because what I told you before, I think uh, there is an advantage to observe and uh, allows any dongles. And this is, uh, this is the picture of what we measured and the sources in the, in the, uh, in the region of Galactic Center. And then um, and this is the brightness on the right hand side. You can see brightness kind of the strip of galactic plane for energies above one tera electron volt. And the blue color are the magic measurements. Orange is the best fit model on this curve. And then um, this includes the CS profile. And um, uh, Sagittarius A and um, um, ARC are also shown here. So you can see on this picture that there is there seems to be a left-right asymmetry around the galactic center. I think we are trying to explore this more. And just uh, to say what we measured from, from here, um, center of our galaxy harbors the yet uh, closest known supermassive black hole. I think uh, all of you know this very well because relatively recently Nobel Prize was uh, given for, for these studies. And then um, due to proximity of this laboratory, unique laboratory, uh, one can study cosmic uh, rays uh, acceleration near black holes. So uh, our measurements show that we can confirm the earlier claim from the ESH collaboration that uh, um, um, there is a peak distribution towards the supermassive black hole. Um, um, I, from the IS publication from 2016 uh, and 18. Um, and then uh, this could be seen as evidence that uh, really uh, part until recently, uh, supermassive black hole was accelerating particles. Um, the only difference is that uh, we see some cutoff with uh, two sigma heat for a spectral turnoff on several tens of tera electron volt. So which, which will limit the highest energies accelerated uh, in the galactic center. Well, something uh, totally else. Uh, we are measuring, we are trying to measure the proton spectrum uh, with the magic telescopes in the energy range uh, between one to 500 tera electron volt. And proton, protons are uh, uh, some kind of background for us. It's the main background. We get it for free. Typically, for example, when we observe any source, let's say Crab Nebula. We get 300 uh, triggers from uh, hadrons, and uh, just uh, um, six gammas in one minute, but uh, 300 hertz uh, hadrons we measure. So we try to use this feature and then try to study it by using uh, uh, new artificial intelligence with new neural networks. And this is the spectrum, what I show you. This uh, magic spectrum uh, are these uh, two colors, the blue and this cyan color, and they are compared to Dampe and Krim experiments. And you can see this is one tera electron volt, 100, and then uh, 100 tera electron volt. You can see that there is fair, fair agreement between magic measurements and then uh, specific detectors like Dampe and Krim. I think we are looking into more chemical elements, and uh, we are preparing interesting publication on this issue. Uh, another thing, uh, just uh, to, to show you the variety of tasks that we are uh, working on. Um, when measuring uh, marker M501, um, uh, one of the closest uh, blazers, um, and studying extreme X-ray flares, we saw a hint of a narrow spectral feature at a three tera electron volt. Somewhere here, you can see on this picture, yeah? three tera electron volt. And then um, I think uh, we suggest three scenarios to produce such effect. Um, um, it could be pile up in the electron energy distribution due to stochastic acceleration, or it could be a structured jet, two-zone synchrotron self-compton emission model, or a magnetospheric vacuum gap model plus one zone um, SSC model where a pair cascade uh, may start. Um, just to mention short that uh, since several years, we are always part of uh, multi-messenger me measurements and uh, multi wavelength and multi-messenger measurements. And this just shows, um, um, I think, uh, so-called uh, first multi-messenger um, 
observation of a neutrino, 300 tera electron volt neutrino, and then gamma rays by Fermi and magic telescopes. I think this made quite some resonance uh, several years ago. And then uh, I should tell that uh, every week we have multiple uh, alerts from uh, neutrino detectors, and then uh, we each have special tags. Uh, and then we decide which one to follow, and this, uh, we spend quite some time of our instrument on such observations. Um, also, from uh, gravitational detector uh, alerts, we are uh, observing the scanning the regions. We have a special um, a program to do that. Yeah. I want to mention uh, this uh, GRB in 1901-14 scene, which was measured. Uh, 2019, and then this was a very um, um, widely discussed, uh, I think, measurement. And uh, just uh, for the first time, we measured the gamma ray burst uh, at tera electron volt energies. And our measurement started 57 seconds after onset. And then uh, T90 was 360 seconds. It was a bright long GRB with the uh, isotropic energy equivalent to 3 times 10 to the 53 eggs. And redshift was 0 0.42. We detected some 60 sigma signal from the afterglow 57 seconds later. I think uh, you, you know, most probably you measure afterglow in the energy range 200 GV to tera electron volt. Um, the tera electron flux was similar to that in X-rays. And then the intensity was incredible, though we started just 57 seconds after the onset. We measured 130 crab in the first minute. What does it mean, 130 crab? I think uh, crab nebula is the strongest source in our galaxy. So and this uh, emission, even one minute later, uh, after onset, it was 130 times stronger than crab. Um, and then thus we have a purest um, ever gamma ray sample from this source. Here you can see uh, the, um, one of the two publications in Nature in the same issue. that shows um, multiple instruments, 24 instruments measuring the same event, and then we give interpretation of this uh, gamma ray burst. Uh, what 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 very interesting there? I think we measured. Uh, 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 spectrum um, in very short uh, time intervals in 42 seconds, uh, 70 seconds, 180 seconds. You can, you can see all this uh, shown here. And we, see, we see the dynamics of how the GRE was developing during time. And then um, we could uh, well explain this uh, emission by a uh, cyclotron self Compton process with a typical two bump feature that we know from uh, blazers. And then uh, obviously this tells us that VRB was even more power than the terra electron volt emission. So um, um, I should mention that a non-negligible part of GRB energy is released at terra electron volt energies. And the modeling parameters for this GRB were similar to known um, other GRB after the studies before, before the discovery of terra electron volt emission. And then I think uh, we made the conclusion that uh, very high energy emission should be a common effect. And this became true because since then, I think uh, several GRBs have been measured by um, uh, two by MAGIC, uh, no, three by MAGIC and two by S instrument. And then now I think we will listen about the measurement by the LASSO instrument tomorrow, we will listen about it. I want to mention short about, uh, we, we also have a hint from a short GRB. 16OA21, which was published in APG. Um, this short GRB was from a distance of uh, relatively nearby, uh, redshift 0 0.16. Uh, we were uh, quite lucky to start observing the source 24 seconds after the onset, but it's a short GRB, I think, uh, classically below two seconds emission time. Uh, still, I think uh, it turned out that uh, um, Kilodoba emission um, supposed from the HST um, observations have uh, been confirmed, and the progenitor probably is a binary neutron star system. Simplest emission model is in tension with the tera electron volt predicted flux. flux. And then I think this opens exciting perspective for the next uh, LIGO Virgo Kagra run, which started in March this year. 
So um, this is this was just a three sigma detection, and then we, we do not call it detection. Uh, the correct term for it is hint, signal hint, in the energy rate 600, 800 G. Um, there is another GRB which we measured with a magic telescope. This this one was from the redshift of 1.1. So the, this is the most distance uh, um, source discovered uh, to date from uh, at very high energies. So um, because uh, we know there's extra galactic background light, then uh, gamma rays suffer strong absorption on this extra galactic background light. And then we managed to measure a um, little bit more than six sigma signal above 70 GV until roughly 200 GV in 20 minutes of observations. And it seems that um, a cyclotron self compton model provides an adequate description for this emission. And then comes the surprise. I think, uh, um, and the surprise is uh, now we, we are uh, measuring better, we are measuring more precise, and it seems that late radio data requires to invoke an additional component. So it is not nicely fitting uh, into a simple picture. Our paper is ready. We are in the process of submitting it to a journal. So you will listen about it uh, soon. Uh, you will have an opportunity to read it soon. Um, I want to mention a, a few words about this um, um, RS uh, of, of Yuki, which we measured in 2021. RS of Yuki is a recurring NOVA that has had nine outbursts since 1898 with each sudden jump in visual magnitude from 12.5 to magnitude 5. Such a burst was observed on August 8, 2021 by Irish amateur astronomer um, Kate Geary. Here you can you get a, a glimpse of it. And then um, classical NOVA, a cataclysmic binary star system in which matter companion star is a critic on the white dwarf. And the accumulation of matter in, um, in layer eventually causes thermonuclear explosion on the surface of the white dwarf, brightening uh, the white dwarf, white dwarf up to 10 to the 5 solar luminosities and triggering ejection of the matter. Um, so this, um, this is a symbiotic nova. And then um, symbiotic nova is the one where the component star of the white dwarf is a red giant. So we started absorbing it uh, 2021, August 9. In parallel, his collaboration um, announced uh, we have very high energy gamma rays from RS of Yoki. And then uh, we essentially we measured the uh, 13 sigma signal from, from this uh, object from spanning in the range from 60 GV to 250 GV. And it was an intriguing uh, fact that GV emission was subsiding with a halving time scale of 2.2 days, but at uh, very high energies. Over four days, we, we could observe a constant flux. So it's a, uh, it's a component by itself. Yeah. So this suggests the migration of the gamma ray emission towards higher energies. And this goes in line with the increase of the maximum energies of the parent particles. Um, um, RS of Yuki detected and characterized over its peak emission by magic. And then um, outbursts uh, happen every 15 to 20 years. Previous outburst was in 2006, but there was no gamma ray satellite. There was no Fermi in the orbit. So I think the distance uh, is uh, under debate. And then I think uh, we are using uh, some value between two extremes. And then and the, the natural question is, why do we see gamma ray emission? And then um, um, gamma ray emission can rise from the photosphere thermal radiation upscattered to high energy range by relativistic electrons via inverse Compton scattering. Or alternatively, the ambient matter, NOVA ejected and the uh, um, red giant wind, can act as a target for hadronic interaction of protons or a brave style of radiation of electrons. Of course, the maximum energies of high energy particles will depend on the efficiency of the acceleration mechanism, duration of the NOVA, and the cooling energy losses. Uh, but uh, already now, it's clear that production of high energy photons via leptonic mechanism is more demanding, much more demanding, uh, because uh, acceleration uh, proton efficiency 
uh, is higher, they have less uh, lower losses. So I should mention that uh, we try to estimate the total contribution of NOAA, whatever they are happening, yeah. but uh, they will make just 0.2% uh, compared to that of supernova remnants. So they will not make a major contribution to cosmic rays. So in the end, I think uh, our studies, um, at the end of uh, our studies, we came to conclusion that uh, hadronic acceleration, proton acceleration mechanism is the preferred one because it is nicely fitting into the picture yeah, uh, of our measurements. I want to mention uh, two uh, very short, uh, on, on two slides, I want to mention something which we are uh, very excited to do. Uh, you may know intensity interferometry. This is two, uh, this is a different issue from uh, typical amplitude uh, interferometry. Intensity interferometry, I think, uh, was pioneered by uh, um, Hanbury Brown and Twist. I think already in 1956, they uh, measured the uh, diameter of Sirius with this technique. So we are trying to use to our telescopes for this uh, purpose, intensity interferometry, because we have large mirror, we have one nanosecond uh, response to optical photons. And then, um, in principle, if you make an estimate, just because of shorter wavelength or visible light compared to radio emission, I think we can um, achieve fantastic resolutions. And then I think uh, we, we are uh, uh, talking about um, angular resolution of a few tens of micro arc seconds. And then for a specific array, uh, from a dedicated array, one can reach one micro arc second or below angular resolution with intensity interferometry. If you compare this with the Event Horizon Telescope, who were publishing, uh, so to say, composite photons of black holes in two occasions, yeah, M M87 and then Galactic Center, their resolution were in the range of 50 micro arc seconds, but they were using Earth diameter. They cannot do it better on Earth. Um, as long as they don't, do not go to satellite mission. But in the moment when you change radio wavelength, you go to four orders of magnitude shorter wavelengths, optical wavelengths, you can do it much smaller array, much higher precision. So this is what we are doing. We have um, two telescopes, and then we are including now even the large size telescope. And then we are uh, trying to measure single photon correlation between two telescopes with nanosecond precision. We installed um, special filters in front of a uh, few channels. And uh, just to give you a glimpse, this is the magic camera, imaging camera of Magic 1 telescope, Magic 2 telescope. Yeah, They consist of 1,000 uh, photomultiplier channels. And then we have a pop-up target, automatically pop-up target in front of them uh, to measure mirror reflectivity, star reflections. And there you can see two filters on each of the telescopes, and we put them into coincidence, one nanosecond coincidence, and uh, this is how we do, we do intensity interferometry. Uh, we do also some other trick. Um, um, our high-tech telescopes, uh, hence from the beginning, are designed uh, with a so-called active mirror control, where every single mirror is sitting on st uh, stepping motors, and we can, we can adjust them uh, however we like. What do we do? We, we select groups of mirrors on one reflector. For example, these four or so eight mirrors and uh, these other eight mirrors, and we focus them to specific PMT channels by using active mirror control. Yeah. In this way, we are imitating as if we are having uh, small telescopes. So, um, and then we are scanning distance range uh, within the diameter of the telescope. So we are very optimistic about this measurement. I think the um, first publication is already out and we have a big queue of other publications. And this is my sli last slide. I think uh, we are expanding uh, telescopes in uh, La Palma in the Northern uh, CTA array. Um, I think uh, first the uh, large size telescope is operating, three or more are built, and then nine middle-sized 12 meter diameter telescopes are coming to join the family of the magic telescopes. Yeah, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Is there any question? Uh, question you have from here to the computer. Uh,
no questions. Then please uh, help me have a look at it. There's one question. Um, can you see me now? Yes, uh, nice to have you. Uh, this experience. Uh, is there any news about the detection by uh, magic of several years ago uh, confirmation uh, in Sigma 6 1? This is one, and then uh, it uh, had the uh, reported the detection of the environment from Sigma 6 1 confirmed. Uh, Felix, I apologize. Uh, acoustics is bad. Maybe someone with a microphone can tell me again the, the question. I, it's about detection of something, but I could not understand what I mean. Yes, the question is uh, about Signal 61. Is ah, Signal 61, Signal 61. No, no, I think the Signal 61, you know, I think uh, there was a sporadic one time sporadic emission and then um, this was uh, we classified it in the paper i think we cited uh, 3.1 sigma significance it, it's classified as a hint of the signal so i think uh, we observed it um, several times again and again but never happened again so um, in the end i think uh, we are not sure was it a genuine signal or not probably was but uh, with uh, on the level of three sigma significance, it's difficult to make uh, any firm statement. Yeah. And about the Koch uh, reported uh, emission in the shock uh, region where the jet impact uh, uh, the gas in the, in the environment. Do you mean SS433 or you mean the same? Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's for the three. Is it something about this type of sources? Yeah, you know, you you know, it's it's a very very interesting question what you are asking. And then I think um, it needs, uh, um, I think, detailed professional discussion. I will mention something. Uh, um, it will sound like an explanation, but uh, I. Uh, Offer at our next meeting, I will I will give you a deeper explanation. But uh, let me let me call it like this: uh, these type of detectors, like Hawk and Lasso, uh, they do not have moving parts. And they measure particles, and they are wide-angle uh, detectors. They measure, let's say, a couple of steradian yeah, every every given moment of time. So they, uh, for them, extended sources is. Um, um, uh, one of the priorities, and then if the source has an extension of five degrees, then it's not a um, problem for a hawk like detector. These Ercherenko telescopes, they boast very high angular resolution. They boast an angular resolution of 0 0.05 degrees to 0 0.1 degree, which is three to six times better compared to hawk or compared to lasso. So, and uh, I think we are having a uh, real uh, problems to measure the same sources uh, what Hawk and Lasso are measuring uh, just because uh, they, they are um, sometimes their sources are larger than the size of our imaging cameras or are comparable to our size of our imaging camera and in such cases the main problem that immediately arises what is your background you need to find, to know your background you need to measure your momentary background. Imagine, for example, this uh, Keminga, uh, let's say, um, uh, source, not the pulsar, I mean the, the source by itself, which has a large extension of, uh, let's say, five degrees, eight degrees, uh, depending uh, which instrument measured it, yeah? Um, source size is uh, larger than the size of the field of view. I think the situation may become better with the CTA telescopes because CTA telescopes are going to have a 10 degree uh, field of view. And then I think uh, we will be back into the game, I think. I, this does not mean that we cannot measure. We are, uh, we are measuring, and I think there are some results, but there are uh, signal to noise ratio differences between two types of instruments. These wide angle instruments are more appropriate for uh, large size sources. Okay, thank, thank you, Razmi. Yes. Thank yes. you very much. Yeah,
So now we we stop. Um, so we we'll close the connection for a moment up with you. Uh, I mean, you can uh, stop the sharing when you like. Okay. Yes. Thank yes. you very much. Ravi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Coffee break now. Uh, yes, maybe maybe twenty minutes. Yes, thank you very much for playing. Um, А это другой микрофон. Вы повесили вот этот микрофон? Нет, нет. Можно сейчас? Дело в том, что здесь идет один из пяти идет в зал, а второй идет на YouTube. Вот это вот что-то. Можно сразу
So welcome um, to the after coffee session. Oh, yeah. Yes. You have your, your microphone. Oh, yeah. Okay. We start with the session now. I urge you to take your seats. And then the uh, first speaker after coffee will be Vladimir Pipuno, who will speak about extreme universe through the eyes of master robots. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation for the local and not local for the opinion and direct for the invitation to this very important coordinated conference because uh, I am as the one of the maybe last postgraduated students of Zimbabwe, maybe some or two, two people like me, I don't remember because Zimbabwe is a very big man. You have every, everywhere in Moscow for the Okay, uh, I would like to uh, show you several hundred slides. No, this is my co-author, uh, usually from different observatory, that is for internet. And the uh, plan of the, my talk is the first introduction, what is this? Term in extreme universe. Uh, structure it jet explained it uh, the extreme the last paper in the about the October last year unusual GRB. All people, maybe not all, but almost all. Oh, and uh, several results which we knew result which we received after after last. Uh, in Roma, in Roma in 1989, eh? no, 29, before COVID, before, okay. one year before. And uh, I, I, I stress it on the uh, three new results, the orphan flyer discovery, interesting, and the uh, new optical observation, evidence of high energy neutrino from Blazars. And uh, several words about the, this current moment. You know that several weeks ago, uh, turn on LIGO gravitational instruments. And uh, every night, every minute, master telescope try to find new objects. OK. Uh, extreme universe. Uh, in 1916, uh, Einstein, in Einstein paper, paper about the gravitational wave uh, created by a binary system, he introduced the natural luminosity. Natural luminosity is a typically uh, depend on the fundamental constant, C is five power divided gravitational constant, and that is a 3.6 about 10 to 59 F per second. I'm sorry, F per second in Russian, but the same that in English the same. Okay, uh, very interesting, the same value appear in quantum mechanics, gravity. You see, uh, uh, for me this wo was new in 1992, I uh, discussed this in the Volcano workshop and after that on General Assembly IAU, IAU Kyoto. And uh, for me, very, I, I was very wonderful that the, if you take the Planckian energy, energy divided to the Planckian time, we, we receive natural luminosity, not qu quantum, uh, no, not constant Planck. Planck constant not included. This means that independently of the uh, future theory, 
uh, last theory is that the maximal energy in our universe. Of course, there's not physical universal value because it's not uh, Lorentz invariant because it depends on the moving uh, luminosity. But our universe expanded and macroscopic object that is the maximal luminosity for a microscopic object. So if you take the maximal energy mc squared divided to the uh, minimal energy at the uh, gravitational Schwarzschild radius divided to the speed of light, you receive the same. That is mean the all process which included uh, have the this uh, most powerful object in the universe. So I can show the real uh, five uh, real five dimension of our universe, astrophysical dimension, on the uh, horizon. I'm sorry. Oh, on the hora ho horizon axis, you can find. I'm sorry. Uh, you can find the type of object different. This time, typical uh, living time, this Hubble time, that is a galaxy like to our galaxy, that is Q uh, quasars and maybe uh, B. Lacerti, but not all included. This supernova and the, ah, yes, yes, this be Lacerti uh, flyers very high, uh, 10 to this 48 isotropical, isotropical luminosity. But if you return one second to the previous picture, you see the characteristic living time of this process, this neutron neutron stars produce a gravitational wave, gamma ray burst, and kilonova. This very interesting mixing, mixing, merging, produces uh, the, really an electromagnetic, uh, the same, uh, maybe the same events. Black hole, black hole, not interesting from, from optical. But I, I believe that the one, one very, uh, uh, very, how to say, very, not very usual uh, collision maybe inside the star and you receive, but we must, give, we must, I think 1%, no, no, 0.1% such, this may be a next uh, observation I'll show. That is uh, universe, but that, I'm sorry, but uh, characteristic time of this process of this process, neutron, neutron stars, is uh, several seconds. And you know another process I not included, this is the collapse of the nuclear or massive star formation black hole. Several seconds, if this nucleus is very, have very fast rotation, as the Vesnavata Kogan show a lot of years ago, maybe 50, shown that the rotational process is very important Rotational is very important during the collapse. Uh, not only he, but he here. <laughs> One of the first for, for supernova. Okay, but we don't see in 20th century never this object. People stay here and, and say me, oh, gamma ray bars, but gamma ray bars, not very uh, powerful object in 20th century. 90% astrophysicists believe this is a very near object in corona of galaxies, in, in the, uh, very close to the uh, sun and so, 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 a different model. But only at the end of the 20th century, we understand that luminosity of the uh, gamma ray bars is, is really big. Is, that is really extremely. So why, why we did not see in 20th century this process? You see here this explanation. In 19th century, people uh, use it, at first time, use it the uh, obscura camera. And I show you one image of the, the, the Paris. Paris. Paris is the, is the capital of the world. In this time, a lot of people around, a lot of uh, moving people 
by, by food, by uh, horse, but never people. Like to the anti-utopia of the Hollywood, you see never people around. That is a bigger. Only one people included, you see, <laughs> but he not moving. He stay about several minutes, maybe. That is exposition about one minute, several minutes, maybe. So the same course for the uh, our universe, uh, the answer, the our optical uh, instrument have the very long time of exposition and uh, preparing the new no computer for reduction and so so. But that is a really extreme uh, universe. You see, and so I, I would like to that is a. Uh, long uh, gamma ray bars, that is uh, short gamma ray bars, that is a gravitational wave bars, for example, to the hole maybe. And uh, that is a uh, soft gamma repeaters, uh, fast radio bars, and so, so. But this, you see, that is a, how many meter telescope you need to see this object from the edge of the universe. You see, if our galaxy, you, you need the, uh, for the spectrum more than 10, 20 meter telescope for, to see, to investigate that galaxy. Uh, quasar maybe slightly less, but, but you see, this object we discover on the next, uh, on the edge of the universe, Hubble distance. So, uh, but the question, what is the uh, cross-section of this reaction, or this, this reaction, this, uh, the, that is a three reaction, what is the uh, cross-section of this reaction in the universe? In 1992, with my friend Victor Kornilov, unfortunately he died last year, after long, uh, very problem, very long. And uh, we propose the scenario machine, the uh, artificial relativistic binary system, artificial. And we, uh, Kip Thorn very often come to Moscow, and one time he knows about scenario machine and asked me, uh, ask uh, how much neutron stars uh, we can see for first LIGO interferometer. And uh, we, uh, you see this 20 year prog pro process very, very complicated, but we very quickly receive um, that as uh, some people, uh, which around to this car. And uh, we, the, uh, you see here, very interesting, the, this question, this uh, rate of neutral, neutral star cross section, not change it during the 10 years our calculation, and best calculation was my postgraduate students, uh, Evge, uh, <laughs> Ivan Panchenko and Sergei Nazin, and uh, he calculated three events per year in, inside the 50, 50 megaparsecs. Three years per year. Okay, we will see. Uh, that is a gravitational wave sky, 1995 paper from scenario mission. Okay, so we are thinking in 2002 how we can observe it, this process really. That is first uh, Russian robotic telescope, this Russian village, uh, 22 years ago. Never CCD in Russia, one CCD in our institute, very small. But we need not small because Keta has a big error box. But uh, some very rich men uh, present us one CCD. And uh, uh, this uh, first people around the first robotic tower telescope. And, but after six years, six, uh, seven years, we receive money from the university for the first real new telescope. That is he is like to the binocle, binocle, oh, maybe yes. And uh, this is a color and polarization telescope. That is some uh, some uh, image. You see, but this fully robotic telescope. He 
uh, he autonomically work without any people. If the weather is good, half year, nobody around, nobody around, telescope, this real robot. Really, uh, uh, now uh, we have not very wide field uh, robot, another robot at all in the world. You see, okay. And uh, now master net, master net, have the nine telescope. No, really we uh, observe on eight system. You see uh, the South America, South Africa, Russia, four telescope almost that is sponsored by Moscow State University, uh, Canarian Island and Mexico, I, I show after that. So you see this the Caucasus, Africa, so to this identical telescope. This is the principal master system. That is identical, very wide field telescope. And uh, very quickly, uh, uh, seven years ago, we come to the first place on the observation, prompt observation of gamma ray burst. That is most bright, our, our detection of the optical detection of the uh, GRB. In, uh, no, you see here 6 and 0, 6, so, 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 so. And you see here this video, because we have very quick, very wide picture, but very, very bright, eight magnitudes. Eight magnitudes. And, uh, but second, I uh, started three last paper about the most important. We have about 700 telegram per year and 10, pa 10 paper per year, including five paper per year in Q1 uh, journal. You see, that is a way uh, recently, uh, one year ago, maybe not half years ago, people uh, detected from the old telescope, but first, uh, first uh, alerts give the Fermi, Fermi lab, but all telescope uh, uh, integral, integral, I don't know, but conus wind, uh, Fermi, uh, Swift, and so, so, so. You see here our image, but in this case, we have no very early image because the uh, several problem with our system. For example, after the discovery of Illinois, we do not receive any amount from the, for, for our project. So, but in any case, we uh, take very important image. I, I show you here. You see, uh, that, is a, uh, that is a bright, this bright object after four hours for, from the trigger. The, Sometimes was 20 years, uh, during the last 20 years, we see such maybe one per 10 days. Here, you see this, this star. Yes, and this paper in GTN, no, maybe not in this technical, but our telegram uh, unusually in first, uh, usually we first, firstly the, the SWIFT, but in this case, SWIFT give first telegram, but people not understand what we shall, what they to do, and this telegram don't come to this. Uh, this may be 100 telegrams on this. On this, uh, if you come to GCN, you find a lot of, I only three first telegram, very important. Okay, and uh, you see the differences, what people see, that is a typical gamma ray bars characteristic. That is a, this October unusual. You see, no duration, maybe not three times, not very interesting. M maybe yes, maybe no. Okay, isotropic luminosity, yes, 10, 10 uh, order more than most, most biggest, uh, most, uh, most powerful gamma ray bars. I'm sorry. And the median. The distance is very interesting. It's very small, 20 times smaller than the mean distance to gamma ray bars, long gamma ray bars. This long gamma ray bars, of course. Okay, and uh, this uh, I would like to show you uh, where is the, uh, ah, this one, but uh, this may be, ah, yeah, yes, this most powerful 
you see, 5, 0, 0, 5, 0.05 earth per centimeter quadratic. This means to the, you can, you can take by hand this, you see, it's fantastic. Or, or, or you know, spheric like to uh, football, football uh, ball <laughs> is uh, jump it and No, 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 no. That's unfortunately. No, 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 no. That is a, uh, we maybe first not, but not yearly. Our telescope, if you're interested, our telescope on the far east of Russia, Blagovesensk, uh, pointing on this, pointing on this uh, GRB after the several dozen seconds but not pointing to uh, mistake to the direction because uh, before two months we uh, our gps on this gps system died on this telescope and we uh, but the uh, first telescope which we pointed it was uh, uh, this is the first optical maybe image in the south africa only uh, in the last, another telescope, we have no, we have not the weather. Okay, but sixteen tele, sixteen magnitude, this uh, unusual optical magnitude. Okay, you see, uh, that diagram show you uh, the properties of this uh, GRB with respect to the uh, community of GRB. You see the most uh, most small distance and most powerful uh, between between most uh, nearest and uh, between uh, most powerful. This means the probability of one per thousand year. One per thousand year. We are very happy to see it, but we are not naively people, and we we understand that that not probability is not uh, correct. You see that is a different afterglow, X-ray afterglow, and you see the most powerful difference have no uh, jet break. You see, as is a picture from this paper. Uh, all one, two, three most powerful GRB, and uh, less powerful, you see some jet break during first 10 hours, maybe. Okay, the people propose it in our paper that structure is very complicated, really. Uh, you see here the diagram with the different, uh, the jet structure, structure the jet, where uh, the biggest cone, that is the cone uh, of, mamma mia. Why, why? Why Helen <laughs> give me five minutes? No, this uh, Remo asked me. I explained him. Ten minutes, Remo. No, <laughs> Before all people very democratic and liberal. Okay, no, no problem. What problem? For uh, for probability to detection depend on this maximal angle. You can take maximal angle, but if you take maximal angle, you have uh, you slightly smaller, uh, smaller uh, luminosity. But if this jet is a constant diagram, have very, very, very um, slow, slow changing diagram, you receive more needed energy in this case. On, you see that as a case in the big diagram but slow, but uh, homogeneous uh, jets. You see this uh, big, very energy, but if, uh, if they introduce the, the different, you see here, that is a gamma ray, 
the sprung gamma ray, this one mass near V, and so, 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 and I have five minutes, mamma mia. Okay, and uh, result, result is a change. The, uh, the structure of jet can be uh, explained the sm relativity small energy, about eight to the 10, 52, and big, big uh, theta, uh, big uh, angle, solid angle of the jet, and uh, we can decrease it, uh, probab uh, increase the probability 16 times. So one per several tens years. We observe it 50 years, and we see this no problem, one of them. But really, master, uh, between gamma ray bars, master come to the survey, this, and uh, during the survey, he discovered a lot of image, and uh, now we discovered 10 different type of the astrophysical object, including kilonova, uh, gamma ray bars, supernova, anti-transient, where we discover the most longest binary system in the, in the history, 60 years, 69 years binary system, anti-transient, disappear. The, the stars, 10 magnitude stars disappear from the sky. Very, but, but this, not Corona Borealis type, if you remember what is this Corona Borealis type, because, uh, because of course, in the, in the couloir, couloir, the question after. <laughs> okay. That is our transient. Now we discovered more than 3,000 uh, discovered, but now I show only one view, only one. Uh, five comets you see here, and so I tell you to stop because computer is dying. And you see, all sky, because we have souls and not in telescopy, all sky occupied. Imperialistical. Okay, a uh, very interesting uh, event was detected by Tsviki. This, oh, mama mia. Uh, that uh, telescope ZTF, uh, Tsviki project, discovered the 4th May of uh, last uh, two, two years ago. And uh, very interesting that we found same transient, but robot found. We not come to the, uh, to the, how to say, every day to the, every minutes to the database. We need the uh, help for this. Three house before, master, uh, received uh, the, the image of this very interesting source. You see uh, uh, that is ZTF, and you see here the, oi, mamma mia. You see red point, that the master point, three hours before discovery of ZTF. I remember ZTF project, 80 million dollars. Master, two million dollars. <laughs> but have the very clever soft, never. This clever have the ZTF, but we have the uh, driving of the telescope. No people come to the telescope half year. And no new program people put to the telescope. This very interesting system. So, uh, but that is some reclama. You see here. So you see very smooth curve. This type curve formated at the forward shock of the gamma ray burst. In forward shock, the optical emission from the back uh, inverse uh, uh, shock is very, very variable. So we proposed uh, people this idea that is a different gamma ray bursts with very smooth like a curve. By the way, this, da, never, never gamma ray bursts uh, detected before. That is the most, that is the most cheap discovery of the gamma ray bursts. <laughs> but we, uh, you see, uh, that is a, uh, about 10, half of the master discovered uh, gamma ray bursts, smooth, very smooth like curve. Uh, in this coordinate, this universal 
uh, you have the universal law of this. So, a gamma ray counterpart search. No, no counterpart. We, uh, people from Konus Wind, uh, Dimas Winken, uh, especially investigated this and say no gamma ray birth, any, any spacecraft. And uh, the problem with uh, why, uh, what we see, uh, we, pro we uh, tested several models, and after that, uh, we, uh, we found the very small uh, gamma factor. Usually, gamma factor for DRB jet about more than 100, maybe 500, and some more than more. But in this case, we have 10, 21 in different models. What does it mean? This means uh, that there may be uh, so-called not, not natural, not natural GRB, and the uh, result. The result we found, the, uh, and we, uh, uh, we found the time, real time of the, this process beginning. And after that, uh, uh, we proposed that the first orphan optical uh, bars, which uh, observed on the growing state on the growing and, and slow down. That another, we, uh, last year, one year ago, we discovered, uh, we found a new station at the Mexico. And uh, last, only last, I would like to show you the neutrino follow-up observation by master. And you see the most interesting, this publicated, uh, but uh, you see 22 September. 22 September is the birthday of the, my brother. A 70 August 7, you know what? My <laughs> birthday. Okay, in 22, so we, we write five papers during this time and never to see in our database, no time. After two years, after conference, American Scientific Foundation give a conference on this the ice cube salute. We found in our database very interesting event. I would like to show this telescope. And uh, you see here, uh, uh, where is my photography? Nieto, nieto. Ah, yeah, yeah. So, very interesting, this blazar Blazar is the TX, uh, -pa 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 we very well know Blazar. Uh, we, we pointed, we pointed after one minute, maybe 60 seconds to this, and found this Blazar uh, two times more uh, depressing, because decreasing. After two hours, he come back to the previous magnitude. We see this most short correlation between quasar events and uh, neutrino events, during the neutrino events, several hours, not more. And so you see we have the explanation. I have no time for theory, but this nobody says this, no, this wrong. Uh, this is our explanation because proton in one theory, one point, the proton must be uh, produced optical emission of blazar. Nobody knows exactly what produces optical electron pair or, or, or uh, protons. Okay. Ah, that is unpublished result which we sent to Nature recently. I cannot, I have no I have no rule to show you. Maybe I don't know show you. you have, I have time. <laughs> yes, you see, another, another neutrino was detected uh, in December 8, 2021. The first, first event when the four neutrino telescope publishing detection neutrino during the several hours. 
Хуно. But what, what happened to his blazer? You see. That is an optical cover of this blazer. Uh, that is a dais, you see. And uh, that is a four, four detection neutrino, four neutrino detection on different, different uh, telescopic. No common people. But, of course, when the four uh, neutrino detection detected, uh, the first detection is real. The second, more or less, found it in the database. <laughs> the third, I don't know. People not publish it. If, if, I, if my mistake, you can, you, you can correct me, but I, I did not see any paper on this Blazar. The, Okay, 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 okay. Uh, so I, uh, that is a sign diagram which uh, shows uh, this. You see this. Um, you, okay, yeah, I came not to find. And uh, about several words about the new 04, uh, 04 uh, people. Every day, one margin detected. Mama mia. What to do with optical? Our telescopes. I never took on to the database because a lot of uh, 1,000 square degrees average because work on LIGO. Now the only LIGO. Maybe in September, uh, uh, I don't know very small sensitivity. But maybe. No, but successful this project. Okay, that is the first. Uh, in first, I would like to show that is very important because it's in Dovich seminar. People do not see more. You see, that is a uh, translation of conference of discovery gravitational wave on the old Moscow seminar uh, following Zeldovich. And uh, that the, I, I say to every people that. Mm, such pic picture, for 40 years ago, such picture you can find on every Zeldovich seminar. People stay here, you see. Every seminar people have a lot of, a lot of you. Now, for the, <laughs> of course, so people, so many people not come to the every seminar, but for example, last my talk, uh, 600 we translated by, by internet. After COVID, people do not come to institute at all. So, okay. Master is a win this session. I keep turn camera and the drawing on my desk. Please, discovery optical counterpart of gravitational wave. One year before Nobel Prize. And uh, uh, we discovered uh, six telescopes in world independently uh, uh, take image before publication. Before publication. No, I don't know. There are five American and one Russian Argentinian. That's all. You can see. Fantastic. 100, 100 uh, stars on the image. This, this soft now exists only two places, Moscow University and Caltech. Never, no in China, no in Europe. People, come here to master. Uh, da, uh, what's interesting, the, uh, I show you, the, uh, remember you, these people, young people, 30 years ago, predicted three per year. But LIGO works one divided three years. Only one divided three years, a discovery one. You see, and place is more good. That is the probability where you can like. So I am stopping. I am stopping. I am sorry. Overview. Not so long as first. It's very no. nice. Very <laughs> easy. Not short. Sure I am sorry. Yeah. So, we, we need.
may have time for one question for Vladimir. This was very nice, Vladimir. Thanks. Thank you very much for this interesting uh, presentation. I would like to comment about this blazer that you showed about neutrino. Neutrino. Neutrino, yes, the one of the big guys, the US 755. Yes, very, very strange. Yes, uh, actually, we have a paper on this source, and we were the first one with Paolo Giomi, Paolo Padovani, and others to point out after us. There were many collaborations reporting that. Actually, this is a very interesting source because it was very uh, quiet in all the bands, suddenly just after this neutrino observation, it went crazy flaring in gamma ray, x-rays, opticals, in all the bands. So in Aragaz? <laughs> hopefully not in Aragaz, we don't, but in all the Fermi bands, in etc. Yeah, it yeah, was I really see. very flaring, and actually we have a some sort of theory how this happens, but this is one of the most interesting sources. This is why we call it new ma the new major neutrino source, because besides, besides this Texas O5 source. Thank you very much for your comments. So very nice. Uh, um, I'm afraid we have to move on and uh, I will have to stop here the discussion. Thank you very much, Vladimir, again. Possible, possible. And um, I'd like to call Massimiliano. My slide should be on the info. Okay, good. Is the poor people, can you help me? Opa, Massimiliano Lincetto is our next speaker who will speak about neutrino astronomy, ice cube results, and the future of multi messenger searching. Okay, does this work?
Oh, okay, yeah, I think that's going to work as long as I can. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, thank you for inviting me and my collaboration to uh, this conference. I'm going to talk about, sorry, let me keep track of the time. Um, I'm going to talk about the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory, uh, the recent results, and the perspective for the future. Uh, so let's get me started of how do we make, or actually how you know, astrophysical neutrinos are made. Uh, astrophysical neutrinos are made in uh, uh, cosmic accelerators where we usually have two types of interactions. We briefly mentioned it uh, in relation to the Texas laser in the previous presentation. So you have here uh, two ways in which you can produce astrophysical neutrinos. Uh, one is between uh, in proton-proton uh, 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 or hadronuclear interactions uh, that result in uh, intermediate uh, hadronic mass that in turn yields uh, uh, neutral and charged pions, uh, or a similar process but where uh, protons target a uh, photon field that result in resonant production uh, of um, primarily delta particles that in turn in their decay produce uh, pions. And uh, these pions, uh, uh, charged pions, decay to muons, electrons and neutrinos. In turn, muons will also decay to give neutrinos. And natural pions uh, uh, decay uh, to uh, gamma rays. Uh, so what happens to this messenger where, when they uh, leave the source and start their travel to the Earth is that, uh, uh, okay, we know cosmic rays are deflected, deflected by magnetic fields. Uh, high energy gamma rays tend to be absorbed in uh, uh, dense environments and also uh, the highest energy they scatter on the, uh, on the background light. And, uh, but neutrinos travel undeflected uh, uh, to the Earth where we can detect them with our detectors. Another interesting thing to note is that gamma rays can also originate in processes which are not hadronic uh, like uh, synchrotrons at Compton. Uh, uh, so neutrinos are really the, probably the only unequivocal signature we have of hadronic acceleration from a, a source, and they point back to their source. Uh, and this is also to give an idea that how the universe uh, at the uh, largest distances, uh, at the highest energies, uh, tend to became, become opaque to uh, electromagnetic messengers. And so there is an entire region that we can actually explore uh, because we have uh, uh, neutrino detectors uh, that we call neutrino telescopes because we want to use these, uh, these detectors to see what happens uh, uh, in the source, in the sources. Uh, how do you detect astrophysical neutrinos? Uh, uh, it's quite a challenging task. Uh, so you're looking at very high energies, so you have some advantage from the cross-section, uh, but the flux is very small. And also, the event signatures at this energy tend to be large. So if you want to characterize your event, you need a pretty much uh, big detector. And by big, I mean like kilometer cube scale. And to realize a, such a detector, uh, the only viable way is to take uh, a large reservoir of a natural medium, such as uh, uh, Antarctic ice or uh, water, and instrument it with uh, a number of photomultipliers. In the case of ice cube, we have uh, more than 5,000 photomultipliers instrumenting a kilometer cube of Antarctic ice. Uh, then you need an entire infrastructure to relay the data to the surface. And in the case of ice cube, we are at the South Pole, so we also need some infrastructure to relay this data to the Northern Hemisphere, uh, where we can actually uh, analyze them in our uh, data center. Uh, Neutrino astronomy is kind of a slow progress. Uh, we can see how it has developed, uh, uh, for Antarctica at least, uh, in the course of almost three decades. Uh, so from the first uh, uh, idea uh, from, uh, uh, for a neutrino telescope, it took like uh, uh, more than 10 years to reach the first prototype, Amanda, that was able to uh, detect uh, for the first time atmospheric neutrinos with such a detector. Um, and uh, uh, took 10 more, 10 more years to develop AMANDA uh, into what today is uh, um, IceCube. 
uh, IceCube was able to characterize a flux of astrophysical neutrinos, was able to identify the first sources of these neutrinos, uh, and in most, more recent years was able to produce more interesting results uh, in terms of uh, not only transient sources but also steady sources and also identify neutrinos from the clash of resonance. Uh, so how do high energy neutrinos look like in IceCube? We have uh, fundamentally three event signatures. Uh, the one which is more, more interesting for astronomy are Trex. Trex comes from uh, um, muon neutrinos or antineutrinos uh, and allows to provide, uh, to be reconstructed with uh, relatively, for neutrinos, a relatively good uh, resolution, at least, well, let's say on 0 0.5 degrees, which I know is bad for most of astronomy, but this is what the neutrino telescopes can do nowadays. Uh, and this is the channel that we'll, you will use to search for point sources. Uh, so the, track, the position, the direction resolution is pretty good. The energy resolution is pretty bad. Uh, but we have another channel, which is cascades. Cascades are a channel sensitive to all flavor of neutrinos. And these have a much worse um, directional reconstruction, meaning you can know you have like 20 to 30 degrees in uncertainty from the, from the directional cascade, but you have very good energy resolution. And one may argue, okay, maybe since the, re the resolution is bad, you, do, you don't look for point sources, but you may find uh, extended sources. So I'm not ready to talk about that. Some results are still not published, but stay tuned in the upcoming months to know more about it. And finally, you may have a double bank signature from uh, uh, tau neutrinos. Uh, in case, the, if the tau neutrino is sufficiently energetic, then the tau travels from the interaction vertex to its decay vertex, and you may be able to isolate the uh, two signatures in the detector. Uh, coming to the astrophysical diffuse flux, uh, uh, ice cube stands, the measurement of ice cube stands here. So you can see here the measurement of the astrophysical flux framed uh, between the uh, high energy gamma rays and ultra high energy cosmic rays. Um, the way ice cube measured the flux, I, so I told you we have different channels. So you can actually perform this measurement either by looking at tracks only or by looking at uh, uh, cascades. And these are kind of uh, different event selections. Uh, so on one hand, you're sensitive to different flavors. On the other hand, you may have different hidden biases in your selection. So it's hard to say if you measure different spectra with different channels, are, are you really measuring a single thing or there are multiple components that you are resolving. So we are getting there. So to unfolding this uh, puzzle, uh, but from what we have now, it's very hard to say uh, where do we stand. Uh, but what we know is that the energy density of uh, high energy neutrinos is comparable to the one of the uh, high energy gamma rays and ultra high energy cosmic rays. Uh, we can also notice that uh, the intensity, if these sources were to, the neutrino sources were to emit consistently in gamma rays, they will overshoot the limit from, uh, uh, from the Fermi uh, telescope. And that kind of points to the fact that maybe, uh, I mean, it can be expected that important fraction of the neutrino flux is made by sources which are not bright in gamma rays, which is also quite interesting in terms of looking uh, at possible source candidates. Uh, now, uh, so how do we find the astrophysical neutrinos in the background? Because I briefly mentioned before, uh, actually, I forgot to mention that uh, cosmic rays produce air shower, and you get a lot of atmospheric neutrinos in air shower. Actually, most of the signal that IceCube sees comes from uh, atmospheric backgrounds. And to give you an idea, uh, this is how, in galactic coordinates, uh, the signals from IceCube over one year look like. So you have more or less 140,000 uh, uh, neutrinos per year, or neutrino candidates per year, and on top of that, you know you may expect around 200 cosmic neutrinos. So don't let you, uh, don't be misled by this phrase you may see here, this is not the galactic plane, but this is an effect of the ice cube selection uh, that is dependent on declination. So if you project it in galactic coordinates, you may see some effect in declination. But this is not, this doesn't show a signal from the galactic plane. Uh, 
This is actually a pretty, um, if you plot it in declination, you see that the background is pretty much uniform. Uh, and uh, uh, so you want to find uh, a signal on top of this. Uh, how do we do it? We have two different uh, uh, ways. One is try to find uh, spatial clusters, uh, spatial clustering of neutrinos on top of this background, and the other is finding spatial and temporal coincidence with astrophysical messengers. And the second way is actually the approach that uh, brought us the first source, because IceCube has a so-called uh, real-time program in place that uh, uh, is structured in uh, uh, different uh, uh, activities. So one activity is trying to find uh, event clusters in, uh, in time and space and provide uh, alerts to the community so they can follow up and uh, um, do follow-up observation and hopefully find counterparts of uh, ice cube neutrinos. Uh, and we also do this for single events. If you have a single event at high energy, depending on the declination, then you can associate the probability of these events of being astrophysical. And so you may decide, you want, I want the community to know and to follow up on this event. And this is what IceCube releases as uh, AstroTrack alerts. So you have tracks with, uh, they are qualified as bronze or gold alerts, and those are followed up, uh, are published to be followed up by other observatories. But in, what you can do in real time is also the reverse, so you have external triggers, and you can look in the direction signaled by these triggers to do a counterpart search inside IceCube, and with that you can set uh, upper limit. Most of the time you don't find anything, so you can set upper limit for uh, the neutrino emissions for a given uh, uh, candidate sources. <coughs> it was the, exactly the real-time program of IceCube that allowed to identify the first transient source, uh, the famous uh, uh, Texas Blazer, uh, in which uh, uh, 290 TV neutrino, so a public alert from IceCube, was associated by uh, a flaring blazer detected, uh, uh, a blazer in a um, uh, flaring state detected by uh, Fermi in 2017. Uh, this yielded uh, one of the most expensive uh, multi messenger campaign to date. Uh, also, we have, uh, uh, we, you've seen before, uh, the activity of MASTER, and we also have had uh, uh, very high energy gamma rays detected by magic. Uh, so this is a pretty, uh, there is still, I mean, you can calculate the significance of this uh, coincidence, uh, which is, should be around three sigma. Uh, so definitely this is an interesting uh, uh, neutrino source. Um, so one may, may, may look in the ice cube data and try to find other neutrinos from this source. So if we go back in time, we do like what we call a, a flare search. You search for either a time integrated uh, emission from the same source or a time uh, clustered emission from the same source. And the time clustered emission from the same source was found in 2015 in the archival data of neutrinos coming from the direction of this blazer. Uh, however, uh, there is no significant gamma ray activity in coincidence with this neutrino flare that brings us to a tentative conclusion that we shouldn't always expect a neutrino correlated to gamma rays, but is also kind of a puzzle because uh, if this correlation is not constant, what are the conditions that allow neutrinos, neutrinos and gamma rays to come out simultaneously, and what are the conditions that uh, make them uh, in anti-coincidence if we want to see it that way. Uh, I should also mention that uh, uh, this is a pretty high energy neutrino uh, for, uh, for ice cube, uh, while this kind of flare usually is found in lower energy neutrinos. So it also be different uh, production processes uh, at play. Uh, another argument that was made is that if you look at the time profile, uh, the neutrino is not exactly coincident with, uh, um, with the peaking gamma rays. And one may expect that the density required to produce neutrinos will obscure the gamma ray emission. So this is kind of the favorable interpretation for this kind of uh, correlation between neutrinos and gamma rays. Uh, the one may ask if blazers, uh, or more in general, AGN, can produce neutrinos as a population. And IceCube has tried to answer this question with a series of different analyses, uh, what we call stacking analysis, in which we take a catalog of sources and we look for a signal on, uh, from that catalog. 
So there are several, um, several analyses that target the Blazor specifically. This one with the one SLA catalog from Fermi. There were also before the uh, FHL catalog from Fermi. Uh, so, but the Blazor contribution to the neutrino flux, so no access was found as from Blazor as a population. And most of the constraints go from one to maximum 10% contribution of the diffuse flux. If we go more in general to the population of AGN, there was this search from a very large catalog of AGN that found a 2.6 sigma significance for a neutrino axis. So if you take this as face value as a signal, uh, this will mean that the AGNs could contribute from 27 to 100% of the diffuse astrophysical flux. But if this is not a signal, then uh, uh, this constraint is not very strong. We cannot limit too much the emission of uh, AGNs right now. And this brings me to the first study sources discovered by IceCube. This was uh, the result of a much improved uh, point source uh, uh, analysis in IceCube uh, that allowed to perform a uniform uh, data analysis spanning nine years of data restricted to the northern hemisphere where we have more control of the detector background because here it's purely atmospheric neutrinos that we can simulate well and we cannot say the same for atmospheric muons uh, that come from the opposite hemisphere. Uh, and so this allowed to uh, do a scan of the northern sky with improved calibration and reconstruction methods and finally identifying in NGC 1068 which is a nearby active galaxy the first steady neutrino source with a 4.2 sigma evidence of uh, uh, steady emission. Um, and uh, what, I mean, the, the great breakthrough of this analysis is that we can really say that IceCube is a neutrino telescope because uh, with significant improvements in the understanding of the detector point spread function, we can exactly uh, match simulation and data for a point source at this position and with a given spectral index. So that means that uh, uh, the distribution of the events as a function of the distance from the source uh, is very much uh, what we expect from simulation. And these allow you to uh, significantly improve the sensitivity of your analysis because then you can give each neutrino the exact weight that it has uh, in relation to your source. Um, so how the uh, emission from the 1068 uh, should be interpreted, um, the, I should mention that the diffuse flux of ice cube I showed before, I didn't mention the uh, spectral index measure for, the, for that flux is around 2.3, uh, while the spectral index fitted from this source is uh, minus 3.2. Uh, that means uh, first that uh, uh, Cypher galaxies like NGC 1068 cannot be the major, uh, the contributing uh, one of the major sources of the diffuse flux because they wouldn't match the shape we observe. Um, but uh, uh, the other thing is that uh, to interpret how NGC 1068 emits neutrinos, and right now the most favorite scenario is that where you have neutrino emission from uh, acceleration in the magnetized corona of the GN. But NGC 1068 is also a starburst, gal starburst galaxies, galaxy. And, uh, but however, uh, the starburst uh, contribution to the neutrino emission is very much subdominant uh, compared to the AGN corona. So if you take a multi-messenger uh, picture of it, uh, you can uh, uh, identify electromagnetic emission from the starburst activity in the radio and in the gamma rays, and the AGN corona emitting in X-rays and uh, uh, neutrinos. So definitely, this is uh, a landmark in neutrino astronomy, uh, although it doesn't allow, you, uh, allow us, so importantly, to explain the majority of the neutrino flux. So we have two candidate sources, but none of those source classes can uh, resolve the origin of the neutrino flux. Coming to uh, some more recent uh, data published by IceCube, uh, I uh, explained before we have uh, um, neutrino alerts and we built a catalog of uh, neutrino alerts. So these are individual neutrinos with moderate to high probability of being astrophysical on an individual basis. And uh, uh, we published this in IceCat1, the first alert catalog uh, uh, for alert tracks. Um, 
So this also goes uh, back in time before the ice cube neutrino program was introduced. Thank you. Um, and so it, it, it equals to repeating what we do now in real time over the whole history of ice cube. Uh, and, and you have uh, uh, several hundred neutrino alerts that you can use to uh, do counterpart searches. And these are also provided with the individual neutrino localization maps that give you more or less the, um, uh, the likelihood, the landscape of the ice cube reconstruction around the neutrino direction. And so you can also derive 50% uh, uh, or 90% localization contours. We also published this in this uh, infrastructure, the Harvard Dataverse, from which you can download the data because this is indeed an open data release of IceCube. Uh, one may ask, where, where can we say where do these alerts come from? Uh, as part of the release, we did also uh, correlation searches with, most, with several catalogs, uh, Fermi catalogs, uh, Hawk, uh, Tevcat, uh, and Bat catalogs, plus uh, additional follow-up searches on dedicated publications uh, um, on uh, uh, the Fermi for Luck Dear 2, and AGN from the Radio Fundamental Catalog, and we find no correl significant correlation. Another thing we do is that we follow up individually each alert in the archival, uh, in the IceCube data, and we try to see if there are more neutrinos correlated to each one of the alerts. And most of the time, we don't find neutrinos, and on average, we can say, okay, if, since we don't find neutrinos in coincidence uh, with, uh, um, with our high energy neutrino alerts, that means that uh, uh, there must be many and faint sources from which we see like upward fluctuations in the signal. And by doing this analysis, you can establish limits on the density of sources and, uh, and their luminosity uh, from the fact indeed that you don't find additional neutrinos on average from the individual astrophysical neutrinos detected by ice cube. Are there more candidate sources uh, uh, possibly? So we mentioned uh, uh, AGNs and blazars. We had some uh, uh, indication for tidal disruption events. Uh, we also had uh, a, st a stacking search for uh, supernovae, uh, from supernovae and this uh, search on the neutrinos from supernovae didn't find uh, significant excess, so we could only constrain uh, the flux to a fraction of the uh, diffuse flux of ice cube. Uh, one more recent activity was the limits on neutrino emission from GRB 221009. Uh, you will uh, learn everything about this GRB in this conference. Uh, I will also, I just want to point out how IceCube is able to follow up this, any kind of event, over eight order magnitudes in energy in neutrinos, and uh, a very fast, with a very fast combinational analysis, IceCube was able to establish limits uh, on the emission from uh, uh, these GRBs from the um, few GeV to the PeV scale. And to conclude, uh, we have uh, what is the, the current uh, activities in multi messenger and the future perspectives. Uh, we are currently following up, following up each individual uh, uh, alert from uh, the uh, 04 gravitational wave rounds, and you can find regular updates on the GCN about this. Uh, we, I hope that future facilities allow, will allow us to have a larger sample of candidate counterparts so we can do more correlation searches and find ultimately where are these hidden neutrino sources. So I'm thinking the Rubin Observatory or the Ultrasat experiment, they may uh, open up a new window on the transient universe that we can use. And also I expect that we can combine with uh, the other neutrino telescopes to do these cross-telescope multiplet searches. So to find uh, um, cross-telescope combinations uh, that can point into uh, onto interesting directions for follow-up searches. And if you wait enough time, Highscale will, will have an upgrade uh, combining optical and radio sensors that will provide a five times improvement on the point source sensitivity with expected construction in 2026. So if we don't find anything in the transient up to there, we may expect to see something more with the improved detectors. So as a summary, Highscale has discovered and characterized the astrophysical diffuse flux of neutrinos and now is hunting for its sources we have two candidate sources, very interesting, especially the nearby, the recent result from NGC 1068, but still they cannot explain the majority of the neutrino flux. 
but IceCube has confirmed it as a, a formidable, formidable player in the multi Macedonian community. And we hope that future observational facilities and uh, improvement to IceCube will be able to resolve the mystery of what is the origin of the diffuse flux. So, thank you. Thank you very much. This is impressive, especially the ability <coughs> of isolating these signals and correcting for the huge uh, background. It's uh, amazing. Uh, Sri. Uh, in the case of the NGC uh, 1068, which is a constant source, uh, what is the luminosity that you infer? Uh, I don't have this number. Uh, Isn't as it the first number that one should know? I know how many neutrinos. <laughs> so we have more or less uh, uh, 85 neutrinos uh, fitted from this source uh, uh, on, the, on many years. But I think you can, you should see it here. And yeah, uh, it, this is the, the measured flux from IceCube, and you can read it from uh, the paper. It's nice. From, yeah. Okay, well, thanks for this nice presentation. I have a very Short comments. First one is about the Texas source that you say the link between gamma rays and the Nipsinos. You are right. We were expecting to see this link between gamma rays and Nipsinos, but after the Texas and other blasters, we understood that from theoretical point of view, so if you assume that everything is hadronic, you would require a huge amount of energy to explain this thing. So now the working theory is that we have the lepto hadronic contribution. So the protons are scaled with X rays, and still that these X rays are more uh, sensitive to predict the Nipsino event. And the second comment is about the supernova Rengan. Actually, it's, uh, I mean, you said that you didn't find anything. I think it's quite uh, predictable that you will not see anything because uh, from the supernova remnants, you expect Nipsinos from the proton-proton interaction, right? Mm -hmm. So you know the flux of their flux of the gamma rays, you easily can scale the flux of the neutrinos. I remember when I was doing this exercise, even if you wait 10, 20 years, you will not see any single event unless you have some really okay. strong supernova that has not been observed. Yeah, before. this is, uh, is not specifically supernova remnants. So what this analysis was looking into was the first uh, choke jet scenario, so 1BC supernovae. And also, also yes, the um, longer time scale emission like interacting supernovae and 2P supernovae. I would say the scenario for 2N is similar to the supernova remnant, but it's like in a very early phase. And in principle, you have higher energies and uh, higher fluxes. But it's true that uh, it's a bit optimistic to think that we can see those. Um, yeah, so. Thank you. Uh, two quick questions, if possible. One is, uh, imagine that uh, all the neutrinos and gamma rays in the Fermi range come from the same source. Then, not to get to, uh, uh, not to get to some discrepancy between the two results. Uh, what ratio between the gamma rays and the neutrinos should be? Okay. Uh, Suppose all the sources are the same. Yeah, this is also a number I, I don't have in uh, in my mind. I mean, you you could definitely calculate that. The fact is that. You, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think you can extrapolate it from, uh, yeah, from here. Uh, but yeah, this is also a number I don't have uh, off the top of my head. But we can, we can do it later. Uh, and, and the same question, actually, uh, about the, the greatest gamma ray burst. Um, you have uh, the upper limit for the neutrinos. If you translate it in into the terms of uh, the neutrino luminosity divided by the observed gamma ray luminosity, what should it be? Smaller than? Okay, but then the question is how you define what should be, because you will need to you have. You have upper limit and uh, you know the yeah, but, luminosity. Okay, but still you, you will need to have a model to connect the neutrinos to. No, you don't need the model. Uh, to compare the numbers, you don't need the numbers. Ah, okay, no, no, that, that you, can, you can do. Yeah, <laughs> this is this is my question. If you have in mind, no, no, not, I don't have this one. More questions for Massimiliano. If there are no more questions, we thank uh, Massimiliano again. <laughs> and, uh,
uh, we move to the last speaker of this session, Jean Aris uh, Vicky Bayer, who will speak uh, about neutrino telescope, the Baikal uh, the GBD no, neutrino telescope, status and nearest future. Можно посетить, как хотите. Поставьте да. посетил, да. Да, да. Good day, everyone. And first of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizer that invited us to present our results from the Baikal GVD experiment. And I will start with this. Uh, uh, the neutrino spectra at the uh, wide range of the energies and the And the neutrino telescopes exploit this energy range from the, oh, sorry, from the about 100 TV up to the 100 PV. And in this range, you see that there are two sources. First one is background from atmospheric neutrinos, background for the, our search, and the another the sources is the sources of astrophysical origin. It's Agent and other objects, and very uh, uh, natural um, threshold, energy threshold is about 100 TV, and uh, above this uh, uh, energy threshold, we have practically in the, uh, free from background uh, uh, signal search. So, uh, all, uh, most of the astrophysical uh, uh, searches are based on this. Higher on this threshold. Shown here is the map of the neutrino telescope's activity. And here, the first neutrino telescope of kilometer scale is Ice Cube, which is operated more than one decade. And uh, now, also, the neutrino telescope on Lake Baikal is now about. Uh, uh, half of kilometer scale volume, uh, effective volume. And uh, the, uh, in the Mediterranean Sea, there is a Camp Serenet, the telescope under construction now. It consists of two arrays, one small orca in the France, near the Toulon, and the higher <coughs> for, the high, uh, for the astrophysical uh, such as the ARCA instrument. It is under construction near the Catania Sicilia in Italy. And also, there are some activity on the Canada. This is a P1 array. It's a project is on the prototyping stage. Now, the main goal of the uh, uh, searching by the neutrino astronomy are the search for the uh, possible neutrino sources. And this source is divided to the galactic and extragalactic ones. Galactic, for galactic sources, the convenient, conventional uh, sources are supernova remnants, pulsar wind, 
like a closer binaries and so on. But up to now, no, the local sources have been observed by IQ. I see that present for us the main information. And, uh, but uh, there was, I would like to, uh, to show you a result of analysis made recently by Kovalev and uh, uh, Osses. And uh, they analyzed the public uh, ice cube um, tracks with energy higher than 200 TV. It's about 70 events. And they find that there are some hint of the existence of uh, galactic uh, sources. They analyze the uh, uh, distribution of median of late, uh, absolute latitude of this sample and find that the expected uh, for the random distribution is about 35-36 degree and experiment gives the 21 degree and it corresponds to the p-value of 4 to 10 to minus 5. It uh, corresponds to the fourth sigma and the number of uh, fraction of the uh, galactic events is about 30% comparing to the old example. But the uh, ice cube analysis gives the about 10% for the, for the galactic sources. Now, for the extragalactic neutrino sources, as uh, the Messelian uh, told in his um, report, there are now uh, uh, obtained two, 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 two sources. One of them is NGC 1068. It, uh, from this source was detected about 79 events with uh, the steep spectrum index 3.2 and significance is about 4.2 sigma. And another source is the uh, uh, famous Texas 0506. Uh, one event was detected with energy about 300 TV by ice cube. And uh, this is the gamma ray source with the uh, flaring source. So uh, adding the result of analysis of archive, archive data for the two, uh, 2015, where about uh, uh, 13 events were detected. It gives a um, uh, significance of about four sigma for this source. So as a result, now we have two extragalactic sources and no detected uh, galactic sources in, in data. Now another approach for search for the astrophysical uh, neutrinos is search for the diffuse astrophysical flux. And the first result was uh, 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 presented by Ice Cube in 2013, and uh, they detect uh, with this significance of three sigma the diffuse astrophysical flux. And uh, Ice Cube used uh, several uh, 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 different analyses, and they may be divided into two types. One uh, analysis, uh, one approach is a search for the contained events inside the detector with the vapor at the border of the detector. And in this case, the effective volume is about 0.5, not cubic kilometer. And another approach is the search for the through going events, uh, <coughs> the muon neut neutrinos, and, and in both cases, the diffuse flux was uh, observed. And shown here is the, uh, the, the observed flux may be fitted by the power law spectrum. And shown here is the spectral index and normalization factor of these distributions. And uh, at the left part by blue is the result of the uh, uh, track analysis. And the, uh, uh, this orange curves is the results and starts from the cascade analysis. And so by within the uncertainties of the measurements, all the results are consistent. This is the situation as before 
the way of the discharge is analysis that came to game. <laughs> now about our experiment. Baikal GVD is located on Lake Baikal, is the south part of the lake. Here is the coordinates. It's a detector located and the only four kilometers away from the shore at a depth about 1.3 kilometers. The flat, the, the depth is very flat because it's formed by sediment during million years. And absorption length of the, the, of the water is about 22 meters, scattering very low, 60, 80 uh, uh, scattering length, and very, very moderate optical background at about 15, 40 kilohertz on our photomultiplier. And uh, the right picture, there is a sonar picture of the one of the configurations of the detector, so we are really reduced and you may see it by the <laughs> by the sonar pictures. Now, detector configuration to 2023. Now, the detector consists of from the clusters of optical models. Each such cluster is independent neutrino, small neutrino telescope connected to show by its open uh, own uh, electro-optical cable and uh, different clusters are sort of synchronized in time by time synchronization system. Now we have uh, 12 clusters uh, deployed uh, at this time and with uh, additional uh, experimental, experimental strings. And the deployment schedule is shown here in this table. We start in 2016 with first cluster and then during three years we uh, deployed one cluster and starting from 2019, we, uh, we deployed two clusters to during the season in the winter. And uh, now in 2023, we have deployed 12 clusters and with 3,000, about 500 optical models. And uh, Main key element of the detector is the optical model which comprises the, uh, the 10 inch photomultiplier with high quantum efficiency. Also, optical model comprises the uh, uh, calibration leads, leads and the accelerometer and compass for the uh, uh, for the measuring the position of the optical mod models. And the optical models are uh, uh, formed the strings. Each string comprises 36 optical models at a, with a step of 50 meters by the vertical. And all optical models are uh, oriented downward. The uh, strings also for time calibration, uh, we have uh, the several uh, lead beacons on, on different clusters. And for the uh, check the uh, synchronization of the cluster, we use the uh, laser laser sources. And uh, uh, also we have the acoustic um, uh, positioning system, which allows us to uh, to measure the position of the optical mo model with less than 20 centimeters accuracy. Which uh, now. Here shown is the scheme of the one cluster. One cluster consists of eight strings, one central and seven outer strings. The diameter of cluster is about 120 meters. The active length of strings is about half kilometer, 525 meters. And each cluster uh, is um, uh, connected to show by the uh, electro-optical cable. Now data coming on, from under the water are accumulated in the Baikal Shore Center. Here the mm, data are, uh, 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 are coming through the fast reconstruction and alert production. And then the data are transmitted to the Moscow Dinner in Dubna and uh, the delay of the 
traffic is about one minute from the shore to the to the dinner. Now, what type of events we are uh, uh, detecting? We have two types of events: muons, which produced by uh, muon neutrinos, the the tracks of uh, emitting the chain of light, and we have the cascade events. It's produced by all types of neutrinos, but and uh, through the neutral current interaction, and uh, also by the charge current interaction of electrons and tau neutrinos. So uh, the most part of the uh, coming neutrinos are maybe uh, detected by cascade mode. Now muon track reconstruction. We have uh, two types of uh, events. One type is events uh, detected in the one cluster, and another type in detected in multi cluster. And uh, uh, precision of uh, uh, angular, re uh, angular re resolution of track depends on the track length in the detector. So it's necessary for the accuracy lower than one degree, it's necessary the length about three. Uh, 300 meters. And uh, for the multi-cluster events, the accuracy is uh, uh, lower than one, uh, one degree. And it's important because the atmospheric, uh, the astrophysical neutrinos by the track, uh, track mode, they are, uh, have the energy of higher than 100 keV. And uh, due to the absorption in the Earth, we observe this event mainly near the horizon. So for the near horizon direction, the uh, um, uh, angular resolution is about uh, half, half a degree for the multi-cluster reconstruction. Uh, <coughs> we, have, we start to, to get the data from the beginning of the, uh, of the deployment of the detector from the, from the first cluster and so on. So the first result was come from the uh, single cluster reconstructions. And we check, the, first of all, the, uh, uh, um, our calibration process, atmospheric neutrinos. And uh, shown here is the result, some results of our results. We expect the, about 33 0.6 events from atmospheric neutrinos that observes 44 events. So it was a very nice <coughs> result, show the uh, sensitivity and of the detector. Now, such um, analysis was in, improved, and the sensitivity is uh, increased by a factor of two. And uh, first, uh, our neutrino with energy about Muon uh, neutrino with energy about 100 keV, which is shown here. The event was detected with energy 103 keV, with the uh, zenith angle of 153, and number of hits of, uh, of hit uh, optical model is 30, it's very high. And uh, the accuracy for such events of uh, direction reconstruction is about all. 40, 45 degree, and signalness. Signalness is the number of astrophysical neutrinos expected astrophysical neutrinos to the total number of background of atmospheric neutrinos is higher than 0.88. It's very nice uh, candidate for the astrophysical neutrinos. As shown here is the how looks the multi-cluster events. It's down going event from the muon bundle and so com coming through the three, uh, three clusters. And the one of the first uh, uh, neutrinos in multi-cluster measuring are shown here. It's a neutrino and the dots are the optical models selected for the muon reconstruction. And at the right is the all optical models uh, 
she's more of the background event. So it's not so large energy, but less than one TV atmospheric neutrino event. So work in this analysis in progress. Now I will uh, uh, tell about the cascade analysis. Cascade analysis is shown here is the effective area for seven parser configuration. Neutrino effective area is close to the effective area of the ice cube for such analysis. And at the right is the expected number of cascade events per year. And the red is the acceptation from the benchmark uh, uh, ice cube flux as shown here. And the green is the background from the atmospheric neutrinos. And you see for the energies higher than about 50 uh, TV, uh, the, the expected flux, atmospheric flux is higher than the background. So this is the reason for the, for the analysis of stage four astrophysical neutrinos. Now, so I, uh, Present the, uh, present the results of the search by cascade mode. The confirmation of diffuse neutrino flux observed by ice cube is the first goal for the upcoming Baikal and country neutrino telescope. So uh, I show you the results uh, obtained by the data from selected in 2018-2021 by the uh, Baikal DVD. These two approaches, first approach analyze the high energy cascades from all sky. And we expect 7.4 events from atmospheric neons, 0.4 events from atmospheric neutrinos, and 5.8 events from Baikal best fit uh, astrophysical flux. I tell you about later. And we found 16 events. So we have some excess here. At the right is showing the energy distribution such events. The, the, the ground events from atmospheric neutrinos, atmospheric neons, and the uh, best fit flux. And uh, at the lower part is shown the uh, distribution of Zenith angle of detected events. And uh, the uh, 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 observed excess have the p value of 0 0.26. Percent, which corresponds to the significance of 2.26 sigma. It's not so high. But in this uh, sample, we select the one uh, event with one cascade with one TV energy. It's the the p value is that this background is about 0.54 uh, percent or significance 2.78 and this significance is close to the significance of the first uh, famous event of ice cube Ernie and uh, I don't forgot the another one which was presented by ice cube and uh, another search was performed for the upward going events with uh, energy higher than 15 TV and uh, uh, zenith cosine less than minus 0.25. We expect 0.5 events from atmospheric neons, 2.7 events from atmospheric neutrinos, and 6.3 events from Baikal best fit. And we select 11 events. And distribution, energy distribution of background events and the best fit events and total events is shown by histograms as crosses are the data. And uh, at the low uh, uh, graph, it's uh, shown the um, uh, Zenith angle distribution. So for these events, we have uh, the significance higher than three sigma. So with uh, this result, we confirm the, uh, the level of three sigma, the result of uh, ice cube for uh, astrophysical observation, or astrophysical uh, diffuse flux observation. Now shown here the results of fitting of our data. We will fit it with the same uh, uh, power, law, uh, <coughs> uh, power, power law spectrum. And our 
na parameters of spectral is the in spectral index 2.958 and the normalization. So it's shown here by the red and also shown the results of the ice cube and Antares. And within the uncertainties, the all the results are consistent with each other. And this plot, the sky map of the, our events, which uh, shown here events coming from the upper uh, and the lower uh, uh, hemisphere. And what is the interesting here, there is, first of all, the one upcoming event with 224 TV, and another 91 TV, and one triplet, in which we have near the uh, uh, galactic plane. And uh, the most uh, energetic event, coming up, up upcoming events, have the very high signalness, it's 97 percent practically. So, and what is interesting here, it's shown the, this event and the 50 percent and 90 percent uncertainty curves. And in the 90 percent curve uh, area, there is a uh, at, uh, Texas 05 of 6, which was detected as the, uh, as this, uh, as the source by the ice cube. The probability that we have, uh, that there is a background to it is 0 0.74. It's not so small, but nevertheless, it's interesting to look how uh, these events uh, correspond to the event of ice, uh, detected events from ice cube. And in this plot, the dots are the, uh, um, the gamma ray activity uh, detected by uh, Fermilat. The red is the distribution of light curve of the radio emission. And uh, uh, the, uh, the blue uh, lines is the our DVD event, ice cube event, and the small energy ice cube event. And what is the, uh, the there is no the, uh, gamma ray activity at the moment of the, our event, but for the radio uh, curves, the ice cube and our events are uh, located at the beginning of the um, uh, radio flame. So maybe it's some hint that the uh, 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 this event was uh, uh, producing the same process. Another event, upcoming event, is event of about 90 TV. The signal is of 93%. And what's interesting with this event, shown here is the 50% error of uh, event reconstruction, and there exists the uh, radio blazer, G0301, it's here, and uh, the Rattan 600 uh, measures the light curve of this, uh, uh, this blazer, and uh, our events uh, coincide with the uh, rise of the uh, radioactivity of this blazer. It's uh, confirm the uh, uh, expectation from the uh, uh, suggestion that the promising neutrino sources may be the radio loud buzzer, which uh, was presented by Clarin and Court authors. And now uh, <coughs> I will tell a few words about the triplet of events. It's uh, three events are intersect with the, uh, the error uh, curves, and they are located near the galactic plane. And this is a very interesting uh, object because uh, area on the uh, sky, uh, here exists the uh, ice cube hotspot, which was uh, presented in this analysis. And there is the uh, uh, so famous uh, gamma ray sources as LSI 61 and the swift 
uh, <coughs> swift uh, uh, X-ray uh, pulsar. So mm -hmm. the probability that we uh, that the, for existence uh, background uh, for existence of such uh, three events is uh, about uh, at the significance two point. 26, as I remember, so it's not so five, but uh, nevertheless, it's a very interesting uh, region for the detection, for, uh, for the investigation. Now, a few words about our nearest plant. Here shown is the configuration of the 2023. We plan uh, to, uh, to deploy the detector of one cubic kilometer to in the 2027-2023. Eight, and uh, then <coughs> we plan to introduce the additional uh, strings between the clusters. This allows to increase the sensitivity of the detector for about 50% for cascade. Then we plan to introduce the optical technologies for data transmission um, uh, on the strings, and we start to. Um, to design the project of next gener generation detector of about 10 kilometer here. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. This was very interesting, very nice. So since we are a little bit late, I'll take one question for Zanaris. Questions? Uh, you didn't mention the GRV, 22, 10, 09? Not. We, have, we haven't uh, any, uh, any, uh, any events which are associated with this uh, GRV. So, and uh, as I know, no uh, neutron telescopes uh, are yet. Okay, yet. okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. That, that will be, of course, it's so close, it will be a breakthrough. But no, nobody has reported, but yeah, it could be. Okay, if there are no more questions, thanks. Uh, thank, thank you, you Janais. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> and we reconvene at three. At three, mm -hmm. yeah. Так. И вот этот. Yeah. <laughs> 
Ты какой покол ищете? Я могу так тихо зайти. 2200. Можно вам стоп? Не, давайте Давайте обе. У нас с Адиасом была проблемка. Давайте я еще обе возьму сейчас. Сегодня по второй части, да, скажем? После Ja, ich habe die Tür.
Can you show me the pre presentation? Where is the presentation? <laughs> the most thing is there is a little No, there is not some. It's a PowerPoint. Is there? Where should it be? Is it quite, quite? No, I know. I, I know what you mean by minimize. Yes. Okay. It's not going anywhere. Okay. I, I bring the last slide. Oh, I see. Okay.
Mediterráneo y África. We are sorry for the technical. Uh, yeah, so, sorry for this. Uh, okay, let's start our afternoon session. Working. We have five talks. Not this will work. Yeah, this uh, three will be offline, then break, then two of them will be online. The first speaker is. Changing the okay. scheduler, website, okay. and the paper. Okay. Paolo yep. and The talk will be about 25 years of GRB supernova and overview. Please Thank you. you. have 30 minutes. Yeah, I will probably not take that. Thank you very much. Sorry for bearing with a 25 year delay and a 25 year old computer. Uh, I trust people can hear me. So this was probably meant to be yesterday, and it's, it's just a general overview of where we stand uh, on the topic of long gamma ray bursts and the supernovae that go with it. And the talk is going to be more on the supernovae than the GRBs, because I'm not a high energy uh, astrophysicist. So just to remind people, the uh, discovery of GRB supernovae goes back to the beginning of connecting X-rays and gamma rays uh, with the same instrumentation, so you can locate a region of the sky quite uh, promptly after detecting a gamma ray burst. And it became immediately clear that uh, in the case of a nearby GRB, which is reminiscent very much of the case of the killer nova, because it was a really nearby event that has not repeated, and I hope this is not a, you know, an example for what will happen in the future, but you know, if I was to put money on it, I would say it is. Uh, this very nearby GRB, came from a region where a sort of spiral galaxy is, and there was a lot of light on that spiral galaxy, which turned out to be a supernova. So what is interesting about this particular supernova, and actually all the other ones that we've been able to see in association with long gamma ray bursts, is this unusual sort of pointer should work. Yeah, sort of spectral shape, which was at the time, unlike the classical supernova types, which had been formed in the 70s and 80s, dividing hydrogen rich, hydrogen poor, and then the successive degrees of stripping of stellar envelopes um, without hydrogen, without helium, and going to one Bs and one Cs. So these spectra are very typical of, sorry, gamma ray birth supernovae, and it's so tiny, I can't even move my fingers on it. And the presence of these broad lines, we know now they are broad lines. We knew from 98, from understanding these, these spectra. They represent material ejected at high velocities. Now, we don't mean relativistic. We mean velocities of 10 to 20% of the speed of light, which have sufficient optical depth in optical transitions that absorption lines blend and form these large drops. So the reason these spectra are different from those of classical supernovae is primarily the breadth of these lines. And it's something that repeats the second reasonably nearby gamma ray burst came as, maybe as much as five years later, and the noisy data one could get there kind of repeats that. And it's been the story ever since. So just to show what we could do with these broad lines, very, very naively, you look at spectra of type 1c supernovae, so the massive star collapse without hydrogen and without a helium shell, so showing mostly lines of metals from carbon and oxygen up to iron. So things that were made inside the star as it was evolving 
towards collapse, they are narrower in the more regular events, and you can distinguish the various ion lines and the, the oxygen, the calcium, and so on. But they start blending, and this number N here is something we use to represent the number of features you see in a typical spectrum. And despite these differences, it doesn't mean that the uh, content of the material that is ejected, which is projected in front of us to cause these lines, is any different. The only thing that is different is how fast the material is moving. The faster it moves, the more you actually absorb towards the blue, as the material that is absorbing is moving in your direction, and you start blending these features, as you can probably trace here, if you just follow this vertically, they go to slum more higher velocities and they start blending as the velocity share of each line increases. So you absorb a, a larger number, a larger uh, range of velocity. So you go from a few features to fewer and fewer, and just about n equals three, you can represent here, you can see the iron lines, possibly the silicon line, and something here that will be the oxygen blended with the calcium. And that's about the smallest number of features you would observe. GRB supernovae are always in this group, right? So they are characterized by that kind, of, that kind of velocity. A typical number to keep in mind is when you blend these two lines, the oxygen and the calcium, the speed of the material that is absorbing in the calcium line must be 10% of the speed of light to connect to that line there, right? So if people call these broad lines, and, and it's very generic. I don't particularly like it. I'd like to be a bit more specific. Um, if you want to understand what causes this, it's the amount of material that causes uh, optical depth. And that depends entirely on the, sorry, on the uh, slope of the density in the outer layers, right? So uh, it's uh, how much mass there is at high velocity. What have I done now? Uh, it's too small, for God's sake, for dwarfs, you see. So right, again, to show the difference between the classical spectrum of 1Bs and 1Cs, shown there, and the broad line thing. So if you don't have that kind of, uh, of a depth, you may not understand what you're looking at, OK? So between the 1Bs and the 1Cs, we like to, to think of things as, you know, do we see helium? Do we not see helium? So there are helium lines in the 1Bs. You don't see them in the 1Cs, or they're very weak. And then here we go to the width of the absorption lines. If we go on to light curves, are there any differences in the luminosity of these events? Now, luminosity here is a function of the amount of radioactivity that is produced in the explosion. So how much nickel 66 is synthesized and ejected. A lot of nickel 66 would, 56 would be made, but it doesn't become part of the ejector because it's captured in compact fragments, right? So it doesn't get out. That's why these things are not particularly luminous, but if you already make a comparison between the 1Bs and 2Bs, so the stars that explode with a helium shell on top and the 1Cs that are deprived of a helium shell, you see there is a slight trend to being somewhat more luminous. And then if you select the things with broad line, I said this is a very generic statement based on people's, you know, christening of their own supernovae. And because people want to be famous, everything they observe is broad line, so they would be very careful taking this uh, very, very literally, but uh, the red and the blue dots show somewhat of a difference where the red dots, the broad line supernovae, are somewhat more luminous on average than the classical, the typical type 1c supernovae, but again, no particular responsibility for the actual classification of the individual event in there. But there is a trend that once you remove material from the exploding star, the supernovae tend to be a little bit more luminous. The reason for this is not so clear. It may have to do with rotation, and rotation may have played a part in removing the outer layers as well. Um, and aside on observing the helium, helium lines are seen in things we call 1Bs, and they're not seen in the things we call 1Cs. There has been a debate. People say you don't see the helium because you don't excite it. You only to see the helium lines that we use to classify the supernovae as 1Bs. You need to excite these two S levels, which are like 22 electron volts from the ground state of helium, and they're both metal stable. So once you populate them either via recombination or via you know, transmission up and then decay in this way, they tend to accumulate electrons, right? So you then have to excite these electrons up there with, in this case, infrared, in those cases, optical radiation here. And then you see the lines that characterize 1B. 
Either one sees you do not see optical lines of helium, and they, this absence has you know, given rise to the speculation that helium may be there or may not be there, may not be excited. If you look into the infrared, you always get both lines in the 1B, the optical uh, and the infrared. Here, the two micron line from the singular system, the one micron line from the triplet system, and you don't see anything in the corresponding spectral region in the type of C supernova. So the suggestion is that the type of Cs really don't have helium in their uh, ejecta. And the type of Cs are always the ones that come in association with the gamma ray bursts. So we haven't seen a single one with uh, a type 1b associated with it or anything that has no helium. And some experiments to actually create spectra that show these lines indicate that you don't need a lot of helium on the surface of the explosion, of the exploding star, to create these lines that you would then see. So point 0.1 of a solar mass of helium already makes fairly strong neutron lines in the infrared. So the, strip, the stripping must have been quite complete. And now you can come up with scenarios how you strip a star of the helium layer, which is not obvious because the density contrast is not so much. The helium layer is very hard to get rid of. Um, less so for the hydrogen, of course. So there's, there's an evolutionary question here which suggests the role of binarity is important, but even that isn't obvious because removing the helium selectively is no easy thing, right? So in any case, the supernovae come with the GRBs are invariably type 1 Cs, which we believe have no helium, as well as, of course, no hydrogen. I did mention that it's creating broad lines. It's all in the outer layers. It's how much material moves at high velocity. And this is a little experiment to play with the density slopes of the outer layer, so material only at velocities of uh, 20,000, 30,000 and above. You just play with that little density slope and you create spectra that are progressively broader in absorption. Early on, right, this is about a week after explosion. But then if you wait long enough, when the spectrum is formed in this part of the density, this is density versus um, velocity, which is the same as radius in a supernova, right? Because velocity is constant with, uh, with time. There's no deceleration. If you wait long enough to about two weeks, then the spectrum is formed here, and there is basically no difference between any of these spectra, despite the significant difference in the outer layers, which causes differences here. So sometimes we may have missed the broad lines because spectra were not obtained early enough, just to give you, you know, a thought. Why are we doing this? Uh, the main motivation for looking at this is the fact that we get supernovae that are associated with gamma ray bursts. We understand that GRBs are very late spherical. We'd like to know if we see supernovae that come with GRBs that we haven't seen because they were not pointing to us, right? So what are the characteristics of these supernovae that must inevitably have happened unless you assume the GRBs are spherical? Other things you can see is okay, this blending of features I talked about before. You can also shift the amount of mass you have, create more mass, you bring more material to higher velocities, you shift spectra to higher velocities without changing their nature. Okay, you just have more mass, if you go to the slide before, you create more mass, you move all of this to higher velocities, you create spectra that look similar, but have a larger blue shift, like the spectra in blue here versus the one in, the one in red and the one in green. So that may be more mass with a similar density structure. Once you start playing with the density, slope of the outer layers, then you get situations like these when you blame the lines, as we have seen. And again, the GRB super, none of these here is a GRB supernova. Only this one here, the N equals three, three lines at the bottom of that plot is a gamma ray burst supernova. So they are an interesting subset, not one that is very common. Okay, normally, if we see a spectrum like that, there's always been a gamma ray burst. We don't see those without GRB. Luminosity-wise, we saw that 1Cs in general tend to be more luminous than the 1Bs. So we start deviating in amount of nickel 56 from the classical amount you get from core collapse supernovae. And uh, GRB supernovae get about as luminous as a type 1A. So they synthesize a significant amount of nickel 56, or there are several tenths of a solar mass. The red dots here are the original 98BW light curve. And the green light curves here are type 1As, right? While the classical core collapse 
is the 87A just for distinction, 0.07 solar mass. It's much, much faint. So production of nickel is another interesting result that you get. Now you put all that together and you end up with situations like these. You can measure the energy as a proxy. You can use the velocity of the ejector, the blue shift of the lines. And you've got the red symbols here, the gamma ray burst supernovae, at higher velocity at corresponding times than just about every other thing you've ever observed. And you keep filling these with new events, and they always fall sort of in that region of parameter space. Right? People very much like to use this approach to estimate masses and velocities. I would. If I took a show of hands as to how many people have tried to do this work at supernovae, getting masses and energies from the shape of a light curve, which represents the opacity in the material, and the velocity of the spectra, of the, of the lines in the spectra that give you a way to break the system and estimate the energy over the mass, I'd probably get quite a few people who have tried this. And sorry for you, but if you have tried this on hypernovae, on the GRB supernovae, you could just, you know, Go play golf because you'll be wasting your time because you can get a decent approach to the mass by the shape of the light curve, but you cannot really measure the energy because the velocity you, so you'd be getting would be way, way too small because they would not be the velocities of the highest velocity material, which is the material that carries the kinetic energy. So by just measuring a velocity, you're measuring the velocity where the mass is, not where the energy is, and E goes like mv squared, so uh, that's a bit of a You'll see many papers with claims of energies and masses of uh, supernovae based on this, and I'm afraid once you've got high energy, that system, that approach is just wrong because it makes too many simplifying assumptions. So don't, don't, <laughs> just say don't. Uh, if, on the other hand, you make the whole attempt at modeling the Likers and the spectra together, you end up with this interesting situation. The Likers gives you almost a degeneracy in masses if you can't break it, and that's the core of the net relation here, M and E are degenerates in light curve. You determine the opacity in uh, the mean opacity for the light curve. So a combination of different parameters gives you similar light curves, and you have to break that by looking at the spectroscopy and trying to get the line velocities and the energetics from that. Once you do that, you create spectra with different shapes, and if you try and match the best matching spectrum to the observations, you have a better shape, um, chance of guessing the right region of parameter space for your energy. And then that gives you, in turn, the mass, right? So the energies change much more rapidly than the mass changes. But once you find a decent match between, mass, mass, between the spectrum and the, and the observations, then both of those values can be approximated. And I have to note, these are all slightly symmetric estimates, because that's the nature of the game, I guess. You're not taking into account any historicity and of course, we can only see the supernovae from one side. So we see what we see. We don't know what the rest is doing, uh, namely how fast it's going, what the composition is. So these very large energies, which are very large for supernova energies, order of like 50 times the classical 1A or core collapse energy, which is 10 to the 51 Earth, also called 1 base, clearly. So these may be taken with a grain of salt. If you start looking at indications of where the material is distributed, you have to wait a bit longer when the material in the supernova becomes a bit thinner and you start achieving transparency. So you see through and you start having nebular line emission rather than absorption on top uh, of a dense um, ejector. So when you do, once you do that, and I have to say, this kind of study has only ever been possible for one event, the first one, because it was close enough. All the other ones have been too far. And our attempts to get this kind of spectroscopy have invariably failed. And they fail because the supernovae are too faint, even for a simple telescope. So this is a sample based on one. And it's been like this for 25 years. And I don't see it changing. We were waiting for another nearby thing, but it's kind of not coming. In any case, the point here is this. You've got emission lines of all the elements I mentioned before. The interesting ones are this, which is an iron line, and this one here, which is an oxygen. And uh, because this is a very old plot, I didn't even bother making different line shapes. But the narrow line here is the observed oxygen line. The broader line is the model that fits in cycle symmetry, that iron line there. So you base your model on the iron, you need a broad line. And that is broader than your oxygen line. 
So if you pause and think for a minute, and you think of your typical stellar structure where you burn to have your elements deep down, and then you explode the star with a shock wave that accelerates as it goes out, you wouldn't naturally expect lighter elements to move faster than heavier ones. Okay? You would have your inner layers shocked at lower velocity, the shock gains speed, it accelerates the outer layers, the oxygen is expected to move at, at least the same velocity as the iron or higher, what you get here is exactly the opposite. So unless you invent some mechanism to overturn the layering distribution in a star, it's much easier actually to say this was not a stately symmetric event. And we like to think about it in this kind of context, meaning the oxygen is on the side here. It was part of the original star. It didn't get as much kick from the explosion. The GMB sat in some direction. Material near it was A, more nuclear and processed, B, accelerated faster. We are picking up the GRB. We saw this event from kind of this direction, somewhere there. So we see fast iron lines because they are made in or near the funnel. While on the side, the oxygen is moving at a large angle with respect to our line of sight. We are looking from the top left. We don't pick up much velocity in the oxygen material. That's how we can explain this simple thing. We can even use it to make predictions in 2D of what these lines should look like. In a spherical symmetric regime, the oxygen line will be flat top because there will be no oxygen at low velocity. And then the low velocity will be occupied entirely by the iron. If you start looking at this asymmetric model at some angle from the GRB direction, you start narrowing down the oxygen line because you lose the velocity and you broaden out the, uh, the iron line. So you can reproduce what you observe. That can even lead you to making a prediction that there must be things with broad oxygen lines even looking like double peak profiles. If you pick the event, an aspherical event, on the equator rather than on the pole, let's call it pole. So we predicted the existence of lines looking like this in supernovae. They may come with our gamma ray bursts, and we did indeed find things like that. So these kind of supernovae are aspherical. They have things inside them, maybe jets, which may aid the explosion. They may not, the jets may not carry enough energy to actually explode stars. I think Sri has a lot to say about this sort of thing. But they do leave an imprint in the shape and distribution of material. So that kind of study can be done generically. We've done it on a large number of, of supernovae, confirming that the inside is very often not in spherical symmetry. And in the interest of time, I don't want to take you too much into it, but the idea here is what else can we do to understand how the spherical distribution of events works? Um, one of the nearest recent events is this one here. It's now several years old, but things have been slowed down by history of, of uh, you know, whatever. So these data here were picked up quite early. This supernova was observed from fairly early on. It's got very high velocities at peak. And we can interpret it as having similar ejected masses and kinetic energies as the initial you know, example of gamma reverse supernovae. The velocities are quite high and they drop steeply as a function of time, indicating a flat density gradient. And that's a set of synthetic spectra compared to the observations in these, uh, in these plots there. But the interesting thing here is that you see a fairly large ion abundance early on, which then drops as a function of time as you form the spectra deeper, even though you're sort of on axis now. And this is good because we have spectra from early on, which we didn't in the case of 90 ABW because we were not as good at, at reacting quickly. So we have to form spectra in a more nickel-rich region early on because the photosphere we see is closer to what I would call the jet area in the region near it, so it contains heavier material. As time goes on, the densities drop, the spectra form deeper down these planes like this, so you start including more of the oxygen region and the relative abundance of iron goes down. So paradoxically, there's more iron in the spectrum here, which is obtained at early times, than there is later on in a spectrum. Don't take these planes for, you know, they're not exactly the line forming region. They would have to be curved somewhat, but it's a simple approximation to it. The later spectrum will be more oxygen rich than the earlier ones, and that is exactly what we mean. And that's kind of a front view of the relative size of the different regions as time goes on. So early on, you're dominated by these inner regions. Later on, the size will be more important. You get more oxygen. 
So everything seems to be repeating all the, in, in a fairly predictable way. This is perhaps an example of one event that is a little bit less energetic than the others. So it's got a little bit less uh, energy by a factor of sum. These energies, are, as I said, need to be corrected for a sphericity, which is a game that we'll try and do very quickly. But by and large, the numbers are the same. We can put things on a plot like this of kinetic energy that we get from the modeling versus ejected mass or nickel-56 mass, which is the luminosity. And the gamma reverse supernovae sits at the more energetic, more massive end of what is intrinsically a very large, very wide, and very interesting distribution where the energy seems to go with the mass. It's not that the GLB supernovae just have a different mass. They are at the top of the distribution. And we should not think only of understanding why these things are very energetic. But our aim should be trying to understand why more massive stars produce more energy when they explode. People, of course, have tried to explode stars using the neutrino mechanism because it has a huge reservoir of energy and are now admitting that they cannot couple more than about 210 to the 51 ergs. So they can get to about here with neutrinos. Anything above that requires some other mechanism. And there is now you know, a flurry of mechanisms that people have proposed. Not all of them make sense. Some do, but even then coupling the available energy to the explosion is a challenge. And there is work going on, but as things get more complicated, things get, they also take longer to be executed. So there's, there's a distribution of properties, which is very interesting in how stars end their lives. Um, but again, if you want to go to the GB supernovae only, you end up in this regime where your remnant is almost certainly a black hole. So the collapse of mechanism needs to be invoked, almost certainly. But maybe we should not neglect the role of the proton neutron star, which is there for a short time and might carry some energy in the form of you know, magnetic fields or whatever. So people like the magnetar model. And the question is, how do you impart energy from a magnetar onto a stellar um, envelope and explode that with high energy? People like to do Likert with magnetar. This is not the same as, expl as exploding the star, because that would be injected much later. And so what is a driving force? What is, the, is giving energy to these, uh, to these events? Um, you can try and compare the energy of the GRBs and that of the supernovae. These isotropic energies of the GRBs are very large, but you know, they only mean how far the GRB is. Once you correct for redshift, the energy of the GRB goes down. And it does go down oops, sorry, good, to the point that you see that supernova energy is much larger than the GRB energy, first of all. So supernova energy doesn't change that much. It's of the order of 10 to the 51. But the... Uh, the energy of the gamma ray burst drops down to the level of roughly 10 to the 50. So the energy is in the supernova, not in the gamma ray burst. Okay? So you need something else to explode the supernovae. But the energy you get from supernovae is not very far for the maximum energy people think a magnetar can have, which is order of a couple of 10 to the 52 ergs. Uh, so that's an interesting suggestion, but how to couple those energies to the ejector of the supernova is a different story. So try and put it all together. You need massive stars. The large mass in the ejector suggests progenitors of the order of 35 to 50 solar masses, the arrangement sequence. So early O stars could do this. They have to be stripped somehow of the outer layers. Stellar winds probably don't make it. So binarity might be important. The final remnant is almost certainly a black hole, but the neutron star that is made in the process might play a role. If you're not massive enough, you don't make a GRB, you may make some sort of X-ray activity that, may, that has possibly been picked up a couple of times. Um, and you need to be free from the outer layers. If you have helium, and let's not even talk about hydrogen, any kind of jet signature would not penetrate out to the outer layers. Maybe we've seen a couple of times uh, something like this, but it's certainly not common, not easy to see. We would like to know what these things look like from the side, uh, but one question is what is driving the energy of these energetic events? Jets are there. Uh, do they drive, uh, are they singularly responsible for, for the energy or do we need something else which would inform of our, our magnetar right now or other ideas which may come up? And I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paolo, for this interesting talk about supernova and GRBs. Please, questions? 
Yeah, thank you for the talk. Uh, what kind of uh, any evidence of uh, atmospheric explosion do you may suggest? Uh, the evidence I gave these these two things: the late time yeah, lines not on or the line, but what, what, what something else. Um, we have no polarimetry because it's oh, yeah. too far. Exactly. Too far. Too far. Far. Too far. The only one that was nearby was before we had all the instruments we have now. Now we will be ready, but we need to find one that is close enough. It may come, but if you start thinking the 90 ABW, the close by event, was already significantly off axis. The GRB was very weak, and it fits perfectly a structured jet off by 15 to 20 degrees. And it's been one in 25 years. We may have to wait a long time. We would have the instruments now. Polarimetry, which is very difficult to interpret, would be a signature, but we have to wait for something that is nearby enough. That's probably what you were aiming at. Yeah? Two questions. Yeah. Uh, one is uh, maybe I'm getting something wrong. How do you get a magnetar from peaky solar masses per generator? I said people like to pull a magnetar there. I didn't say you get one that, you know, by. You know, there's a number of question marks. It's just like the neutrinos. The neutrinos carry the energy, so let's put them there and see if they do the job. Answer is, they don't couple well enough. Okay. Okay. The magma has the energy, let's assume it's in there. Okay. Um, if you go down to a black hole, you may go through a proton neutron star phase if the thing is spinning very rapidly, may have energy. This is all ideas. It's then the real question is, uh, if you have any idea, or, or you can imagine something, what happens to the mass loss rate in the last month of, of the lifetime? That's a very good question. And the answer to that is we have no idea. We see sometimes very large mass loss rates because we can pick up circumstellar medium not too far from the supernova. Okay? Is it steady state? Is it episodic? Is it a car style? Okay? To drive these things, however, you usually require large opacities and therefore hydrogen atmospheres. Once you get rid of those, you're in sort of wolf Fourier regime. A wolf Fourier star doesn't live long. It loses mass at a fairly high rate. You don't even know how you get to a wolf Fourier star, and you don't know if these are the direct progenitor of type 1Bs and 1C supernovae, because if you look at the composition of wolf Fourier star atmospheres, they always have hydrogen, other than the WOs, which are like 1% of all wolf Fourier stars. The number of these things of the one Cs is much bigger. So binary interaction is probably necessary. What does that do when it comes to removing mass? We really know very little. Pressure is very good. The answer is, honestly, we don't know. The last question. Yes, um, very nice talk and uh, very interesting. And uh, of course, uh, you just mentioned that in some cases, the supernova and the gamma ray burst is uh, so weak, the gamma ray burst, that is even lower than the energy. It always, of the always is once you correct. And for uh, I would like just to point out that we have been working on this direction. Yes. And uh, we, we know the, uh, that they are a GRB of very different energies, going from 10 to the 54 to 10 to the 52, 10 to the 51, 10 to the 49, 49 yeah. even. And, uh, and uh, we have prepared a model for that. But it's very interesting that the data that you are giving on the supernova fits quite well yeah. the result that we have obtained. Indeed. Namely, that there is a typical, no matter what the gamma ray burst is, there is a typical supernova coming out. And, uh, and, uh, and you give uh, quite uh, interesting result about, about the relation with nickel and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, again, what is very surprising is that the amount of nickel and so forth that we, f we observe in the remnant, not in the supernova. Yeah, in the remnant. In the remnant, in the, as after the supernova, uh, the, in the ashes, of the supernova and the thermonuclear ashes. That one is standard. But uh, we are very interested now in this house to a different problem. What is really the energy of the supernova which create this 
process it's very exciting we we will show maybe we have a paper ready but maybe we will show something tomorrow thank you for a beautiful thank presentation you. thank you let's thank the speaker again thank you very much okay next speaker is Gennady Isnovati Kogan Hubble Tenzin Engine challenges in the modern cosmology, possible solutions. Please, Gennady, you have 14 minutes. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Hubble constant is one of the most important uh, parameter in modern cosmology. Uh, actually, it is not constant uh, because it, dip, it uh, changes with time. But uh, uh, for the present cosmology, it's constant uh, for all uh, points of, of our universe. Uh, the, the, the numerical value of uh, this constant uh, was, uh, it is rather difficult uh, to measure it, and the history of, of these measurements is uh, very complicated and uh, contains many errors and uh, arguments and, uh, and achievements. Uh, and uh, even uh, the name Hubble constant is now uh, not uh, accepted by some community, communities, uh, and they want to call it uh, Hubble Lemaitre constant. But, but this uh, uh, is not a good idea, in my opinion, and it is not, not used, uh, as I understand. So the, um, uh, to measure the constant, uh, usually you people used step-by-step uh, step, uh, uh, determination of, of the distance because the, uh, to know the Hubble constant you, you should know velocity and distance to, to these poles. So velocity is obtained from uh, Doppler and distance is obtained by uh, different uh, standard candles. And so the standard candles, uh, if they are uh, not very bright, they only recent and, and so the chain of standard candles uh, used to, uh, uh, for determination. And uh, because every step has some errors, uh, the results are uh, very different. For example, the first, uh, uh, the first uh, number of standard candles uh, of uh, Hubble constant obtained by Hubble was about 500 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And it contradicted to data, to well-established well data of Earth, Earth uh, age. It, it is age was less than uh, age of the Earth. And therefore, uh, mm, uh, it was trying people to solve this contradiction uh, until it was solved by uh, Alan Sandwich, who had shown that uh, the uh, standard candle in the form of CIFI used by uh, uh, Hubble was, was not really uh, correct because there are two types of CIFIs and he used another type of, uh, of a CIFI. And so when uh, you, he used uh, normal um, CIFI, uh, the ages become equal. Uh, later, the, the, there was a big uh, uh, argument between uh, two groups of uh, one was uh, headed by Sandwich, another by Vacouleur, and they obtained uh, uh, very different values. For uh, Sandwich obtained close to 100, uh, from 70 to 100, and Vacouleur was uh, close to 50. And finally, the uh, it, this, this situation was solved uh, to our time, to time of uh, about 10 years ago, uh, when the uh, Hubble appeared, Hubble telescope, I mean, appeared, and it, uh, 
measured more distant galaxies, and uh, it was uh, decided that Hubble uh, constant present is about 73 or 72, 73 uh, kilometers per time per second. And this situation was uh, very quiet, very good, uh, comfortable, uh, until uh, uh, the Hubble constant begin, uh, people try, begin to measure it, not by uh, this step, but by measuring uh, oscillations uh, of uh, perturbations of, of uh, relic radiation uh, on the level of uh, on the level of uh, uh, when matter become neutral, and then they recalculated it to, to our time and. And uh, it occurs that the value which is obtained by this uh, method is uh, considerably less than the, the than the value obtained by the uh, usual method. So uh, it is uh, between 67 or four, uh, no, 64 for for uh, local and uh, 70, 76 for uh, measurement of oscillations. And this, this problem called now Hubble tension uh, appeared until now, and uh, uh, I will present uh, a very simple way to solve it. Because there, were, there are very many, uh, there are many uh, methods, many uh, how to solve it. Uh, they are, uh, most of them, uh, connected with very complicated things, connected with the uh, change of gravitational uh, theory a little bit, and, and so on. So, uh, review of, of these um, methods is a good review given in this, uh, re, uh, in this article. And most of, most of them are just already... Uh, 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 Rejected because they contradicted to some other, uh, uh, but final final solution is not is not uh, uh, obtained yet. So I uh, I suggested uh, to solve it uh, in in a very simple way, uh, uh, accepting that everything is correct. So the measurements uh, of Hubble telescope uh, by Cepheid is really correct, but when you uh, make a transition, uh, when you make recalculation of Hubble tension, a uh, Hubble um, constant measured by uh, level of recombination, uh, you made uh, not correct, uh, slightly not correct uh, universe uh, model. So because in, in order this, to make this recalculation, you need a uh, universe model. And uh, actually, the there is a very simple uh, and very natural way to change it because uh, <coughs> inflation is now, uh, people believe in, in this inflation, and uh, it suggested that all scalar field uh, which are responsible for inflation is uh, transformed into energy, uh, into matter, into matter, and uh, Presently, the present value of uh, the, uh, dark energy is, is, is related to just uh, constant uh, Einstein constant. So if you, we suggest that uh, partially, that only small part of this uh, uh, scalar field is not completely transformed into matter, but part of it remains, and uh, also because uh, uh, in our universe, there is another uh, uh, unknown uh, component, which is very big. It's dark, de uh, dark uh, matter. Uh, this that dark matter. So uh, to have this, uh, in order to uh, um, explain this uh, Hubble tension, you need to suggest that dark matter and dark energy ha has a connection until now. And uh, uh, here I consider the uh, just linear connection with, with uh, alpha 
uh, constant or alpha depending on, on red sheets. But uh, uh, alpha is very big. So the uh, additional, additional correction uh, from the dark uh, um, scalar fitting is, is small. Is small. Uh, so uh, in order to, uh, to make it, it is possible to develop a, a universe model with, with such, a, uh, such a behavior. Uh, and uh, it's, it's nature to suggest that, that uh, uh, presently, uh, uh, presently, uh, 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 density of the field is, is potential, that uh, pressure of the field is, is minus potential. So it's, it's like, a, like a vacuum, uh, but uh, due to transition from matter to the, from the field to the matter and back, uh, we suggest that uh, kinetic term, which has a property of matter, is transformed into matter, sorry. And uh, pressure term uh, is connect, con connected with uh, uh, with density, but uh, the coefficient is arbitrary because uh, by uh, burn, uh, uh, when uh, massive particles are born, the part of energy is transformed into, into um, uh, rest mass energy, so pressure can be very small. Actually, we consider pressure equal to zero, like we have now. Here we have zero pressure uh, universe. So uh, with these suggestions, uh, it is possible to uh, solve usual equations uh, of uh, Einstein equations and uh, adiabatic equations and to, to obtain the, uh, the following solution for constant, for constant alpha and for zero, uh, this is uh, beta will be taken zero. Uh, with the following dependence of the redshift from, uh, from, from time. Here it is, um, uh, presently, uh, dark uh, energy is connected as a sum of Einstein constant plus this uh, additional, uh, additional uh, smaller term connected with, with, with the field. Uh, and in this case, uh, when you recalculate the uh, Hubble uh, constant from, from the level of recombination, as I told, it is not constant, it depends on time, so it is... Uh, much earlier time, uh, to present, uh, you, you need uh, uh, to have a, uh, the uh, cosmological model. And uh, for uh, dark energy, make a slower, slower decreasing of, of the half of tension. For uh, pure, pure uh, matter, it's one over, over T. It's a decreasing with increasing of T, uh, but for, uh, Pure uh, energy, uh, uh, pure uh, dark energy is constant. So it means that when you increase dark e uh, dark energy, you make a, a, a <clears throat> slower decrease because a Hubble constant at the at the level of recombination is much higher than now. And uh, in this way, you may. Uh, Compare what happened. Hmm? Okay, uh, you may uh, use uh, experimental data uh, uh, from present uh, uh, local measurements and distant me me uh, measurements, and suggesting that local measurements are correct and distant measurements are also correct, but. Incorrect is the transition uh, from, from one level to another level. Then uh, uh, you may compare this uh, to values, and uh, when the uh, uh, present values become equal, this, that means uh, 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 you find out that this uh, parameter alpha, which is um, responsible for that additional term. Uh, um, I, I will not uh, explain very uh, in detail all these calculations. They are very simple. Uh, this is 
h is a function of z uh, with, with the count of this small, and this is h is a count of z with a pure uh, Einsteinian uh, constant. And uh, on the level of, of recombination, the Einsteinian constant is practically uh, negligible because uh, it is constant and uh, matter density is much larger. Uh, so uh, to make this recal recalculation, you uh, use, uh, here it's uh, simple, uh, here is more complicated, nevertheless it's no problem. And uh, now you make this uh, uh, equality, and uh, from this equality, at z equal 100, uh, uh, 1,100, uh, you obtain the value of alpha. Uh, the value of alpha here is equal to 24. It means that uh, one uh, over 24 part of the presently uh, absorbed uh, dark energy is con uh, connected not with Einstein constant, but with remnants of the, of the inflational, uh, inflational field. Uh, so you see that uh, corrections are uh, so small uh, that uh, presently you cannot uh, uh, reduce it or okay. you cannot uh, reject it or believe it because uh, uh, errors uh, of measurements are not uh, perfect. But uh, it seems simple way to do it. Uh, and publication of uh, uh, very recent publication where uh, this is, was Calculated. Actually, um, I suggested it uh, several years ago, but uh, in the early calculations, uh, it was some inconsistency, so um, uh, I get uh, uh, five times more uh, alpha, but uh, uh, this is more reliable. Uh, so, uh, for alpha constant, it is, no, uh, uh, let me also give some details about, uh, about the solution because because solution was obtained uh, for uh, very simple initial conditions, uh, which are not uh, uh, slightly not correct. But uh, there is one constant, uh, free constant, which remains in this solution and uh, instead of uh, using this free constant uh, at, at the beginning, uh, uh, I have done uh, some uh, correction of, of, of this uh, solution in order to satisfy this uh, boundary condition. And this was uh, obtained uh, after correction. So when you uh, have a more complicated uh, function of alpha as a function of z, uh, then uh, mm, complete solution means uh, uh, calculation of the model uh, as a function of uh, mm, um, A as a function of T or of Z becomes very complicated, but uh, luckily it is not necessary because uh, Einstein solution, uh, <coughs> Einstein equation permit to uh, deal with uh, Hubble constant without knowing exactly value of A. Uh, if, if we, we uh, write the uh, Einstein equation in this way, H is uh, uh, A dot over A, uh, then uh, it's possible to find out uh, uh, density as a function of Z, uh, H as a function of Z, and uh, to find the solution for several uh, uh, arbitrary functions, A, uh, uh, alpha uh, function of Z. And uh, here there, there is no, uh, no arbitrary uh, way 
uh, are doing. Uh, and it is absolutely clear from here that uh, the, the present value of density, uh, real, pre uh, real value uh, means this one, is uh, different from, from, uh, from the value uh, which is uh, calculated uh, without additional. But also for small uh, uh, difference. Uh, uh, and what is, uh, what is uh, um, pleasant is that uh, for alpha constant, uh, the solution obtained in this uh, accurate way is exactly the same as, I, as was obtained uh, by uh, this approximate procedure of uh, correction of the solution. Uh, so, uh, uh, we considered uh, dependence of alpha in this simple way, uh, meaning that uh, at large uh, z, uh, influence of um, additional, uh, additional uh, uh, input of oh, the uh, uh, scalar field is increasing, but uh, presently uh, it is uh, can be less than than the, in the case of constant value. Uh, so the solution is also rather simple. Analytic, it is obtained analytically for for this uh, dependence, and finally uh, we obtain this. Uh, this equation for obtaining alpha. Alpha means, now it means it's the present value of alpha. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, for different gamma. And for different gamma, the uh, value of present, uh, 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 present alpha means uh, the one which is because this ratio is also changing, uh, is, is, it's 60. It means that it's even three times less, almost. And also, it's interesting to, uh, to consider that uh, here we have a unique value of, of present, present, uh, energy, uh, present uh, density of matter. And uh, each, each model give, gives different, uh, slightly different values for a present energy, present density. And only in this case, these uh, values are practically, con are practically uh, equivalent. Uh, uh, equal to each other and uh, age of the universe is also uh, the same as, uh, as measured by different other methods, uh, I I indirect methods. Uh, so uh, this is the constants which had been used for, 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 this, for our estimations. This, uh, already you, this is local and distant measurements with differences in the Hubble tensions. To uh, total energy is uh, 10 to minus uh, 29. Uh, it's a flat universe. Uh, the value of uh, uh, energy density uh, of mm, dark energy by, measured by uh, supernova 1A is, is, is very big uh, error, but uh, mm, from uh, perturbations, it's becoming much more, uh, more definite. Uh, it corresponds with lambda. Uh, and no, for uh, here, I, I, I presented the value of constant, Hubble constant, which is uh, from the Sitter universe where, uh, with constant alpha. And the uh, age of the, of the universe is this, and Z re recommendation is 100. Uh, what is uh, 
what are the conclusions? Uh, no, first, uh, 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 it's clear that uh, the solution of this problem is suggested uh, to use remnants of uh, scalar field con uh, intercon with interconnection with dark uh, matter. Because, uh, no, we can't uh, uh, suggest anything about dark matter because uh, nobody have uh, seen it or f even nobody found it in experiment. Uh, and it is, it, uh, while it was born uh, also in inflation, so it, it is uh, naturally that to suggest that it is, mm, uh, has some uh, uh, interaction with dark energy, dark energy, and this interaction proceeds until now. And this interaction, uh, if it's uh, uh, proceeds until now, could be only if energy of uh, particles of uh, dark uh, matter particles is sufficiently small, uh, the, the uh, rest mass of particles, because otherwise they could not be born by, by the uh, scalar field. And in this way, we have uh, uh, the following uh, the following conclusion that the dark matter particles uh, should be very small particles, like axion or axion-like papers uh, particles, and uh, there should be a, a spectrum of of these uh, particles. It's, uh, probably it is not really axions, but some other other uh, kind of particles. And uh, the, the maximum mass, presently maximum mass uh, of these uh, particles uh, is about 5, 10 to minus 4 electron volt. So the, the smallest mass should not uh, exceed this value. So in this way, uh, uh, Hubble tension uh, problem uh, can be solved without changing any other uh, any other uh, deep deep physics uh, fundamental theories. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you again. Now, before this very interesting talk of Hubble tension. Please, questions? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. We have find the remedy for Hubble tension, but instead what you proposed another cosmological parameter. Could we, 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 could we figure out some observational evidence, independent evidence for this kind of, of dark matter? Presently, uh, I, I can say that this explanation does not contradict any existing. Uh, uh, maybe uh, if you if you use uh, this model of the universe when you uh, make development of data about the perturbations, uh, you need uh, to uh, to include another restriction because you need to find find uh, some uh, extremum in, in, in uh, many, many uh, variable, variable space. And this is another uh, additional, uh, additional one, additional experiment. So it may uh, slightly ch change the, uh, the uh, present uh, values. You know? For example, instead of 73, uh, uh, instead of 76, it can be slightly. But uh, everything is inside the error boxes because the, change, the additional values are very small. So we cannot uh, uh, suspect that these small changes will drastically change our, our uh, view of, of the universe. But for uh, how to, to prove it, I don't know. The best proof, proof will be if will be detected the, the dark matter uh, uh, dark matter particles and uh, the nature of these particles if if they are uh, all high mass then this model no good <laughs>
questions? Last one. In the common literature, he describes the Hubble tension, the fixing the Hubble tension is divided to two parts, to two types. One is before CMB, uh, early fix, and one is between CMB and now. Uh, to uh, which of these two categories you, your solution belong, or did I understand correctly that you are changing both the evolution before CMB and after CMB? Uh, I should suggest it, that all period from the beginning to, to uh, recombination is the same as usually people think. And the value of uh, Hubble, the Hubble value uh, is uh, uh, equal in both, in both models. So, so we, we start from, from the model where, uh, for example, uh, if H is equal to uh, 70, uh, 67 in, uh, now, I, I also consider that it is really 67, but when it's changing uh, during the further expansion, then it, it is uh, become slow uh, uh, um, it's increasing, but uh, in different way. But, but the value of H on the level of uh, recombination is uh, 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 the same in both cases. No, no, six, no, not 67, of course, it's much, much less, but they are equal on the level of recombination. So uh, what happens before recombination? Uh, I don't, don't want to change at all because uh, I'm, not, I'm not very good with it, with this theory. Thank you. After, yeah, I change everything is due to uh, changing of the model after a combination. And very last question. Do you have any further evidence for your CEV parameters other than Hubble tension? No, I, I found it, find it by, uh, from, from this equality of, of uh, experimental and theoretical, then uh, so this alpha your, becomes. Yes, 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 of course. Have you thought of any other effects of CEV in other aspects uh, of uh, Presently, people uh, consider uh, uh, models with interconnection between uh, dark energy and dark matter, but a very different way, and I did not compare them because they have a, mm, not very not very clear but 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 such ideas of interconnection uh, there are there are papers which use it okay, I think we can discuss these interesting aspects in the coffee break thank you thank you Gennady our next speaker is Evgeny Derishev title is pair balance model for relativistic shocks mm -hmm and its application to astrophysical sources. I, I will take this uh, time to thank the organizers for inviting me and go into the talk. Uh, I'm going to present a concept uh, which is uh, not really completely new, but it takes a hard effort to push it forward, despite the fact that uh, this concept seems to explain all the available observational data while the concept everybody else uses seems to fail. Anyway, the rigidity of 
of uh, the community is extremely high. I will try to convince you in any case that there is something to think about. Uh, so I will start uh, with uh, three types of uh, objects with relativistic outflows. One of them that was not really discussed in this conference except for the talk of George Pavlov. And I'm going to follow the, the mainstream and will not discuss it again. But this is uh, also falls into, into the broad concept. It's a, a pulsar which circles around a massive star and the pulsar wind, which is relativistic, collides with the wind from a, from a massive star. This also falls into the concept, but I will not discuss it. The second, uh, AGNs, active galactic nuclei, with relativistic jets flowing from the center. I will discuss it briefly. And mostly, I will spend my time discussing application to the gamma ray bursts, and more specifically to the gamma ray bursts after glows. Why gamma ray bursts? Because it's the most, phys in physical sense, it's the most clean problem you can invent. There is a relativistic shock. The evolution of this shock is governed by hydrodynamical equations. We know these equations. We know the evolution. And there is actually nothing in this relativistic shock except the magnetic field and the accelerated particles. The magnetic field and accelerated particles, they give you synchrotron radiation, most naturally. Uh, the synchrotron radiation, all you need to know is that uh, the frequency depends on the energy of, uh, of the particle as uh, the energy squared, the gamma squared. And there is a limit for the synchrotron photon energy because uh, if you lose energy, the energy loss rate is also proportional to the gamma squared. If you lose energy too, too quick, you simply lose half of the energy before doing half of the circle. And this prevents you from reflecting particles. And the reflecting particles is essential for, for the ability to accelerate particles. If you cannot accelerate particles, you cannot go beyond this frequency. And this frequency is 70, the, the energy of the synchrotron photons is 70 MeV, and it's independent on the magnetic field strength. This is the so-called synchrotron burn-off limit. Then, if you have synchrotron, you also have uh, inverse Compton because the low energy synchrotron photons can scatter off high energy electrons producing energy inverse Compton component. Inverse Compton because usual Compton is uh, draining energy from photons to electrons, and this is doing just the other way around. It drains energy from the electrons to the photons. Uh, the power of this radiation is, uh, looks very similar to the synchrotron power, except that instead of the energy density of the magnetic field, you have the energy density of the photon field, plus the cross-section for the inverse Compton, if it's thomson region, then the cross-section is the same Thomson cross-section. If it's klein nishina it's smaller. And uh, look here, if you want to have high energy of, of, uh, of the scattered photon, you, you need to go to the klein nishina regime, where you essentially transfer all the energy from electron to the photon. But then you have small cross-section. If you want to have high power of the inverse Compton radiation, you want to be in the, in the Thomson regime, but then you have low energy of the scattered photons. If you want to have both, you need to be just in between. Why I'm talking about this? Because it seems that relativistic shocks knows about this, and it exactly balances itself to be between these regimes. And one more process that we cannot forget about because uh, the Feynman diagram for pair production from two photons is just the same as the Feynman diagram for, uh, for inverse Compton scattering. If you have one, you, you have another. The only difference uh, in the cross-section is factor of two because uh, of, of the symmetry in the diagrams. Uh, another essential difference is the energy threshold. You cannot produce uh, and an electron-positron pair if you don't have enough energy. And, the, and in the threshold, you see the factor one minus cosine of the angle between the two photons. And this is the way how you avoid absorbing high-energy photons in gamma-ray bursts, because all the photons due to relativistic motion are beamed within a small angle. 
and this factor of 1 minus cosine is very, very small, gamma squared. OK, now go into the concept. Let's think of a relativistic shock. Oh, sorry. Let's think of a relativistic shock, and you have high energy uh, oh. yeah, it's here. Uh, and you have high energy electrons and positrons behind the shock. Uh, in, in the shock frame, you have the upstream flow and the downstream flow. In the downstream, you have high energy electrons and positrons, which are produced in some way. Let's, for the moment, forget about the exact way how they are produced, they must be there because we, we see the emission from relativistic shocks in, in gamma ray bursts, for example. If you have relativistic electrons and positrons, you have the magnetic field. The magnetic fields are ubiquitous. You always have the magnetic field. You, you cannot avoid having the magnetic field. Then you have synchrotron and you have inverse Compton, as we have just discussed. If you have synchrotron photons and inverse Compton photons, they can collide, producing pairs. They produce pairs in the downstream, let's forget about those pairs. But they also produce pairs in the upstream. What happens? You move the energy as, as the high energy photon goes from the downstream to the upstream. You move the energy and momentum from the downstream to the upstream. And when you produce a pair there, this pair gets captured in the magnetic field. And in this way, you transfer energy and momentum from the radiation to the upstream fluid. The upstream fluid gets decelerated, and you have a modified shock solution where you have a decelerating flow going from the relativistic speed from, from here, then gradually decelerating and going into the downstream. The modification is just due to this energy and momentum transfer between the downstream and the upstream. Then let's think of this model a little bit more uh, in detail. Suppose, for example, that I have, at the beginning, I have very low energy electrons and positrons. Low energy means that uh, the inverse Compton photons will be also low energy. Low energy inverse Compton photons will not produce pairs except for the very, very high energy tail. So I will have very few pairs going from the downstream uh, to the upstream. But those pairs, will be accelerated by the total power of, of the incoming flow. So the whole power of the incoming flow will be distributed over the small amount of particles. The particles will get to the very high energy. If I get the particles to the very high energy, what it does it mean? It, it means that I have high energy inverse Compton photons, and they easily produce pairs with synchrotron photons. If they easily produce pairs, I have a lot of pairs, but the power of the, of the decelerating flow is the same. That means I will decrease energy. And there is a balance. The balance is exactly when I start, to produ I, I start producing pairs efficiently. And I start producing pairs efficiently exactly when the energy of inverse Compton photons is approaching the, the threshold. And the energy of inverse Compton photons is approaching the threshold exactly when we are on the border between the Klein-Nishina and Thomson regime for the synchrotron photons. And this means that the shock balances itself in the way that the Lorentz factor, typical Lorentz factor of accelerated electrons is one over cubic root of the magnetic field. So it depends on the magnetic field. It does not depend on the shock Lorentz factor. Now, about this solution. We have one branch of, of the solution for the upstream flow. The lower branch is for the downstream flow. And as you see, if you increase the fraction of energy that goes from the downstream to the upstream and, and being absorbed in the upstream, you decrease the jump between the upstream and the downstream until you go to this point when you have a smooth flow smoothly passing through the sonic point. This is, this is the sonic point. Well, what does it mean in terms of theoretical prediction? It means that the ratio of synchrotron to inverse Compton luminosity is about unity. It cannot be 
too low. I, I mean, the luminosity in inverse Compton cannot be too low because in this way, I will not get balance. It cannot be too high. It's uh, more difficult to explain. It has something to do with, um, with the actual way how the particles are accelerated. The particles are accelerated by draining energy from the magnetic field, actually, if you, if you go deep into the electrodynamics. So I will not stop on this right now, but if, if there is a question, I will try to explain it. So the, uh, the ratio of the synchrotron to inverse Compton luminosity is about unity. The fraction of internally absorbed radiation, this is the, the way I, how I balance the shock. It should be roughly constant, 0.1 or something like this. And the typical Lorentz factor of accelerated electrons is adjusted to, to reach the balance. And in this way, it does not depend on the, on the shock Lorentz factor. It depends on the magnetic field. As the shock decelerates, the magnetic field goes down. As the magnetic field goes down, the Lorentz factor of accelerated electrons goes up. Not very quickly, but it rises just opposite to the common concept that as, as you slow down the shock, you also decrease the Lorentz factor of accelerated electrons. Now, the proof of the concept is in the using it. The first reported GRB in the TV range was a beautiful example for, for this concept to, to be used. Why it's so important to detect GRBs in TV? Here is the, the, the grain line here is the synchrotron burn-off limit multiplied by the Lorentz factor of the ejecta. So no way you can produce TV photons by synchrotron. It must be inverse Compton. Whatever else was, was absorbed in this gamma ray burst is from the synchrotron component. A single component can be fitted actually in, in many, many ways. And this is the problem for the gamma ray burst. This was the problem un until uh, TV emission was detected. With the TV emission, you have two components. You have much less freedom on the parameters. Actually, you can determine all of them by trying to fit the, the CD. This is what we have done. And uh, actually, for this particular burst, there, there were data available for two time intervals, uh, early time interval and late time interval. There is a good fit for both. And this is the first time. And as I know, the only time when from the SED feed, we were able to determine the Lorentz factor of the emitting region. Because the Lorentz factor is one of the three parameters, and, and there is uh, not so much freedom when you use TV, uh, X-rays, and optical all together. So the, the whole freedom is collap uh, collapses to a narrow range in the parameter space. and, and in this way, we are able to determine everything, more or less. So what's strange in, in the results, in, in a sense? Not, not really extremely strange, but strange. The Lorentz factor of, uh, of accelerated electrons at early time is lower than at late time. You have also similar fraction of accelerated uh, electrons in energy and slightly less fraction in the magnetic field which is possible, uh, but uh, now look, the Lorentz factor of, of electrons is increasing with time as the shock decelerates, but the fraction of internally absorbed radiation, which comes directly from, from the simulations uh, from the feed, stays the same. And it's extremely sensitive to the parameters. For example, it's, it's sensitive to the Lorentz factor as the Lorentz factor to the cube, oh, sorry, to the first power. The Lorentz factor goes down, and there should be a difference by, by a factor of several, and it's the same. Now, by chance, this gamma ray burst was more or less near to the parameters that everybody expected. If I ask before this burst, what, you, what do you expect for this gamma ray burst for the parameters? Then mostly people would say approximately the same. So nothing extremely strange except for the time evolution we see in this burst. Uh, but this burst, here is the, the quick summary that, uh, uh, for, for this burst. Uh, what I want to stress here 
is that uh, the SEDT that I obtained here, which is consistent with pair balance model, was actually obtained by a blind brute force approach. We simply scanned over the whole parameter space and found a single region that fits the data. And this also fits uh, with the model. Now we have another bird. It's different. It has much lower kinetic energy of the shock. It was observed not one minute after the birth, but six hours after the birth. And uh, because it's so late in time, it's hard uh, for the pair balance to reach the saturated regime. It tries, but it probably cannot. So let's look what happens with this birth with the SED. This is a figure from the discovery paper where they clearly say, which is correct, that uh, this birth cannot be explained with the standard assumptions. So what there is doing this situation, they say, okay, we cannot explain this birth, let's forget about it. We cannot, so what? <laughs> hmm? These lines, the, ah, the, the orange lines are assuming that you cannot, uh, that you can extend synchrotron as, uh, as a single power law to, to extreme energies. How you can do it, nobody knows. Th th there are several ideas like having a small scale patches of extremely strong magnetic field that, that can do probably the job. But you have to invent something ad hoc to explain this particular burst. You, you don't need it anywhere else, you need it here. Now, let's, let's try to, to scan over the parameter space again using the brute force. Now, I should say a simple statement that, that took quite a long time to understand for me, as usual happens. If you use a standard uh, injection power law with uh, e to the minus 2.5, you cannot fit the spectrum with any parameter. There is a reason for that, a simple one, that because uh, you are in the slow cooling regime now, and uh, there is a lowest, uh, in the slow cooling regime, there is a lowest limit for the synchrotron peak. So you, you cannot put the synchrotron peak to so low. If you, if you try to do this, you need extremely low energy injection, and you cannot put the inverse Compton peak to the right position. So what you do, you relax the assumption that the injection is e to the minus 2.5. Let's consider soft injection. With 3.5, you do a good job. There is a nice fit. And this fit has typical energy of injected electrons, which is not so much different from the predictions of the pair of It's Essentially, it's the same. How happens that uh, this burst has very soft injection. Well, it's because if you plot for, for the given magnetic field strength and for the given uh, fraction of the, inject, uh, of the energy injected in oxidated electrons, let's see what happens if we change the typical energy of injected electrons, uh, what happens to the fraction of absorbed radiation. It goes up as you increase the energy and it goes down. It goes up because you, you, you go from the Thompson to the Klein Nishina. It goes down because, because you go deep into the Klein Nishina. And there is, a, there is a maximum exactly between the Klein Nishina and Thompson. And the best fit is close to this maximum. So the shock does it, its best. It tries as much as it can to reach the pair balance. But it cannot because the most it can reach is approximately 10 to the minus 3, which means that the shock is not exactly in the balance. There is a large, really large jump uh, in, the, in the flow velocity. But this is, this is what we expect. Uh, we expect that as we decrease the magnetic field, the power that we can drain from electrons decreases, and essentially we uh, finally reach, at, at some point we reach the slow cooling regime that we cannot simply drain the power from electrons. We can accelerate, but we cannot drain the power, so we cannot keep the balance. But we can try, and the shock tries, and, and it does its best. So the, the predictions regarding the energy of the accelerated electrons, the predictions hold, because the model works, more or less. 
but the fraction of the accelerated electrons is not 0.1. It's less because it's not in the saturated region. It's about to switch off the pair balance, but it's still on. And the last one is the greatest burst of all times, which was observed by Ohaso experiment. Uh, we are going to listen about the details of this burst in, in, in a talk tomorrow. But this one was observed during the prompt, so it's extremely early after go. No doubts we will have saturated regime of the pair balance. Let's try, and I, I did it quickly just before going to this conference. Let's try to fit the observational data. No problem. I can do it. The parameters seem very Typical, more or less, I would say, the, the Lorentz factor of accelerated electrons, the energy fraction in the magnetic field, the energy fraction in the electrons. Uh, the Lorentz factor is, is more or less okay. What's underlined here is the energy of the shock. This one is 10 times less than the energy emitted in gamma rays during the prompt. Now it's up to you. Actually, what, what governs the solution is the ratio of epsilon E divided by epsilon B. So I, I have no idea from the solution itself what's the typical energy of the shock. I can increase the energy of a shock tenfold by reducing epsilon E and epsilon B tenfold as well, keeping the same ratio. I will get the same spectrum. What happens is that this burst is going to be an outlier then. Every other burst seems to produce, uh, to, to show epsilon E, which is 0.2 or something like this. Epsilon B is also more or less typical for this burst, except for the energy. It's up to you to choose. Whether the, the burst was, the prompt efficiency was 90%, or this burst is, is different in the shock mechanics, in, in the shock microphysics producing the, the magnetic field. I would rather take the first option. But for some reason, this burst was extremely, extremely efficient. And the blue line is, is the famous uh, 18 TV photon, which if you see from the spectrum, if I calculate the, the typical number of expected 18 TV photons, I get something like 0.1 for this burst, which is probably inconsistent with one. But uh, as I understand, uh, this is not 18, this is 18 plus minus 40% uh, or so. So it's more or less consistent. And uh, the very last uh, part of my talk, if it if it's a general concept, it should suit not only gamma ray bursts, it should uh, fit the, the blazers as well. And indeed, it's a, it's a good option for blazers. In blazers, we have electricity outflows. Uh, the mechanism doesn't care whether you have uh, a shock or a shear flow. The only thing that is required for this mechanism is that the velocity difference in different parts is relativistic. Either because, because of shock or because of a shear flow, I don't care. So TV blazers just explained out of the box nicely. If you put, in, put into the model the typical parameters, you, you get exactly, exactly the numbers that you expect. For the magnetic field about one Gauss and the Lorentz factor about 30, uh, you get the typical Lorentz factor of injected electrons about slightly less than 10 to the five and the ratio of uh, uh, inverse Compton to the synchrotron peaks, uh, the, the frequency is about 10 to the nine. This is what we observe. And the synchrotron peak is about at the same height as, as the inverse Compton, exactly in accordance with the pair bounds. But we have GV blazers. They are more abundant than the TV blazers, and they are different. In this way, you cannot exploit the GV blazers. But in principle, this mechanism can work by using 
second inverse Compton scattering. So you, you have synchrotron, you scatter it once, you produce low energy inverse Compton photons, you scatter them second time, producing higher energy inverse Compton photons. And this second stage inverse Compton gives you a kind of a generalization of, for the pair of balance where the predicted uh, typical energy of oxidated electrons is one over the magnetic field to the one fifth. And this again fits the, the typical ratio of the, of the energies between the inverse Compton and the synchrotron. But now it's not gamma squared, it's gamma to the fourth because it's the second cascade of compensation. What about the high Compton dominance uh, at the moment? I cannot tell you anything, but this is a figure that I produced uniformly scanning over the parameter space. Every, every dot in this figure is, is, is uh, one dot in the parameter space. I uniformly changed the cooling Lorentz factor. That means uh, the distance from the source and the injection Lorentz factor. And I fixed the ratio of epsilon e to epsilon b in such a way that it fits the pair balance model. Then you have a surface produced by uh, the, this, this fix produces you a surface in the parameter space. If you project the surface to the uh, uh, to the, this one dimensional plot, this is peak location, inverse Compton peak location in GV, and this is Compton dominance. This surface has two folds. And every fold produces a condensation of points. One is here, another is here. This one is probably less visible on this screen, but uh, here I, I see it nicely. So one condensation is clearly TV blazers. This is one TV, and the Compton dominance is less than one, slightly less. And these are GV blazers. The typical energy is one GV and less, and the Compton dominance is high, about 100. Whether it has something to do with the model or not, I'm not sure at the moment. This is another plot of the same kind uh, with a different magnetic field. So it's, it's absolutely the same. The magnetic field differs by a factor of 100, but the plot is the same. So it's, it's robust. What's different in, uh, in, in this uh, scenario with respect to gamma ray burst is that uh, we have external compound. And it probably cannot be ignored. With external Compton, you still can work. Uh, you can still have pair balance. It will be affected by external Compton, yes. So what, what I wanted to show you that in principle, pair balance can work to explain blazers even with pure SSC. But probably, it's better to try with, an, uh, with external Compton so, so that it becomes more realistic. And uh, my conclusions are simple. There is a model. This model has predictive power. And uh, with a few examples that we have in hands, the predictive power of this model works nicely. So it, it predicts the properties, and the properties that we have from the fits are exactly the same. So that's it. Thank you. But I would like to ask about the blazer, because when you show what you call GV blazer, we call it FSR shoot, and surely there is this external field, and they will play some role, yes, in your computation, because you form the peak. Uh, so I want to ask, uh, for the pure SEC scenarios, you say that you are able to model when the magnetic field will be around one, right? Uh, did you estimate the energy? Signal? For the TV blazers, yes. Yes, for TV ones, you said the magnetic field one gauss and uh, the, the yeah. dots that you o think. Of the be. order of, of course, you, okay. you don't need exactly and, one. Of course, and how much would be the, the jet luminosity in electrons and in magnetic field? Did you estimate this? <sighs> well, all I know from the model is epsilon E divided by epsilon B. So in principle, this model will not work in the magnetically dominated jets. For the magnetically dominated jets, you need external compound. Okay. With self compound, you cannot. This is true, but uh, sometimes maybe you would need large, the jet luminosity will be so large 
I remember because when you tried to hit the... Oh, it's, it's, it's fast cooling regime. So, so whatever you have in the jet, you can emit. You, you will not need more power than you emit. So basically, it can, it can be 100% efficient. If this effective model works for pulsar with nebulae, which consequences should we expect? Did, did you try to, to apply it to, to pulsar with nebulae? Well, it's, it's work in the progress, actually. Um, I'm, I'm working on that. Uh, the difficulty here is that uh, this is com completely governed by external Compton, external Compton with the emission from the star. And uh, in principle, we, we, ex we expect something like this. Uh, there is synchrotron peak, which is going to be more or less in optical, maybe in far UV. There is uh, inverse Compton peak, which is going to be approximately in GV. And there is something in between, which is Comptonization of, of the self-synchrotron uh, by, by the same electrons, uh, which is somewhere in between uh, in, in, in X-ray range. Yeah, I would disagree about synchrotron peak. It uses much higher energies. But it doesn't matter for this experiment. Oh, oh you, it's, it's a question, uh, how, how do you uh, how do you attribute the emission of these energies? What do you attribute it to the synchrotron to something else? Okay, thank you. And only last question, then you can discuss at coffee break. Uh, can you please tell which equations we used for uh, finding the uh, shock wave structure? A and uh, what is the, what you can pair balance? Does it give this kinetic uh, equation you saw for, for finding uh, uh, the equations, uh, of, uh, of, I, I'm sorry, I don't have it with me. Uh, the equations are in the paper, of course. Uh, the equations are simple. These are the momentum and energy uh, conservation equations, plus two additional terms. Uh, loss of the energy and momentum from the downstream and gain of the same energy and momentum in the upstream. You mean equations determining the structure of shock wave? Uh, Yes, 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 but this is implicit solution. This, this is, uh, this is uh, obtained in terms uh, of the speed as a function of the absorbed fraction of the radiation, not as a function of a distance. But to get the spectra, whatever you need from the shock, you only need this solution. You don't need the dependence on the distance. Okay, thank so, you. so actually, this solution is enough. Thank you, Yevgeny. So we have 20 minutes for coffee break. Then we will come back. Yes. Ten, ten minutes less. Yeah. <laughs>
So uh, we have some uh, 20, some 10 minutes accumulated delay, and we hope to proceed with this 10 minutes. Uh, therefore, you will be speaking right after Massimo. Okay? Yes. Okay. Okay. Can you maybe uh, share your screen a moment just to see if everything works perfectly? Sure. Okay. okay. Massimo, you stop sharing a moment. Okay, yes, we can see it. Try full screen, please. Okay, perfect. We can see everything. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so we will start in uh, 15 minutes from now, okay? Yeah. With the uh, Massimo. Okay, see you later then. Thank you.
Okay, so yeah. let's start our next talk. Next two talks will be online talks. Uh, now our yes. Okay. So our next next speaker is Massimo Schiavelli. The title is James Webb Space Telescope. Status and status and science results. Uh, Massimo, are you here? Thank you for inviting me uh, to give this talk. I'll uh, I'll focus mostly on uh, on the status of the mission, commissioning, and then uh, possible implications for cosmology and. Uh, the speaker following me will talk about more detailed astrophysical science. Uh, Garth Ellingworth. So um, I assume you can hear me fine. Uh, so what is JWST? Uh, I'll be talking about commissioning. I'll give a very quick science overview of the topics that JWST works on, just showing some pictures and giving a few concepts and then talk about JWST and cosmology. So what is JWST? JWST is a large infrared optimized telescope. Here on the left, you can see a comparison in size between the Spitzer, uh, which was an infrared space telescope, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope and Webb. Uh, JWST is a, an A-team segment primary mirror. Each of these segments has an area larger than the primary mirror of the Spitzer Space Telescope, just to give you an idea of the increasing capabilities. So the telescope is large because we need sensitivity, light collecting and photon collecting area, and angular resolution because we are diffraction limited uh, since we are in space and we have good optics. Uh, infrared, because we need to study dust and shrouded objects in our in our galaxy, very distant galaxies whose light is redshifted into the infrared, and molecules that uh, emit infrared lines. Um, and the telescope orbits the L2 Lagrangian point. This is a non-stable uh, Lagrangian point. is a saddle in the potential, so we need to spend fuel to keep the... The, the telescope around in, in its orbit around L2. So uh, I already talked about the mirror, which is a 6.5 meter uh, primary mirror. There are four uh, highly capable science instruments. They operate uh, at about 40 Kelvin, with one exception, the mid infrared instrument has a detector that operates at six Kelvin and it has a, a cryo cooler. That brings it there, so it has there is no expandable, no cryogens. The primary mission was supposed to be five years, uh, and with a goal of ten years. Uh, the Space Telescope Science Institute is the science operation center, like we are for Hubble, but also the flight operation center. So, all uh, command into the telescope is done from this will this building. In fact, uh, the opposite side of where I'm sitting now. Deployment required the uh, 178 release mechanisms. These were all single point failures. And then the mirror has 132 actuators. Uh, and we serve the international astronomical community. The picture on the on the right is the is the flight control room where actual commands are given uh, during commissioning. Uh, this is the last time I saw the telescope at North Grumman in uh, in uh, Redondo Beach in California. As you can see here, the sun shield wasn't uh, tensioned. The layers were all together and the side segments from the primary were still undeployed and the secondary is undeployed in this, this picture. Of course, everything was tested on the ground before, multiple times before launching. Here's a... A little video of launch. Uh, 
I don't know if you can hear the audio. It's a, it's a countdown in French. This was launched from Kuru in French Guyana. This is, if you think about it, quite an example of international collaboration. The, the, the most expensive space observatory ever launched, the launch from a, a, a European rocket. And the telescope itself is a collaboration of NASA, the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency. Here's a, a, a gift, uh, oh, sorry, from uh, the Ariane, the upper stage for the first time was mounting a camera. And so uh, we could see the separation of the telescope uh, you can see some of the features, um, the thing, the, the three circular, you know, cones uh, at the top are the star trackers. The little blue lights you see are the thrusters that adjust the attitude. The telescope was programmed to deploy the solar panel once the attitude was just right. And uh, uh, we thought that would happen in about 30 minutes. Uh, after launch and uh, we were lucky enough to be still within field of view of the camera. Uh, launch was very good, you know, very nominal. And so the telescope was had settled early, uh, earlier than the predictions. And so this, the observatory decided the time was good to deploy the solar panel, which is a nice uh, view. Uh, this is the last view we'll have of the telescope. In the following roughly two weeks, uh, we did all the other major deployments. So deploying the sun shield, tensioning and separating the layers, deploying the secondary mirror, uh, deploying the two wings of the primary mirror, and then you know finally we get to the fully deployed uh, observatory. Uh, this deployment sequence was refined for years and tweaked. And according to our expectations, we would have reached that state of fully deployed after 14 days, two hours, 40 minutes. We reached it after 14 days, three hours, eight minutes. So if you are Swiss, I'm sorry, we were 28 minutes late. Mm -hmm. If you're not Swiss, it was a great success. Um, following these, we had, uh, you know, all commissioning lasted about six months. We had the deployment of the mirror segments of their launch supports. And then as we wait for the observatory to cool, we started aligning the primary mirror, which took about three months. And then the last two months uh, were the commissioning of the instruments. Of course, these boundaries are not totally sharp because we start the activities whenever we could. So the bottom line is that the telescope has a better optical quality than uh, required. We are diffraction limited at one micron. In fact, slightly better than one micron uh, as of today, uh, instead of the two micron, which was the requirement. Uh, to give you an idea, we just measured the optical quality was 66 nanometer RMS over the old mirror, and the requirement is 150. The telescope is stable. As a consequence, we can correct the optics every six weeks instead of the planned two, three weeks. We still measure it every couple of days though. The, the observatory is stable. The point instability for long integration is about one milliard seconds RMS. The sensitivity beats expectations in most modes. Uh, we can track moving targets three times faster than the requirements. This is a big floppy telescope, so it wasn't designed to be a, a, a super fast tracker. We were supposed, the requirement was 30 million seconds per second of movement on the sky. Uh, but on the occasion of the DART uh, uh, impact on the, on the binary asteroid uh, Didymos uh, on its satellite, we actually had to track at 105 milliard seconds per second. So that's a 3.5 times faster. It's a challenging, but we can do it. Lifetime is great. Uh, launch was perfect. Uh, and of course, we all we carry margin for all activities, but launch was 
perfect. Uh, the launch day was very good. Uh, the, the, the amount of fuel spent depends a little bit on when exactly the launch day is. The launch day, uh, Christmas was a great choice. Uh, the, and a lot of fuel is used in our uh, mid course correction uh, 1A, which is the telescope itself uses, the observatory itself uses its fuel to go toward the L2 orbit. That's a, a critical burn. We, it has to happen late enough that we know exactly where we are, thanks to the tracking from the ground telemetry, but early enough, so because the more you weigh, the more fuel you'll need. And it's optimized for to take place at 12.5 hours after launch, and it took place at 12.5 hours after launch. As a result, we have a lifetime we have fewer for more than 20 years of life. So the summary is we can do better science for a longer time. Of course, everybody was quite happy. As you can see from the masks, since doing all this in normal times would have been too easy, we also uh, had to do it during the some of the deployments, particularly during what in the US was the, uh, the Omicron peak, the peak of the Omicron variant, uh, which, you know, forced us to take some steps, but uh, it didn't stop us. So this is a picture, uh, what happens when you have a 6.5 meter diffraction limiter telescope in space. These are the fields of view of all the instruments. Uh, the instruments in principle could be operated in parallel. You can see the, the near cam imager, the two fields, the fine guidance sensor, which we use to point, the Canadian nearest instrument, which is an imager and slitless spectrograph, the mid infrared instrument, which is an imager and a spectrograph, and the near spec, which is uh, the European provided um, infrared spectrograph. The, uh, in practice, we are limited by data volume. The data that we can bring down uh, don't really allow us to use all modes of all instruments at the same time. Uh, we have a, a, a data rate of 28 megabit per second from L2, from from a, a 1.5 million kilometers away. And we use three deep space network antennas in Madrid, Canberra, and Goldstone, California. So what does it do? Of course, it observes distant galaxies. This is one of the pictures from the ERO. These galaxies have a lot of morphologies distorted by the lensing cluster in that field. I won't say anything about this, just to point out that uh, the great optical quality allows you to get great detail on these distant objects. Uh, you can study nearby galaxies. Here is a comparison of Hubble versus JWST. Um, the interesting feature is that not only with the infrared you can penetrate through dust to some extent, but you can also see dust in emission, for instance, the polyaromatic hydrocarbons. And so that is something that gives helps give a, a, a complete view of the processes uh, occurring in nearby galaxies and, and elsewhere. Uh, we are, of course, monitoring the solar system. It was surprising how easy it was to see rings uh, around everything that we looked at. Of course, a lot of these rings were known, but never so easily seen. Here's a Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune. And, uh, and you can see details in the atmospheres and, and so on. Um, and finally, we're observing a lot of exoplanets. The little car cartoon on the right, uh, bottom right shows the technique, one of the techniques that we use. This is a transit. As the planet crosses in front of the stars, it causes a little mini eclipse, which of course is a l very small because the planet apparent size is a lot smaller than the star apparent size. A fraction of the light from the stars goes through the atmosphere. And so by this type of observations with very uh, accurate uh, spectroscopy or photometry, we can capture the composition of the planet atmosphere if it has one. Uh, the sketch above shows what we would see if we would observe Venus, the Earth, and Mars. You know, two of them only show carbon dioxide, but 
earth which show also ozone and water uh, and the plot shows that the distribution in properties between temperature and radius of the various planets we are observing compared to two planets in the solar system so a range of properties and what is to date i think the most interesting one is uh, is potentially interesting one is this planet where for the first time we have detected sign, possible signs of an atmosphere on a rocky exoplanet. We see them in gas giants. We haven't yet seen atmospheres in rocky exoplanets uh, outside the solar system. And as we means humankind, not just JWST. And in this case, they see water vapor, a three sigma evidence of water vapor. Unfortunately, we we don't know if it's uh, superheated uh, water vapor in the star spots of the star, which is the, the orange curve, or in the atmosphere of the planet, which is the blue curve. So follow-up observations will be needed to either confirm or deny this. And among the targets that are being observed is uh, the TRAPPIST-1 system that contains seven rocky exoplanets, or so more than the four in the solar system. Since the star is a red dwarf, they're all in. They, the old system would be within the orbit of Mercury. And the, but in green is the habitable zone. And there are three planets that potentially could have liquid water on their surface. And I think it will be interesting to see what we find. So far, we have observed B, uh, and B does not have an atmosphere. So uh, what about cosmology? Um, one of the areas that we think JWST will contribute to is the so-called cosmological tension. When one measure, measures H0 using cosmological measurements, like the, you know, based on CMB, uh, large scale structure, one tends to obtain values that are smaller than the values that we obtain from the local universe. Uh, so that's the left values around 67 versus the, the right values around 73, 74. I mean, for people who started many years ago in this field, this is an amazing success because at the time when I was uh, going to college, we didn't know if it was 50 or 100. So now we are talking about uh, a six kilometers per second difference, but the error bars are a lot smaller and we want to know which of the two is right. So uh, JWST can address this problem using a variety of techniques, uh, particularly related to the local universe. Uh, we can uh, take advantage of the tip of the red giant branch technique. We can do better cross calibration of C phase variable stars and, and oxygen rich Myras with the supernovae. And we can do quasar cosmochronography, where we combine gravitational lens QSOs time delays uh, with the, to derive uh, the cosmological parameters from the knowledge of the lens mass distribution. I'll spend a few uh, minutes on this last technique because it's perhaps the least known. The idea is that if you have a, a background source, say a quasar on the, on the right in this, uh, in this model, and a lens in the middle, uh, and you can see in this case, two images, we often, this is done on four, uh, on quads, where you have four images of the quasar. The two rays uh, are, have in general different lengths. So if there is variability in the source, uh, the, a little blip uh, you, you'll see on ray, on ray A at a different time than you see it on ray B. And uh, if you work the math, the time delay depends on the model of the lens and on the cosmological parameters. So if you're confident about the model of the lens, you can derive from a single observation of time delays, the cosmological parameters. And of course, you'll do more than one in order to refine the measurement. The tricky part here is the model of the lens. If you assume that the lenses were generally elliptical galaxies are like the ones in the local universe, you get a result that tends to agree with the holy cow, with the with the Cepheids measurement. Holy cow is the name of one of these quasar surveys. Uh, the while if you assume a parametric model that allows freedom for the galaxies to change uh, within some reasonable uh, parameter space, 
the measurement is not as clean and, and the, the result seems to drift toward the CMB measurements, the global measurements. So GWST, by studying the lens galaxy in great detail, can hopefully tell us the, the structure of this galaxy, refine the lens model, and tell us which of those two things is correct. Uh, I have observed three quads uh, for various reasons, but one of those is to share these with the TREO team uh, so that they can model the lens galaxy. This is the field of these three uh, quasars. This is a zoom in uh, on these three quasars in the near IR. Uh, they're all quads, as I said, and you see the lens galaxy in the middle of each of these quads. And of course, they have neighbors that you can see here. And uh, the observations are done with an integral field unit where essentially each uh, pixel in this image on the upper left has a spectrum. And what you see below is the integrated spectrum of the whole um, area that you see in the upper left. So obviously it looks like the spectrum of a, of a quasar with broad emission lines. But if you, if you focus on the, on the lens galaxy, you find uh, the, the typical spectrum of an elliptical, then you can measure its properties. And uh, this is ongoing work. We don't have the answer for now, but this is, uh, you know, we hope it's a promising way to, uh, to understand uh, which of the two values of H0 is supported by this method, which has completely different uh, systematic errors from, from the other techniques. Uh, of course, the other groups are still working on their data. Many have already obtained some data. This is a paper by Adam Reese's group uh, showing that the Cephades, as seen with Hubble and JWST, give essentially the same results. So there was not a, a bias on the HST results, at least based on these first observations, but they have obtained more data in the meantime. So cosmological tension, should, we should have news within I think the coming year or whether um, there is still a tension or the tension is, is disappearing. Uh, so another area which I think is very interesting is the nature of dark matter. So once you have a, a, a strong lens, uh, the, there is a lot of data, the position of the quasars, the, the relative flux ratios of the quasars, and you can use it in, in the, at the right wavelength to see if there is substructure in the halo of the host galaxy. And if dark matter is called dark matter, the models expect to have a lot of substructure in these halos. So there is a group that has, is doing observations of 32 lens QSOs, uh, to, with the, in the mid-infrared to explore whether they see evidence for the sus substructure expected by cold dark matter or, or not. They probe about 10 to the 7 solar masses halos where your many models of warm dark matter would predict uh, a, a much less power than cold dark matter. And uh, they are prediction is that this will be a three sigma result. So JWST, the first observation alone will not have a, you know, a super strong evidence for either way, but it will be compelling and this can be applied. This is a pilot project. It could be applied to many other observations. Another way that we could probe the, the nature of dark matter is uh, by looking at pair instability supernova. This is a super hard problem because the peristability supernovae are supernovae from the population three stars, which are the most, the first population of stars formed in the universe. They form out of material with the primordial chemical composition. So we think they're very massive and, uh, and they're very luminous and, um, and they are and they go supernova in the right mass range as per instability supernova, which essentially means their atmospheres are hot enough that you have electron positron pair production. And of course, once you produce pairs, you, for a 
irradiatively supported atmospheres, you, lo you lose pressure, so the thing tends to contract. Contracting gets hotter, produces more pairs. And so sometimes this leads to oscillation, and sometimes it just leads to a destructive um, supernova, which is more, lumin more luminous than typical supernovae. So if they exist, we see them anywhere in the universe. The problem is that there are many models predict that, that, that these objects are rare. And so uh, it's unclear whether JWST will be able to see them and to see them in enough numbers to, to carry out this experiment. If we do, and we probably would, re would require observing, monitoring multiple times a field, uh, which is a, a, you know, a fraction of a square degree or a square degree. So it's a big project. But essentially, you see these curves that uh, irregular CDM, you would see these supernovae at redshift 20 and above, while in, in uh, warm dark matter models, you would see them only at lower redshift because there is just no power on the lower masses, on the 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 solar masses uh, that are needed to form the supernovae at redshift 20. So these, in principle, would be another experiment to probe whether there is dark matter power and masses below 10 to the 7 solar masses. So uh, if you read new newspapers, you'll see that uh, there are be many people saying that JWST has broken cosmology. So what about that? So uh, here, just a sketch of a protocluster at redshift higher than we thought we would see them, uh, a galaxy with strong emission lines at redshift higher than we would have expected, and a passive galaxy not forming stars at redshift higher than expected. So all these results are certainly uh, very exciting and surprising. However, my take is that before claiming that Lambda CDN cosmology is broken, there are a number of things we need to do, a number of homeworks. One is that we need to revisit how we model star formation. This is a process that converts gas into stars. It's a lot of, it's, it's complex. It's a little bit like weather forecast. So are we sure that the models that we have for that process are correct? The second one is that for many of these objects, we don't have spectra as nice as the ones uh, you see here, but we estimate the ratio photometrically and we estimate their luminosity, their stellar masses from the luminosity. And it is not clear whether our models for the luminosity uh, of stellar populations of a given mass are correct once you push to populations that we are not familiar with. There have been people that were um, complaining about this for years, but now I think this is becoming more, more critical. So this is something else we need to, to verify. So I would say that JWST might break cosmology at some point in the future, but for now, Lambda CDM can sleep uh, uh, happy, happy dreams, and uh, it's this too early to say. And uh, so my last slide is that uh, JWST is on its way to revolutionize astronomy, and there are ongoing programs that might also enable discoveries in cosmology and fundamental physics. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Massimo. Could you hear me? Yes. Yes. So questions for Massimo, please. Massimo, just uh, <clears throat> to say how thankful we are of your presentation. And you. uh, at the same time, we would like to send you later on the tapes of our meeting, because we are having a, a fantastic time here at the meeting, because uh, with Felix Mirabel, myself and daughter, are uh, enjoying the presentation of our Chinese colleague, which will present tomorrow the fantastic da data of uh, the emission from 221009 in the tab. 
And uh, we have emphasized a new science involving not only GRP and at very high Z. In fact, we are discussing uh, 3GRP at Z equal 4, like you know, 220101, but also one at Z equal 8 and at Z equal 9, which have very, very strong implication. Uh, for uh, the early structure of the of, of the universe, and also a new idea presented uh, here and discussed very actively of the role of Maxi black hole in the early phases. Anyway, we we would send you all the all the tapes of the of the of the meeting, and please give my best regard. Uh, to the people of uh, Space Telescope, because Space Telescope is uh, INSA, a member in INSA. And uh, I would like to propose to have uh, shortly a joint meeting to discuss this issue which are coming out here. And uh, uh, thanks to the presence of Dili and uh, Nanzang, and uh, uh, the new understanding that we are having with uh, with um, uh, Felix Mirabel and uh, colleagues from uh, Argentina on dark matter. There are so many new things in this uh, last hours. You will uh, see from the from the from the record because we are taping everything and we will send to you. And Thank then you. At, at the same time, at the same time, we will. Um, continue, of course, thinking about the next Marcel Grossman meeting next year in Beijing. Therefore, uh, we have to get together, not too late, maybe in the next few weeks or sometime, to discuss also with our many friends at the Space Telescope, because it uh, must be a joint uh, action with them on this fantastic moment. Because yep. really is fantastic. Every minute there is something new. We are going to present three astro pH of the last hours. It's really incredible. Please give my best to everybody there and all my love. And uh, remember, we are doing that within ICRA and ICRANET. And the Space Telescope is a member. <laughs> yeah. okay. All my best. Well, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you for everything. Thank you a lot to you. Thank you again. Thank you for your fascinating talk. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Our next, next speaker is Gart Illingworth. So please, Gart, you can share your presentation. Unmute yourself. We can now hear you. It is muted. There it is. Oh, now I have it. Sorry for the delay. <laughs> Finding things on Zoom sometimes gets a little interesting. Well, I would very much like to thank the organizers for inviting me. I'm um, sorry I'm not there in person. It's a long way from California and things just got awfully busy here. And so I couldn't make it, but I'm just delighted to be able to convey a lot of the excitement about uh, what we are seeing with Webb. And uh, so let me now, uh, uh, let me see here. So one of the things I will just show a few slides initially, it overlaps somewhat with what Massimo was saying, but it was such an exciting time around launch. These three images I remember from the pre-launch activities that we were watching and hearing about remotely. This was all 
done down in uh, Karoo at the launch site and uh, times of every now and again, things would happen where you would hold your breath wet and hoping that everything would just go well, loading the propellant, lifting web off the ground and putting it onto the rocket on a single steel cable. Every time I see web being lifted by a steel cable, I got very nervous, but it was all fine. And then putting down the uh, web, uh, the uh, uh, canopy on the top of web. And then we came to launch as uh, Massimo showed on the very early morning of Christmas day, at least in uh, Washington and the launch site. And that was a remarkable launch with the mission manager continuing to say nominal all the way through, which delighted us all. So, and Massimo showed this, I won't spend time on this, but this is one of the great moments with Webb. ESA did a wonderful thing for us, putting this camera on Ariane 5. It was intended for six, but they did it early, and that was amazing to see Webb go away and amazing to see the release of the solar array. And this also, the unfolding, the... Uh, whole sequence of uh, going through all the, the uh, release mechanisms and making web into a full telescope. And it was always, we often laughed about this or joked about this in advance, but it was true. 28 days of terror. You might all remember the seven minutes of terror on the Mars Perseverance uh, landing, but we had to endure a lot longer with the 15 days of the major releases and then the 10 days of moving the mirror actuators. But everything came together amazingly well. And so it is incredible, actually, to look at Webb's capabilities. Again, as Massimo emphasized and showed, it, JWST exceeds its requirements. I would say that, you know, we all would are delighted that it does, but it really is a success beyond what we could have imagined for such an immensely complicated mission. So then last July, we, the world saw the scientists, science community and everybody saw the first images from Webb and these were truly remarkable. And it really, when we saw these, we realized just how much of a step we had taken beyond Hubble. And as I often have quoted, been quoted as saying, this is Hubble on steroids and working in the infrared. So, but I would like to spend a little time on going back in time, as it were, to what did it take to actually do JWST? How did we get to this point? And it started an awful long time ago as the Next Generation Space Telescope in the mid 80s. And uh, there was this key statement that I still remember to this day, which was start working on the next big mission. It will take a very long time. And this is what Riccardo Giacconi said to me one morning when he came in, he had a habit of coming in in the morning after thinking about things at night and saying, we got to do this or we've got to do that. And so, uh, and uh, you know, uh, leading to a lot of activities, et cetera. But he certainly surprised me on this because Space Telescope, Hubble as it was subsequently named, was well away from launch at this point and we were extraordinarily busy. And so I said to Ricardo, oh, I'm not sure we can do this. We have to you know, work Hubble, we've got to make this work. And he said, trust me, you need to work this because it will take a long time. And so Ricardo being the boss and very persuasive as he always was, a number of us said about working on a concept for the next generation space telescope. And we had a lot of support and interest within the Institute too. Everybody was focused and working very hard on Hubble. And it was actually a sort of fun thing to do to think about the future as well. And so what we were talking about there was a passively cooled infrared, very large eight to 10 meter class telescope far from the earth in orbit. So very different from Hubble, but that was what we needed to think about for the future. So here is a photo of the folks at the Institute in the mid 1980s. There's Ricardo there. Um, oh, many, as I look at this, I think of the wonderful people that were involved at that time and uh, so devoted to making Hubble work. Peter Stockman, was the guy who worked with a lot and Pierre Bally. I don't have a photo of Chris Burroughs, but it was another one of the core team. 
So what we were doing then was challenging and interesting because we were conceptualizing what comes beyond Hubble before Hubble. So we had no idea of how powerful, you know, we had done, looked, thought about it, thought about simulations, how powerful Hubble was, or I jumped ahead, but uh, we had to think about what a very different and very powerful infrared mission might be at a time when we the technologies were way in the future and so this was an interesting time so one of the things that we did was to set up and do a community uh, workshop and based around this large ngst and uh this ricardo really worked to make this a joint nasa stsci meeting and his help here was absolutely essential, I think, in making this as, a, as productive and as interesting as it was with uh, fully involving NASA in this activity as well. Another major step occurred a year or so later where the uh, Decadal Survey panel on uh, space telescopes was meeting. And we worked through many aspects, but did eventually recommend launching a six meter uh, infrared optical UV telescope. And so that was what is sort of shown very roughly here, very different from what Webb looks like today. But uh, interestingly, we costed it at $2 billion in 1990 dollars. The contrast with later, as you see, was significant. And then, of course, we were also working the technologies through a program called AstroTech 21 out of uh, NASA headquarters and uh, active, actively supported through JPL. Basically the same large telescope with the same key characteristics. Now, at this point, there were budget issues and work on this slowed down. And a couple of things then made, uh, brought this um, back, you know, in some sense to life more in the mid nineties. One of the first things that really captured attention was Bob Williams' effort on doing the Hubble Deep Field in uh, 1995, which, by the way, it took 10 days with Hubble, six to seven hours on web, amazingly powerful. So a key report, HST and Beyond, was carried out and uh, released in the mid-90s that recommended a four meter this sort of rather terrified me having a four meter as a follow on to Hubble as an infrared telescope. Fortunately, Dan Golden has decided that an eight meter was actually much better and said that NASA should take that as the baseline. And it did with uh, studies then on the left that were carried out later in the decade. Then, of course, a key activity here was not only that NASA was supporting this and interested in moving forward, but that the Decadal Survey in 2000 actually came out and recommended this as its top program, an eight meter NGST with a cost of a billion dollars, which, uh, as uh, we know, was way under what it really was going to cost. And the key part of this was still find the first galaxies, first light. And so that the Hubble Deep Field had really captured the imagination and given us a science framework for James, well, NGST and then James Webb. So as we all know, there are 22 years of tumultuous activities and a lot of money. And so I'm not going to talk about this here. Um, there are various places you can find out more information. I know one on the bottom. I'm just, I'm now going to go in and I'd like to give you a sense of the science that we are kind of looking at from uh, Webb, particularly in the area of galaxies. So Massimo showed aspects of this. This is the deepest infrared ever image ever, just 12 hours on Webb, comparable to the Hubble Ultra Deep Field XDF, which was really hundreds of hours on Webb, on uh, Hubble. And so this made a big impact along with the other images. And so, the question then became focused on what results would come out on the first galaxies, on trying to see back at redshift 10 and greater as uh, steps towards the first light goal that uh, Hubble had, uh, that Webb had had for well over two decades. So within a week, 
It was amazing. The first two papers came out that revealed the most distant galaxies ever seen. Now, I'm going to talk quite a bit about photometric redshifts. And so I wanted to show you a quick little video that gives you a sense of how we use wideband filters to get a redshift. And so the, this is a, a, just a precursor to the little video here that will run and show you as you, the redshift changes, the break that occurs from the absorption of uh, hydrogen at uh, Lyman, the Lyman limit, but then at Lyman alpha changes over time. And so it's a, a very powerful technique and it's challenging. One, you know, is, is still has to worry about a lot of aspects when using this, but it has returned a lot of science with Hubble and is returning a lot of great results with Webb. But there are challenges in this and I'll talk about that. But let me talk about these two early galaxies. I mean, this was a huge step for Webb. So within five days after this data being released on the two days after the 12th, there were uh, two papers on Astro PH, which uh, talked about two galaxies at redshift 11 and 13. That was remarkable to be able to do that so quickly. It was very exciting. And obviously it was an awful lot of work on the part of the teams involved. And these are the galaxies, which are called glass Z11 and Z13. Z11 is the redshift roughly of the most distant galaxy, or one of the most distant galaxies found with Hubble, just 400 million years after the Big Bang. But here we had one which was even earlier, even younger, just uh, 300 million years or so after the Big Bang. So this was immediately followed over the next number of weeks by a huge number of galaxies at uh, reported in the literature. And here's some 17, 20, redshift 16, 14, and uh, many papers with a very large number of these high redshift galaxies and a report of ma massive old galaxies at redshift um, 10, 8 to 10 from La Bayadelle, and whereas the stars much, must have formed much earlier. This was really surprising and very confusing. You know, we were seeing many bright galaxies that appeared to be too massive. There were so many of them and a lot of what was going on discussions were happening, both, you know, informally and also in the literature. Now, what various questions came up about this. So did bright really mean massive? Massimo mentioned a number of these aspects too, where there, there were issues that uh, immediately arose about the scale of the barium reservoirs for such big galaxies if they were massive. The rate of buildup, was the cosmology wrong? Was Lambda CDM in trouble? Now, we also were talking about how there were still issues. Do we have wrong redshifts, photo Z problems? calibration issues. And so this amazing excitement about early bright massive galaxies, but there was a caution that was uh, indicated in a number of ways, but a lot of it informal and uh, ongoing as uh, folks were looking at what we were seeing. So was the data deep enough? Um, the calibrations, they had problems. We knew that, but uh, we weren't sure of the scale of those problems. There might have been uh, some area filters that could have been used that might have helped this, but weren't. The templates, did we understand what these early galaxies really look like in their spectroscopic capability? Yes, spectroscopic characteristics. And there was one of the papers highlighted a Redshift 17 galaxy but also found a very low probability redshift five solution. And so had a question mark about that. Then one of the very first papers with redshifts from Zavala et al indicated that there were some problems with the photometric redshifts. Two of the Z17 objects, including the one highlighted by Nadu, were actually at redshift five. And so in some changes from calibration corrections also changed the outcome. Nonetheless, at the end of sort of late in that year, these first two galaxies were fairly convincingly known to be correct. These are the Nadu and Castellano galaxies. And one had a spectroscopic redshift and it was felt that the uh, photometric redshifts were excellent for both of them as well. 
So some of the results were good, but the question was which ones, how much? So Richard Bowens had been looking at this given his great experience with doing photometric redshifts on Hubble o for many years, almost two decades. And so put together a paper on looking at the uh, redshifts, the photometric redshifts that the community had uh, listed across numerous papers. And we looked at uh, trying to understand whether the redshifts were highly likely, what we call robust, likely, which we call solid and possible which could range from uh, unlikely to likely, but you know it was very hard to know at that point. And one of the things that highlighted to us in the quote from the paper here is the typical overlap between candidate lists and the early analyses were only 10 to 20% between different authors. Harakane et al. had also done a very nice analysis too and, and indicated there may have been some problems. So here is what, um, we saw from looking at these samples. And so on the left is a figure that shows the robust and solid candidates only as a function of redshift, which is interesting to see. There's many luminous galaxies here. These are the open and filled circles from Webb, and then the gray area is from Hubble. Huge numbers of galaxies at lower redshift. So we looked at these samples, and it was interesting that where there were uh, the robust galaxies, the ones that we looked at, actually had more than two, two or more observations from different authors in the literature. That uh, so there was ninety percent overlap in the robust sample, but when we came to solid, it was twenty six percent and twelve percent, and so this gives us gave us a feeling that there were a lot of issues with regard to the photometric redshifts at these early times. And when we actually plotted the sample on the right here against uh, redshift versus uh, UV luminosity density and the inferred star formation rate density, and there's a lot on this figure, it's very complex, but I think the, the takeaway point is that both the solid and possible candidate list suggests very high star formation rate densities and sort of in, in definitely inconsistent with a lot of the models and generally inconsistent with the trends that we were seeing from a lot of other aspects. So the robust sample looks to be good, but we have concerns about the solid and possible candidate list, which are substantial, very large numbers of objects. So I think at that point, I think for me at least, I became very skeptical of a lot of the early photos the, measurements. And I think it was the lack of deep imaging overall, particularly blue wood of the break at Lyme and Alpha. And that null detection is critical to ensure that one doesn't have an impact from uh, interlopers or contamination for low redshift galaxies. There were calibration issues, as I mentioned, and the photo Z templates also, I think, were not ideal. So there was a period last year where I think a lot of the photometric redshifts are a concern. Fortunately, I think that uh, as the data comes in and, and folks are being more careful with regard to the selection of their samples, the data quality is becoming better. But as we're looking now, I think that we're starting to see that the photometric redshifts are now becoming uh, uh, more robust as uh, care and uh, interest is taken in trying to ensure that they're of high quality. And we really do this by seeing the spectroscopy. And this is where there'll be a huge difference with Webb. It is truly a spectroscopic telescope of immense capability. And this was a, an excellent example. This was the first results late last year from the JADES program, the GTO program on NERSPEC and NERCAM with uh, a wonderful sample of uh, distant galaxies in the redshift greater than 10 galaxies in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field area in Good South, and some spectra on the right and the galaxies, and you can see there the, the galaxies ranging sort of from 10, 11, 12, 13 
in this area alone. So there's going to be a huge reservoir and a change in the number of these galaxies as the spectroscopic surveys go forward. So I think we're at the point now where we have a large enough sample of these uh, bright galaxies and we can ask, so what is really going on with bright galaxies in the first 500 mega years? There is no doubt that there is a excess of such bright galaxies compared to what we would have expected before launch from our work on Hubble. So one excellent approach is to look at um, a galaxy which was actually found by Hubble in uh, 2016 as being a redshift 11.1. It was actually found a little earlier as I showed, but this I think is a good pathfinder for the various aspects of the high redshift galaxies, which uh, may give us better insights into what is actually going on with these objects. So this is, this is almost an amusing insight, uh, aside, but it's sort of indicative of the way science progresses. So this galaxy was observed with uh, Hubble in the uh, Good North field with uh, the old NIGMOS camera, the first infrared camera on Hubble and was found and reported in a paper by Richard Bowens in 2010. And it was so unusual looking, fairly bright, but only in one filter that uh, we suspected it could be a transient, spurious, and maybe a Z approximately nine galaxy, but didn't take it seriously, didn't think it was very credible. So amusingly enough, about four years later, Pascal Ersch was looking through the wide field camera three infrared data at Goods North and detected a and chose a sample of galaxies from photometric redshifts that were at Z of 10. This was a, a, a big step forward in the number of redshift 10 galaxies that we had. And one of them was particularly bright, the one GNZ uh, uh, Z10.1. And uh, we got some spectra with the wide field camera, the GRISM, and uh, revealed that this was actually at redshift 11. And so we had uh, a confirmation of a, a galaxy at redshift 11, 420 million years after the Big Bang at, in 2016, a very luminous galaxy. And I want to just show you a couple of, these are somewhat older slides, that where the, why this was so astonishing and actually and then we'll go into the web data and how powerful it is looking at this galaxy. So it's very luminous. Then on the left there you see that it is strikingly luminous for a redshift 11 object. Then uh, and the detection of this galaxy posed a lot of questions about uh, the likelihood of actually seeing it given the the surface density of this, this object from the limited area that we were searching, it was quite unexpected to find it. The models would not suggest you would find a galaxy like this. So that was an enigma back then, and to some extent was a precursor to the enigma we're facing now with Webb. The same questions about where did these very bright galaxies come from? And it, it was fascinating to look at this object too in the context of reionization. This is the free electron fraction uh, uh, result uh, from Planck. And uh, as you might well remember, Planck has said that reionization fairly clearly started around redshift 10. There's some uncertainty there, but the bulk of redshift reionization occurred after redshift 10. And we know from the astronomical indicators basically finished at around redshift six. So essentially all reionization takes place after redshift 10. And here we are with a very luminous galaxy at redshift 11. This was striking, another striking aspect of this galaxy as well another enigmatic aspect. Now, we had simulations back then, which are in many ways, you know, precursors to some of the better and more uh, powerful simulations today. But the same thing stands out that GNZ 11 was unexpectedly bright. If the simulations did include galaxies as uh, luminous, as massive, actually, as this galaxy, as GNZ 11, but 
the search area, the volume that we were seeing is in, in surprisingly small for the, uh, the likelihood of finding it. And so now we get to web. And so let's uh, move into the web results on this and what it's actually revealing for us about this galaxy and what it is giving us a sense of how current uh, of the brighter galaxies may well have, uh, you know, what may well be making them stand out as it were at early times. And so here is the spectrum Massimo showed. This is an amazing spectrum, which took about 20 hours to do on web. And then in the lower left, you'll see the eight hour spectrum from the Grism on Hubble. And so the difference is just astonishing, absolutely astonishing. So we, Webb, and I think this again, as Massimo noted, just emphasizes how powerful Webb is as a spectroscopic telescope. We're seeing lines here from nitrogen, carbon, oxygen, neon, magnesium in this object. So this is not uncommon with our spectroscopic results on early galaxies. So there's a vast reservoir of information that is going to be coming out about the nature of these galaxies at any redshifts beyond in reionization and earlier. One of the things which was fascinating about this, which was highlighted in the first paper about this from Bunker et al. earlier this year, was that uh, Lyman Alpha is seen. Now we're in an epoch here, as I mentioned before, that uh, is sort of essentially before reionization. So the universe is largely neutral at this point. And so to see Lyman Alpha was not expected. And so what it suggests is that GNZ 11 has surrounded itself with a large ionized bubble. And we're looking at Lyman Alpha from backscattering from the outflows around this galaxy. So another interesting diagnostic that seeing these spectral lines and features and measuring their velocities, the redshifted line here in that case, that uh, is revealing information about the nature of the galaxy and its environment. So Massimo mentioned a little about population three and it's one of the questions that's came, come up about uh, the early galaxies as well. So are extremely luminous, high mass, low metal population three stars, significant contributors to the highest redshift galaxies. This is the mass to light ratio, very different in these galaxies to those at later times. So population three is very challenging to reveal. You have you're trying to find a null activity, no metals. There was some a very nice paper actually in 2011, some time ago now from uh, Quasar Absorption Line, which revealed extremely low clouds with extremely low metallicities at redshift three. Their web actually is now giving us the opportunity to look in more detail. Van Zeller et al. just had a paper recently which found a very small low, um, low mass clump of stars with very low metallicities, much, uh, it's obviously not zero and so, but it's certainly extremely low by most uh, characterizations. So it's a hint that uh, even at redshift six at later times, as at the other one at redshift three, that uh, low metallistic clouds can exist for a long time. But the question is, is there evidence in these very early galaxies? And so recently uh, there's a very nice paper from Molino and others who are using the JADES data and looking at uh, regions around and near GNZ11 and have detected helium-2. Now helium-2 can be come from uh, very hard ionizing sources, so AGNs, et cetera. But given where this uh, cloud of, uh, is occurring away from uh, GNZ11, that uh, they argue that it's possibly indicative of population three stars, very massive ones existing in this outer parts of the galaxy. So we all know population three must occur. We've gone from a universe with essentially hydrogen and helium to one that is uh, now has metals dispersed fairly largely, particularly in the more dense regions. 
but it's unclear just how much these early stars contribute to the luminosity of the early bright galaxies. But we're taking the steps towards realizing this. So then we come to another fascinating aspect of GNZ 11. Now we have, as uh, I think Felix was talking earlier this morning, and I know from while I was watching last night, he mentioned the results on AGNs that are seen, AGNs and quasars that are seen at redshifts less than eight. These are with massive black holes in galaxies. So clearly there must be smaller black holes at earlier times. And GNZ 11 appears to be, to have a massive black hole of about 10 to the six solar masses. The left figure shows the masses of black holes uh, as a function of uh, the number of, ma of masses. Of, these are black hole masses that have been found as a function of mass. So the GNZ 11 is very small by these uh, examples, but you would expect it. It's at very early times. So it's a challenge. So we're now at redshift 11. We have a 10 to the six solar mass black hole and uh, I think uh, Felix also talked a little about this as well, about the challenges of building these up. But nonetheless, from the perspective of thinking about uh, what is in these galaxies, their detectability, and whether or not we have real challenges with the stellar population and the mass, if your AGNs are fairly ubiquitous, and in the case of GNZ 11, it appears to contribute about two thirds of the luminosity. So that could be a sig black holes through AGNs could be significant contributors to the luminosities of, G of uh, early galaxies. So we have a number of potential aspects which um, can help resolve some of the issues that we're thinking about and have seen if we take, if we have. Uh, simple-mindedly assume that bright galaxies are massive. So I think many of the galaxies that are claimed to be a Z of 10 will be found to be less. So this is an issue with the poor quality photometric redshift. So the frequency of these galaxies may not be as high as initially thought. Black holes, if uh, prevalent and uh, relatively large, can contribute a significant fraction of the light. And so the stellar population element is smaller and so less of a uh, challenge for us to understand. And then in these early days, the stellar populations could be very different with much more light from high mass stars. So from extremely luminous stars, Wolf Ray stars have been talked about, POP3, et cetera. And the spectroscopic data will start to reveal and give us insights into that. So just from looking at this over the last six to nine months, I think that uh, part of the enigma and the challenge of understanding what's going on at early times and the potential impact on a lot of the issues about the growth of early galaxies and questions around the cosmology may prove to be less, um, I would say, uh, less challenging in the sense of impacting our uh, the st uh, standard views of the cosmology than expected, because as I mentioned, AGNs will be more common and um, the, uh, uh, the characteristics of the stellar population will be rather different. So I think that early on there was, as Massimo discussed as well, there was a, quite a bit of discussion about whether Lambda CDM, our cosmology, standard cosmology, had serious challenges from the existence of these galaxies. And I think that, and I would agree with Massimo, that Lambda CDM is safe for the moment, at least. There may be interesting things ahead but our galaxies currently are not a cause for great concern as it were for the cosmology. So I would like to finish at this point and uh, just say that JWST has really only got started in revealing the nature of galaxies in the first 500 mega years and of course through all time. And I also was thinking that uh, Ricardo would have been both amazed and delighted to see the success of what he started as uh, with emphasizing to us that we needed to move on this as, as uh, NGST 37 years ago at Space Telescope Science Institute. 
and I particularly would like to thank the organizers of the meeting too for giving me the opportunity to convey some of the amazing results from web so thank you very much thank you very much thank you god for your interesting talk now question is for you yes 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 uh, yeah, God. First of all, thank you for the splendid talk. Uh, I am Remo Ruffini, for a, a long time friend of uh, Ricardo. And uh, Ricardo gave, gave us the great pre pleasant, present of having uh, the Space Telescope Institute as a founding member of ICRA, mm -hmm. who is organizing this meeting. Thank you again. And uh, let me tell you that they are in this meeting. We will send you a copy of the presentation. We are having a very exciting time, time which is complementary, complementary in some respect to the, the, the topic that you have told us. Because we are having today is in uh, Astro PH, the first case that we can see the structure of uh, a ellipsoid in uh, three binary driven hypernova at uh, 220101 and uh, one at z equal eight and one at z equal nine. We are gaining a lot of information about uh, this uh, structure which are originating from uh, a 10 solar mass uh, um, object uh, uh, in a binary system with a neutron star and then undergoing gravitational collapse and even fission. We have three papers, three papers today that we have found a way to use cosmology in order to extrapolate the data of uh, uh, Niels Gerel's uh, Swift telescope to explore, explore the early using cosmology, the dilatation of cosmology, to the first 10 seconds of the GRD. And this gives fantastic information, and we would like very much to have the opportunity to discuss this matter with your people to see the complementary of GRB at IZ 8.2, uh, 8 9.4, and Z uh, equal uh, 4. But at the same time, we have the great opportunity here uh, to have um, Felix Mirabel. And uh, as you know, Felix is very interested in very large black holes. And we have also a team in uh, Argentina uh, of our group, which is working on a large black hole of uh, 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 solar masses, which should happen in the very early phases as z equal 10. And one fascinating idea of uh, 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 Felix is that we could have in the beginning even earlier than the, the GRB, uh, a, a very large black hole generating a lot of stars uh, with their jet, and this being the one which we see in the, uh, in the, in the GRB. It's very exciting, it's a new idea. A early cosmology could, could be very different from what we are thinking for a role of very massive black holes. And we are following very attentively the 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 solar masses, which you are declaring finding at very large z. I think it will take a great opportunity, not many, but to have four, five or six of our people joining uh, at Space Telescope for one week or far part of the week, week, I don't know yet, is at the Space Telescope or at the Institute at Princeton to discuss all this matter. But we have urgent matter because also the observation of um, 
which will be presented here for the first time tomorrow of the TEV emission from uh, 20, uh, uh, from 221009A. Uh, and we have the people presenting uh, this data here from China with Nanzang or the group of Nanzang. They, this is extremely exciting because we are sure, I am sure personally, that the two things are related. This ellipsoid, this very fast rotating ellipsoid could be the one which created this type of radiation. It's a very exciting moment. Therefore, maybe we have to think also because next year we are going to have uh, the Grossman meeting MG17 in, uh, uh, in, in Beijing to have the opportunity to have a meeting with the space telescope to discuss the result of our result here and the projection for the uh, coming uh, months or so. Therefore, say hello to Bob and tell, expect my visit, and our visit, not many, four or five people from our group, which will present this idea. Okay, and thank you again, of course, to have the joy to recall Ricardo, to see him in, in all uh, the team is uh, always uh, an enormous uh, sensation, a pleasure for all of us. Thank you again. Yes, and thank you very much. Actually, I you reminded me with your comments on the black holes that we're trading one challenge for another. We may have lessened the challenge on massive galaxies, but we still have the challenge now of understanding how these black holes build up at early times, and I should have emphasized that too. So uh, uh, the problems know, have not lessened, they have diverged. <laughs> this was an idea for an idea when we proposed with John Wheeler the idea of black hole. But I will never have expected then, even when I propose Cygnus X1 as a black hole with the three solar mass limit, but everything now is enormously more interesting. We have seen the data of IXPE. I don't know if you have seen them, the polarimeter, that show in Cygnus X1, which is not just a black hole, the jets and the structure of, uh, I mean, it's incredible. And also that it would be worthwhile to have a, a, a powwow, the Indian <laughs> said, to sit around a moment and to think over, because the science is becoming really incredibly more important. And the black hole, of course, we will have in Beijing, we will have Roy Kerr, which is planning to come. And uh, this is the uh, as an opening of the MG17. And now black holes are all over. I think there are black holes even, we will, I will give you a presentation. I'm sure that uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the crowd, there is a black hole. You, okay. you understand what I said? I am sure that in the crab nebula, <laughs> there is a sitting, a black hole, which comes from a gamma ray burst. But we will uh, explain. Uh, the thing is it's becoming too exciting and too new. And we have to, uh, to have young people and many other people to participate. Thank you very much again. Yeah. Thank, you, Thank again. you very much. I really appreciated the opportunity. <laughs> Thank you, Garth. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Participants uh, of the presenters today, let's see tomorrow, nine o'clock. Thank 
Sorry, do you know when the talk of De La Valle is scheduled? Uh, 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 it's not clear yet. Ah, okay. We're supposed to speak today, and okay. we will try to do our best to restore to stop uh, possibly tomorrow.